signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary 
Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. At the commencement of our sitting, let us Members, before we begin business today, I just want to deal with two issues. Firstly, I want to make members aware that I have written to ministers in relation to making statements to the Assembly Chamber. I was very pleased with the position that we had reached some time ago when it was clear that the Executive was making a determined effort to ensure the statements were brought to the Assembly Chamber, including the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 Response, before they were made in the media. It is noticeable that for the first two sitting weeks in September, and also for this week's business, there have been no requests from ministers to make statements. However, a range of ministerial announcements have been made in the media in the same period. It has always been the expectation that ministers should, as much as possible, address important matters in the Assembly first. In relation to ministerial attendance at meetings of the North-South institutions, members will be aware that it is a requirement in law for ministers to report to the Assembly as soon as is reasonably practical after such a meeting. 
Members have expressed dissatisfaction in the past with the delay in such statements coming to the House, and I have previously raised the issue with ministers. However, records indicate that a North-South Ministerial Trade and Business Development meeting occurred on the 21st of April this year, but it has still not been reported to the Assembly. I have written to ministers to indicate that such a delay is not acceptable and should be addressed with some urgency. I realise that we are still at an early stage in this last session of this mandate, and I therefore do hope that this reminder will encourage ministers to bring statements on important matters to the House in a timely manner and before being made in the media. This is a particularly important matter to enable the Assembly to perform its role of scrutinising decisions and holding ministers to account. And I will keep this issue under review, but I would be extremely disappointed if this was to return as an issue which members have to raise frequently with myself. And secondly, members will note that additional seating is in place today to allow a greater number of members to attend the question time and to hold ministers to account. I have written to members about this, but I emphasise to members that these seats are for question time only for the time being, and two metres social distancing should be retained for all other items. I will move on to the order paper. First item on the order paper is member statements. If members wish to make a statement, they should do so by rising in their places. Those members who are called will have up to three minutes to make their statement. Members are reminded that statements will not be subject to debate or questioning. Interventions will not be permitted. and I will not take points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has finished. Get the first name. And I call Emma Sheeran. I want to raise the issue of rural housing this afternoon in the Chamber, uh, specifically the changes to planning permission that were brought in at the beginning of the summer via the Infrastructure Manager. Uh, Minister's planning advice note. This was issued to local councils at the beginning of summer without any consultation, and I believe it poses a threat to our rural communities. This is a rights issue. Rural dwellers pay the same contributions, taxes and rates as anyone else, but they don't have the same access to services and infrastructure that our city and town dwellers have. Now they will not even be able to build on their own land in many instances. This is going to rule out what we would call an infill or a cluster dwelling and would require houses that are built in connection to a farm to be literally built within the yard. As someone reared on a farm, I know just how impractical and indeed dangerous this is, and the UFU have pointed out the many challenges this presents to the sustainability of our family farms and indeed the risks in terms of mortgages and, and people being able to build a house. Since this came to light, I've been inundated with calls from young couples, planning agents and family farms alike, all of whom are concerned about what this is going to mean for their futures. Within our local councils, our planning officers already implement the policy in a thorough and responsible manner, which is why so many applications take so long to be processed. I have taken part in many site meetings with our local councillors in Mid-Ulster, where we would urge people to amend their applications in order to ensure their successful um, passage and to ensure that the environment is not impacted by the dwelling that they're, that they're wishing to build. Planning is already stringent, sustainable and measured. The last thing that we need is more restriction on who can build and where they can build it. Our planning committee in Mid-Ulster are so worried about this note that they held a special meeting to discuss it and have pledged to write to the Minister with cross-party support with regards to the issues that it has thrown up. Currently, we have a housing crisis in the north. We have a shortage of public and private rental stock, which means that landlords are able to charge extortionate rents and get away with it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in our smaller towns, many of the much-needed houses are being occupied by people who do intend to build a forever home out in the country, but they're waiting to have the finances and the planning permission to be able to do so. This note is going to add financial and time pressures to the process, unnecessary stress which we do not need to see and which serves to make building your own home a more exclusive enterprise. Many of the constituents who have contacted me are attempting to build on the family farm to ensure its continuation and to maintain the link with past generations, many of whom would have had to work hard to hold the fields that they now have. We know that we have pressures on our health and social care services and that many families rely on elderly parents to care for their young children and then grown-up children to care for their elderly parents. And for that to work, they need to live nearby. So I would ask the Minister to rescind this note immediately and to allow people to build in the communities that they call home. Gormagat. Thank you. And I call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. MOT booking fiasco. 
Recent changes to the online booking service on NI Direct for MOT test of motor vehicles has become almost impossible and at least very difficult. Two weeks ago, the tried and tested system was working reasonably well, but since its introduction, the new online service has had numerous faults and complications, causing even more backlogs to an already overstretched system. A few examples. Unable to access the site. Problems paying. Payment being taken twice and no simple method for a refund. And personally, I went to book my MOT to be told your vehicle does not exist. When two weeks ago it did exist, and only for the fact that the dates were given were not suitable, I decided to wait. No answer at all on the helpline or book by phone number, no queuing system, just a message to say not available. And this was going on on Friday all day and again today because I've just tried. And the fact that at present local people cannot make a booking at a test centre anymore, so what it would do. MOT is a government requirement. At present, this service requirement cannot be provided in a reasonable time frame. Is it time for certificates of temporary exemption to be issued until the proper service can be provided? I will be writing to and calling for Minister Malm to act promptly on this issue, and I must add, I have every faith that she will do so. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The High Street Vulture Scheme opened uh, today, and it would be fair to say it opened uh, with a very bumpy start. We've had website crashes, uh, uh, and people have been very frustrated. This is a very important scheme, and we want it to work, and we want it to work efficiently. efficiently. So we're calling on the Minister. I'm calling on the Minister today to ensure that all the resources that he has is put to ensure in the smooth running of this online application process. Our independent, locally owned retailers and hospitality businesses have been on their knees. While the big supermarket chains have survived um, over the pandemic without losing turnover, in fact, many of them have increased their takings. It was the small independents that have been in crisis. Despite the support uh, from rates relief and furlough, I can tell you that many, many have businesses have been contacting my office in absolute dire straits. Some business owners have actually cried on the phone to me. They have told me that they can't afford to keep paying staff that have been loyal to them for many, many years. I'm standing here today to plead with consumers to show their loyalty to the independently, locally owned businesses on their, in their village main streets, in their town centres and in their city centres. We need them today and we need them in the future. Just look at our high streets. I can tell you about Derry. Even before this pandemic, we had serious problems because many of our consumers had stopped going into the city centre. They had bought their goods online or else in out-of-town shopping centres. I know that the Labour Party in Britain today has announced that it wants to reduce the impact of business rates and increase the tax bur burden on global online retailers. So today I am asking and I make this plea to every person in this chamber and to every person who is listening to this or reading uh, my posts, please encourage people to go in, use their vouchers and to go in to their local uh, businesses and spend them because we depend on them if we are going to have survival of our town centres. And can I then now plead on the Minister, please fix um, the broken website and make sure that he throws all resources that he has at this because we are spending £145 million pound on this voucher scheme and we can't cock it up at this particular point. If it's operational or process, it needs to be fixed now instead of waiting for a week or two into this, uh, uh, this scheme. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How many of us sitting here this morning or this afternoon have not shed a silent tear as you have watched a distraught parent carry a small white coffin to a waiting hearse. The loss of a child of any age is a tragedy which no parent can prepare for and is something that rarely crosses the mind of a parent until sadly it affects them. No parent is ever prepared mentally, physically 
or financially for the funeral and the expenses incurred. In England, Wales and Scotland, the funeral costs of a child under 18 are wavered. But much to our shame, no official scheme exists here in Northern Ireland. Yes, an interim measure, a number of councils have voted in favour of wavering fully or partial burial fees, but that is not the answer. Can I at this moment pay tribute to Councillor Julie Flaherty, Ulster Unionist Party Councillor in Armagh, Banbridge and Craig Avon, for all the work she has done in increasing the awareness of the concerns of parents who have found themselves in this position. And indeed, sadly, Julie has been one of those parents. Mr Speaker, when a parent loses a child, they have so much to come to terms with. Grief, shock, supporting other siblings and making decisions in respect of the funeral. That the cost of the funeral is the last thing on their mind. No brave parent should have the added burden and pressure of having to worry about the cost of their child's funeral. Many parents will have made no financial preparation for such an expense and may have to borrow to meet the costs associated with the burial, just as Caroline Harris had to do following the death of her eight-year-old boy. In January 2020, when New Decade New Approach was agreed, it included many commitments which have to date not been progressed. The Department of Communities submitted a bid of 7, 703000 for funding in 2021-2022 for the funeral, children's funeral expenses, which has been unsuccessful. While a further unsuccessful bid was submitted in June to the June monitoring round. While we have all patiently waited for the Minister to try to identify funding for the Children's Funeral Fund, it is not happening. Mr Speaker, this situation cannot continue. I therefore now appeal to the Minister to show compassion for those grieving parents who have such a great personal and financial burdens to bear and to progress with haste to establish a children's funeral fund. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole Padre de Larga. Recently, the campaign for a detox centre in Derry has intensified. Starting in 2014, the campaign ebbed and flowed, but has recently been given a new lease of life by a young Derry woman called Tamsin White. Tamsin has campaigned vociferously for a detox centre in the North West to cater for those in our city and area battling addiction. The question then is why does Derry need one? There is a dedicated detox centre in Oma, of which one third of the patients are from Derry. The work done in Oma is spectacular, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the staff for their dedication and commitment to each and every patient. Derry does, however, have a disproportionate number of admissions to the centre, reinforcing the need for an additional facility in the North West. We are all very aware of the impact COVID has had on our health service. I am sure there is agreement across this chamber that one of the enduring impacts of the pandemic will be its effect on mental health outcomes. That is already causing devastation to many families. And while I am acutely aware of the challenges facing the Health Minister, I would ask him to prioritise putting in place the necessary resources to tackle her mental health. The Detox Centre represents an important first step in addressing this. It represents a pivotal piece of the puzzle. It represents one part of a bigger picture, one which shows joined up strategic thinking and which supports all those in need of mental health support. But we can't stop there. The detox centre isn't a tick box. It isn't case closed. It's the beginning of addressing the mental health crisis in Derry, the beginning of removing the stigma around poor mental health, and I implore the health minister to act swiftly to save lives in our time. Thank you, Nicole. Christopher Stalford. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, sir, as a fellow citizen of Belfast, you yourself would know that over the course of the last 20 or 30 years or so, people who traditionally would never have wanted to come to our city to hold events have decided so to do. The first major event that I can recall was obviously the, the tall ships in 1991, and that I suppose sent a very positive message that Belfast was starting to turn a corner and that people wanted to come to our city in order to hold major events. Belfast is now a, a centre for great events. One of those uh, which has taken place recently is obviously Belsonic. I rise to express concern on behalf of my constituents who live in the lower Ravenhill and Balnafai parts of the town in relation to the management of this event. It is, of course, a good thing that there are public events taking place in the city and that people want to have events in our city, but it's also a good thing to treat people who live around these events with respect and to listen to their concerns. I have to say, I have been disappointed by the lack of engagement with local residents by the organisers of this event. Specifically, the Lagan Village Youth and Community Group have been working hard to try to articulate the concerns of the people in that part of the town and to make the organisers listen. I again regret to say that I don't believe that they are listening. I don't believe that people's concerns are being taken on board. And I do believe that it's wrong that the associated antisocial behaviour that accompanies these events should be imposed upon the people of the Lower Raven and Balnify communities. I would urge the organisers to engage more fully with local residents in that area in order to hear their concerns and to act upon them. And whilst it's true to say the event is obviously what, what takes place in the Ormo Park constitutes the event, it's not true to say that the organisers then have no responsibility for that which takes place outside the Ormo Park in the streets around the bottom of the Ravenhill Road. They clearly do have a responsibility in that regard. And I would urge them and the Council to engage more fully with local people in order to address these concerns going forward, in order to ensure that the event can be one that benefits not only the, the city, but that local people feel is not uh, having a detrimental impact upon their life and their existence in the place that they live and in the community that they live all year round, not just during these events. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Justin McNulty. I consider Eugene Reevy a friend, a man of dignity, a man of shining integrity, a man of steely resolve, a man of fierce determination, a pillar of the White Cross community. His wife, Roisin, taught me in primary one. I remember her glowing, shining integrity, a gentle lady. His daughter, Ashley, was in my primary school class, a family very well respected in the community. On the 4th of January, 1976, at about 6.10 p.m., three masked men armed with sterling submachine guns and pistols burst into the Reavy family home in White Cross. John, 24, was killed. Brian, 22, was killed outright. Anthony, 17, escaped into the bedroom and later crawled 200 yards up to a neighbour's house to raise the alarm. Far too many families like the Reavies have been waiting decades for justice. I acknowledge and welcome the fact that all parties are now firmly, have now firmly rejected the legacy proposals set out in the British Government's command paper. As I understand it, over 30 files have now been forwarded to the Public Prosecution Service for consideration, but yet there is a lack of resources, and indeed, most worryingly, there is no dedicated legacy unit. It is unthinkable that the Reavy family would have to suffer more delays. Therefore, I call on the Minister for Justice and on the Finance Minister to provide the adequate support for the PPS and legacy causes to progress, and all the legacy cases to be finalised, and for justice to be done for the Reavy family in White Cross and for all the other families waiting for justice for far too long. Gurma Yorgut, 
Tom Coyle. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, following uh, Mr. McNulty uh, reminds me of a saying from the late uh, from Cliff Morgan, a uh, famous Welsh rugby international and at one time head of BBC Sport, who said of sport that uh, compared to social isolation, poverty, loss, ill health, sport is simply uh, a nonsense, but an important nonsense at that. And, and I am rising just to acknowledge the important nonsense that was the Ryder Cup played in Wisconsin over the last uh, three days. Uh, congratulate the United States on their crushing, record-breaking victory, but also acknowledging the role of two of our own, uh, two Northern Irishmen in the European team. Graham McDowell from Port Rush, who was one of the vice captains, uh, and Rory McIlroy from Hollywood and County Down, still one of the world's greatest professional golfers. Uh, and I commend him for his resilience during the course of the tournament because on day one he went out twice uh, to two heavy defeats, uh, so heavy in fact that for the first time in his long career as a Ryder Cup player he was dropped uh, for the Saturday morning uh, foursomes, went out again Saturday afternoon for a third defeat and despite all that yesterday uh, not only did he win his singles match, he went out first leading for the European team and posting a blue mark uh, for the eventual losers of the tournament. I just think, Mr. Speaker, that that resilience is something highly admirable. Uh, and I know we often stand in this house and talk about what is wrong with Northern Ireland. But I think if you think about people like Graham McDowell and Rory McIlroy, we might realize that not just in sport, but in music, the arts, business, and all walks of life, uh, we produce individuals of great character who give us a global reputation. Uh, and I think sometimes that is something we should remember to celebrate. Uh, and so I thank uh, Mr. Uh, McDowell uh, and Mr. McElroy uh, for their contribution uh, to promoting uh, this little postage stamp on the world map that is Northern Ireland. Thank you, and I call Jim Allister. Um, Swimish, Swimish College is the primary integrated uh, school in my constituency. It is situated in a very urban, heavily populated area of Balamina on the Larne Road. By reason of the nature of the school and its reputation, its 800 pupils come from a very wide catchment area. Over 100 of them come more than 10 miles from the Antrim Temple Patrick area, Another 70 come from the glens of Antrim, and so it goes on round the hub of Balamina. In consequence, public transport is vital to the delivery of pupils to that school. And though Larne Road is a heavily trafficked road, there have always been some bus pull-in points at the front of the school to facilitate the reality that it is serviced by public transport and indeed by many parents who have to drive their children. Yet this summer, the active travel unit of the Department of Infrastructure, those who tell us we all must be on our bikes, decided to remove the bus pull-in points, to widen the footpath to at one point over six metres, so that it's wider than the carriageway for the purpose of driving cars off the road. Now we have abundant chaos at Swimage College, inflicted by the idiotic approach of the department. Beginning of September, I met with the relevant active travel official along with Councillor Matthew Armstrong, Councillor Quigley, and the headmaster of the school, on site to see just what could be done about restoring some normality and sense to this situation. I might as well have talked to that wall. I asked then for a meeting with the higher official. It was refused. I then asked for a meeting with the minister. The minister has refused. So here we are in a supposedly caring devolution system, 
A school's transport network has been wrecked by the department, and the department's attitude is so belligerent, so dogged, it's only outdone by its arrogance. To the point where a minister refuses a meeting, and I have to bring that issue to the floor of this House to put proper attention on it. It is time the department woke up and acted on this matter. Thank you, Nicole. Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The decision by the Tories to reduce universal credit by £1,000 a year will have a devastating impact on people in my constituency of West Belfast and right across the north. Millions of people will be impacted by this cut, and in the north we know 105,000 households will, be, will lose £20 a week with the uplift being abolished. Given that we have larger families here compared to other places in the UK, uh, some 300,000 people, uh, by the government's own figures, will be impacted by this cut. So why, therefore, is there such a meek front provided by the executive on this question? This cut will push uh, people further into poverty, hardship and difficulty. The executive should be screaming about this and should mount a wall of resistance against the Tories' plans to implement this drastic cut, the worst in decades. The truth is, uh, Mr Speaker, the universal credit uplift was needed in order that people on universal credit, a large proportion of them, and work, let's not forget, who would afford the basic necessities to get by in the middle of a global pandemic. COVID is obviously still with us and circulating like wildfire in our communities, but the cost of living hasn't reduced, but in fact dramatically shot up. So the Tory government's disgraceful response to energy prices rocketing, inflation shooting up, is to pull the carpet of support from people who need it. At the same time, they haven't lifted a finger to tackle the obscene wealth increase during the pandemic. Uh, the UK now has a record number of billionaires. Corporate profits have continued to surge during COVID, yet it's working class people who are feeling the brunt of the economic hardship. The Tories are willing to protect the wealthy, whilst the executive dutifully follows suit. Class war is alive and well in today, today's society, and it affects everyone at the bottom rung of the ladder. People from all backgrounds are being driven into further economic hardship by these policies. The main focus, Mr. Speaker, has to be on forcing the Tories to retreat and to backtrack from imposing this huge cut uh, on, people's, on people's ability to live. By mounting huge pressure on them, a, treat, a retreat can be forced, and hopefully Marcus Rashford's intervention will help in that regard. However, in the instance that the Tories don't budge and plough ahead with a shocking reduction, the executive needs to step up to the plate and ensure that people aren't thrown under the bus. The executive have a responsibility on many fronts, but chief of which is their instance in signing up to implement welfare reform. So, at the very least, they need to ensure that people aren't financially penalised as, as a result of the system they endorsed. For all the important talk about an anti-poverty strategy, if the executive cannot intervene to stop this reduction, then it will fail to stop the descent of many thousands further into poverty. And if the Tories continue with the cut in universal credit, the executive must intervene to ensure people here aren't financially worse off. As usual, we will hear cries of unaffordability, but let's not forget over £100 million to capita to carry out its detested PIP assessment. Hundreds of millions of pounds in the agency staff while its health workers are left without proper pay. So the executive needs to make its priority to ensure that those who rely on minimal state benefits to get by aren't hit hard by a cut in universal credit. Time for action. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Jonathan Bugley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise to speak of the dire state of many elements of the Department for Infrastructure. The department that has quite rightly been dubbed the Department of Backlog and Delay. How many of us have received correspondence from constituents unable to book an MOT test? How many constituents have contacted us unable to get a driving test? How many major planning applications have been delayed in the system for some over 200 weeks? Rural roads unsurfaced because of continual legal disputes with the department and contractors? A backlog in taxi uh, drivers looking to access the system because they are unable to get through the complex testing system alongside HGV drivers? In short, service users are not getting the service that they deserve, and more importantly, the service that they are paying for. In relation to the MOT testing, as Chair of the Committee, I wrote to the Minister during, uh, w whenever the, the new system had just went active to ask for a meeting to explain uh, the rationale behind the delay. I was greeted with the same response as many of my service users and my constituency received, one of sorry, we will get back to you in due course. 
In the last 12 months preceding the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, in March 2020, the DVA conducted 850,000 vehicle tests in Northern Ireland. In contrast, the most recent 12 months on record, only 456,814 tests were carried out. This underlines the scale of the current testing backlog. If this situation is to be addressed and addressed sustainably and not compounded, there needs to be a need for streamlined procedures for booking appointments going forward. The protracted delays experienced by customers after the deferred launch of the new online DVA booking system has further undermined confidence in our testing system. We need active engagement now from the Minister. How many car dealers are facing this very real prospect of going under because they cannot get tests available for their cars to sell on? How many of our young people can't access, get into the workplace because they can't get a driving test? Some sit their test, uh, unfortunately fail, are thrown out of the system and have to wait months before they can get that test again. The system is flawed, the system is broken, and I would call on Minister Mallon uh, to bring forward realistic proposals to ensure that we can get on top of these backlogs and deliver the service which our constituents deserve. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And that concludes this item on member statements. Point of order, Justin McNulty. I'm um, just checking to see, is the purpose of member statements to allow Sinn Féin and DUP to get into cahoots to attack the Infrastructure Minister Nicola Mallon? Are they in cahoots on this this morning, or what's, what's going, on, going on? I will consider your order. I will, I will address that in due course. Mr. Andrew Muir sought leave to present a public petition in accordance with Standing Order 22, but is not able to be in the chamber today and has asked that it be rescheduled. The Business Committee will consider his request tomorrow. We will move on to the next item of business. The next item of business on the order paper is a motion to extend the time frame for the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response. It will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly agrees that unless it previously resolves the time frame for the existence of the Ad Hoc Committee appointed by the Assembly on 31 March 2020 for the purpose of receiving oral statements from Ministers on matters relating to the COVID-19 response and questioning Ministers on such statements be extended to the end of the 2017-22 mandate. I call to Dolores Kelly to move the motion. So moved, Mr Speaker. The question is, is the motion standing on the order paper be agreed? All those in favour say aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Next item of business on the order paper is a motion regarding committee membership. And as with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and will therefore be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Ms Sinead Bradley replace Mr George Robinson as a member of the Committee on Standards and Privileges. I call Dolores Kelly to move the motion. Moved. Mr. The question is that the motion standing on order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. Thank you. Next item in the order paper is a motion regarding committee membership. It will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Mr. Podrick Delargy be appointed as a member of the Committee for Infrastructure and as a member of the Committee for the Executive Office, that Ms Anya Murphy be appointed as a member of the Committee on Standards and Privileges, and that Ms Karen Ferguson replace Ms Linda Dillon as a member of the Committee on Procedures, and that Ms Karen Ferguson be appointed as a member of the Committee for Communities. Ms Kira Ferguson, uh, I call on John O'Day to move the motion. So moved. The question is, is the motion standing in order paper be agreed? All those in favour say aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Next item of business in the order paper is motion regarding committee membership. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Mr Alex Eason replace Mr George Robinson as a member of the Committee for the Executive Office and that Mr George Robinson replace Mr Alex Easton as a member of the Assembly and Executive Review Committee. I call Mr Trevor Clark to move the motion. Moved. 
question is that the motion standing and order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Next item on the order paper is a motion to appoint a member to the Board of Trustees of the Assembly Members Pension Scheme. It will be treated as a business motion, so there will be no debate. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That Mr Stuart Dixon be appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Assembly Members Pension Scheme. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw to move the motion. So moved. The question is that the motion is standing and order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Would members just take your ease for a moment or two, please. Thank you, uh, members. The next item on the order paper is the second stage of the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Amendment Bill. I call the Minister for Communities. I beg to move that the second stage of the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Bill be agreed. Thank you. The second stage of the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Amendment Bill has been moved. In accordance with Convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limits on this debate. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to open the debate on the Bill. Minister. Thanks very much. It has been over 35 years since legislation regulating the gambling industry here was at last introduced. And in that time, the industry structure, systems and practices have transformed to a point where, in many instances, they bear only a passing resemblance to what existed in 1985. In short, uh, we no longer have legislation here which is fit for the modern age. Today's debate is mainly about the principles. What are the principles that I believe this Assembly needs to reflect upon when considering this Bill? First of all, I would hope that regardless of any differences that may arise over the details of the Bill, all of us will agree that reform of our gambling laws, laws is long overdue. All of us will agree that the process of legislative reform needs to begin now. And we all agree that in the short time we have left in this mandate, some change must be delivered. Whatever the change may be, it must lay down the marker for the next Assembly and the next Executive. Secondly, I believe we need to be realistic about what can be delivered in the time that this Assembly has left. There is much work, for example, to be done to tackle the growth in the digital online gambling and gaming platforms. These now make up an ever-growing promotion of the industry. In many respects, too, online platforms represent in the public mind the most concerning feature of problem gambling. 
Similarly, I have previously expressed support for the establishment of an independent gambling regulator to monitor the activities of the industry and in the public interest and with appropriate powers to deal with malpractice exploitation wherever that might occur. There are issues to be addressed too in relation to new types of betting and gaming machines on the market. We need to look at the control of gambling advertising, both locally and on a cross-jurisdictional basis, east-west and north-south, and also internationally. Always there will be a concern um, about the exposure of children and young people and vulnerable people to gambling products, whatever the platform. And unfortunately, many of these challenges simply cannot be addressed through our present system of regulation. When that system was designed, no one envisaged the, the digital revolution or even the speed and scale of that change. The law we have today is of a different era. Because of this, the changes of the current legislation that I propose today are merely what I see as achievable and realistic within the existing statutory framework and the time scale open to me. I would hope that members will agree with me um, when I say even if this bill is eventually passed, there will remain a much larger job of work to be done, and that needs to take place in the next mandate. Yes? If the Minister is aware of the scale of the problem, and statistics show that gambling is an ever-extending problem in our community, yet she comes to this House with a bill whose only realistic proposal is to further liberalise and make uh, the availability of gambling. But simple things like imposing a ban on credit card use on machines, which could be done relatively straightforwardly, isn't done. Uh, tackling internet uh, gambling isn't touched. The fixed uh, 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 terminals, untouched. So why is this bill only focusing on the liberalisation and ignoring the necessary regulation? Well, I completely disagree with the member, although he's entitled to his opinions. Um, the reality is, is that it will take much longer. It will take a whole assembly term next time round to change the full framework of gambling here, and particularly to look at the issues of online gambling and the impacts that that has. We need to do more research and consultation looking at those issues. And this bill, if it was taken in its entirety, that's why I've decided to break it up, because I want to see some changes which will include protections going forward within this mandate. This bill will be the biggest piece of legislation to go through this Assembly. It's actually bigger than the planning bill that went through the Assembly previously. There will be over 300, almost 340 different amendments to this bill. So it's a huge piece of legislation with all the will in the world, you can't get done in this mandate. And I'm assuming members who have been here a long time will um, understand the scale and the magnitude. That said, I am doing what I believe can be done within this term. Of course, that will be up to the scrutiny of the committee and also members within this chamber. And then there's a much bigger piece of work and laying the foundations now for that piece of work to be taken up in the next Assembly mandate. There's also um, one other principle that I trust members will recognise in considering this bill, and that is around responsible gambling. Many people in our society gamble, whether that's buying a ticket for the national lottery, betting on a sports event, or gaming. Most people who gamble do so responsibly, but for a small uh, amount of people for whom gambling is a problem, is a problem there are steps uh, which can be taken. Um, you can look at issues around self-exclusion from premises or websites or setting spending limits. This is responsible gambling um, on the part of the consumer, but the need to promote responsible gambling also applies to the industry. That's why I have included powers in this bill to allow me to introduce a mandatory code of practice and a statutory levy to help pay for research, education and treatment. Certainly, I believe that it's right that we allow our gambling industry here some flexibility to operate. I believe it's right that we should seek to remove some unduly onerous, unfair and inconsistent restrictions um, on betting and on the businesses. 
but in doing so, we must continue to encourage, if not sometimes require, operators to always recognise the inherent human risks in the products they offer, to take proper responsibility for those risks and indeed the adverse consequences for many individuals. At the same time, I would want members to acknowledge a second small but equally important dimension to this bill. The efforts of local charities, sports clubs and other voluntary groups to raise money for good causes, so as to advance the health, happiness and sustainability of our community on matters that are close um, to their hearts. These organisations are the backbones of our community. In my view, it would be wrong to allow today's opportunity to pass by without revisiting at least some of the rules applying to society lottery money-raising activities. We must be prepared to look at how these rules might be adjusted in a way that helps increase donations and revenue-raising opportunities for voluntary schemes and charitable work. It is these principles in mind I will now give an overview of the Bill. The Bill contains 16 clauses and its purpose is to amend the 1985 Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Order, the 1985 Order. Two clauses, namely 1 and 16, deal with the interpretation, title and commencement of any future Act may be cited. In this case, it is the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries, Amusements Amendment Act, NI 2021. The Bill also inserts a schedule into the 85 Order, Schedule 15A, clarifies the arrangements around what is and what is not classed as a payment to enter a competition or prize draw. The remaining 14 clauses from 2 to 15 are divided into provisions affecting betting, bingo clubs, gaming machines and lotteries. There then follows the clauses 10 to 15, a set of miscellaneous amendments to the 1985 order. These encompass ga ga uh, gambling contracts, prize competitions, cheating, age, residency and incorporation status for licences, an industry levy and a new code of practice. I am removing the current restriction which prevents bookmaker shops from opening uh, for businesses on Sundays and Good Fridays. This will mean that bookmaker shop may be open for trading on Sundays and Good Fridays if they choose to do so. As currently, um, but not as currently on Christmas Day, including Christmas Day, which falls on a Sunday. Sunday uh, working in a licensed office. Currently, betting is allowed to take place on Sundays um, as licensed racetracks. Those employed by a bookmaker to work on these tracks are also protected under the 1985 order from being required to work on a Sunday. In light of the proposal to allow bookmaker shops and offices to open on Sundays, the protection bookmaker track workers enjoy with regard to Sunday is being extended to those employed at shops and offices. This means that betting shop workers will enjoy the same safeguard against being obliged to work on a Sunday as track betting workers. In terms of pool, uh, pool betting, I wish to exempt betting uh, offices from their existing restriction which prevents any person from carrying on a pool betting business apart from at a licensed track and except by means of property operated um, totaliser. This amendment will mean that licensed offices may legitimately operate a pool betting system off track and their offices but subject to certain conditions. Those conditions which are designed to protect uh, consumers are set out in clause 4 of the bill. In terms of bingo clubs, the rules around membership of commercial bingo clubs will be amended so that only members and bona fide guests of members will in future be allowed to play bingo at the club. However, the current law, which requires that there be um, a 24-hour waiting time before someone has applied for membership of a bingo club, may play bingo there, uh, will be repealed. Furthermore, um, and similar to what is envisaged for bookmakers' offices, the current restriction preventing bingo clubs from either opening or making gaming machines available on their premises on Sundays and Good Fridays will be removed. In terms of gaming machines, a new offence will be introduced of um, invading, causing or permitting anyone under 18 to play anything other than a lower limit gaming machine. The bill also sets out what is meant by a lower limit gaming machine. 
Those found guilty of the new offence will be subject to a level five fine or imprisonment for six months or both. However, the bill allows it to be a defence for individuals who may be charged with an offence to show that there was good reason to believe that the person had attained the age of 18. In terms of lotteries and prize competitions, the bill specifies that any arrangement is not a lottery unless persons are required to pay to participate. It adds a new Schedule 15A to the 1985 order, setting out what does and does not constitute a requirement to pay to participate. The bill further specifies that a prize competition arrangement is not prohibited unless persons are required to pay to participate in the arrangement. It refers to the new Schedule 15A, which sets out what does and does not constitute a requirement to pay to participate in such an environment. More importantly, the bill will repeal the present £1 price limit for the sale of a society lottery ticket. It will update as well as the limit set on the amount, which may be um, appropriated for society lottery expenses, to a more straightforward 20% of the whole proceeds. I would further draw members' attention to the significant miscellaneous amendments to the 1985 order. In terms of qualifications, the bill amends many of the existing qualifications which counts um, and district councils require to be met before they may grant a bookmaker license, bingo club license, gaming machine certificate, gaming uh, machine permit, amusement permit, pleasure permit or lottery certificate. The lower age limit for the grant of a bookmaker, bingo club, gaming machine and lottery license certificate and permit will be reduced from 21 to 18. The requirement for an applicant to be resident um, in the jurisdiction in order to be granted the relevant license, etc., will be repealed too. A body corporates will also now be eligible to be granted these licenses and amusements or pleasure permits. That amendment overturns the current provision and relates only to companies registered under the 2006 Companies Act. In terms of cheating, the existing offence of the 1985 order of cheating is being replaced with a new and wider offence to make it unlawful to cheat at gaming, or sorry, at gambling, or to do anything to help another person cheat. The new offence will also apply regardless of whether or either wins anything or improves their chances of winning through cheating. In short, the new offence now includes failed attempts to cheat. By way of gambling contract, the bill repeals two provisions of the 85 order, which effectively pre prevent contracts and securities by way of gaming and wagering from being legally enforced. It now provides for any future contract or security entered into after the bill becomes law to be legally enforced. By way of the industry levy, the bill creates an enabling power to allow a future minister and the Assembly, if they consider it appropriate, to make regulations for the payment of a levy to my department by anyone who applies for a bookmaker license, bookmaker office license, bingo club uh, license, gaming machine certificate, gaming machine permit or an amusement permit. The bill further allows for regulations to make provision for the amount of the levy its payment, administration and operation. Consultation will be required before the actual levy could be introduced by regulation. Regulations will also require approval by the Assembly through the affirmative resolution route. The Bill specifies that if a levy is imposed through regulation, then any proceeds must be um, expended by DFC on projects related to gambling addiction or other forms of harm or exploitation associated with gambling. The bill also specifies that the provision of financial assistance after a levy is introduced is subject to the Department of Finance consent. This is a separate matter from the enabling power and a standard requirement for all public expenditure. In terms of the code of practice, the bill inserts a new article requiring my department to issue and publish one or more codes of practice about the manner in which gambling facilities are provided. The Code must incorporate arrangements for ensuring gambling is conducted in a fair and open way, where vulnerable persons and those under 18 are protected and assistance is provided to those who are or may be affected by problem gambling. The Code may be revised, revoked or updated at any time, 
and may include provisions around how gambling facilities are described or advertised. The bill further contains provisions setting out procedures for consultation prior to the introduction of the, um, of the Code. I recognise that there are many who are impatient to see a more radical reform of our gambling laws. There will be those, perhaps, who believe that I should take a far more stringent line on the gambling industry in general, and I completely understand those concerns. But I also believe that the Bill offers a balance between what needs to be done now and what is realistic in the remaining time of this Assembly. It offers a balance between what is fair to the responsible operator and what is right and necessary to manage the risks associated with gambling. And importantly for me, for me, the Bill is also a chance for the Assembly to do something more for all of our volunteers, charities and support groups working within the community. Not least amongst those, the individual charities and NGOs who do so much to assist uh, and care for those lives in the crisis and consequence of problem gambling. I beg to move. Thank you, uh, Minister. And I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Mrs Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Committee for Communities, I welcome the second stage of the Betting, Gaming, Lotteries and Amusements Amendment Bill. The Committee heard in May that the Minister had completed her consideration of the issues raised in the Department's consultation on regulation of gambling in Northern Ireland. She confirmed that a two-stage approach would be adopted, including a medium-sized bill to be brought forward during this mandate, with the opportunity for a future executive to agree a larger and more complex bill. So here we are today at the second stage of that medium-sized bill. The Minister introduced the bill on 14 September, and this marked the start of the process to bring about important and long-awaited amendments to the 1985 order, which has remained largely unchanged since it was enacted 35 years ago. As a result, it is clear that gambling legislation here is very outdated and has not kept pace with industry and technological changes. The current law is inflexible and even, even minor amendments requiring changes to primary legislation, which we all, all know only too well, is a very slow process. Mr Deputy Speaker, to highlight just how outdated the current law is, it is helpful to remind the House that even the 1985 order is based on various pieces of GB legislation dating back as far as 1963. There is no doubt that the preferred approach of the committee and many members of the public and lobbying groups who responded to the consultation would have been to see a full replacement of the 1985 order with new, law and fully, with new laws which fully reflects the modern betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements industry. However, we also know that the outcome of reviews of gambling regulation in Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland may affect the direction of any future changes here. Mr Deputy Speaker, what the Committee cannot ignore is the context of this Bill. It has, it has been reported in recent years that up to 40,000 people in Northern Ireland may have a gambling problem, and that is the highest incidence in the UK, four times higher than any other region, and also three times higher than that in the Republic of Ireland. Not only that, but it has been reported by the Gambling Commission that children as young as 11 have problems with gambling. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are where we are, and now we have this bill that will unfortunately not establish a new regulatory framework, but will at least amend parts of the 1985 order. It will provide help for small-scale society lotteries and charities to guarantee their long-term viability and also deal with some aspects of existing gambling law, which are a source of public concern. A key inclusion is in addressing the issues of the industry going more to protect the vulnerable from gambling harm. However, we are here today to debate the main principles of the Bill, and the detailed work of the Committee lies ahead. At this point, I would like to highlight that the Committee is in a position, not of its own making, of now having to complete the Committee stage of three Bills in parallel. We will not be pushed into rushing our scrutiny and risking making bad laws, neither will we cause unnecessary delay in the progress of this legislation. 
Frankly, it is bad enough that we are not in a position to undertake a full repeal and modern replacement of the 1985 order. So it is even more imperative that the committee gets this bill as good as it can be within its limited scope. We need to ensure it strikes a balance between supporting the industry, protecting those under 18 and enhancing support for those with gambling-related harm through the proposed regulations to introduce a levy. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do not intend to discuss all the clauses of the bill here today. However, I would like to highlight a, no highlight a number of key areas. The Committee supports the overarching principles of the bill to address a number of specific anomalies with regard to the current regulation of land-based betting, gaming, lottery and amusement activities, and to strengthen existing regulatory protections for operators and consumers, as well as young people and those who may be vulnerable to gambling harm. The Committee will be closely scrutinising the range of measures that impact on those under 18 and supports the principle of creating new offences for licence holders in relation to playing of high-stakes gaming machines by those under 18. This bill proposes mandatory codes of practice for the holders of gambling licences and lottery operators. The committee will consider the evidence around this carefully, including around compliance with the codes being a condition of the licence. The committee knows the power to impose an annual financial levy on the gambling industry is a popular aim with the organisations who treat or research gambling-related harm and with responsible industry members, and we look forward to investigating that further. The principle of Sunday and Good Friday opening for licensed bookmaking offices and bingo clubs is to remove an inconsistency, given that gambling is already allowed on licensed racetracks and arcades on Sunday. However, we know that additional Sunday opening may be problematic for some members. The proposed reduction in the lower age limit of licence certificates and permits uh, to 18 years of age will need consideration, and we look forward to seeing what evidence comes to us regarding those proposals. Through this bill, I have already learnt that currently a bet is still considered a gentleman's agreement rather than a contract. So it would seem very sensible to modernise the law in that regard through this bill. Broadening the definition of cheating to include failed attempts to cheat, for example, make attempted match-fixing illegal, would also seem a sensible proposal. Many will be delighted to see the removal of the restrictions on promotional prize competitions, which require a person to purchase a product or service or to hold a specific amount in savings in a bank as a means of being entered into a prize draw. As stakes and prize limits here have not been increased in over 14 years, I am sure the committee will hear support for that proposal, which the Department states can be achieved using secondary legislation in parallel with the progress of the Bill. The committee welcome the proposals to put the operation of pool or tote betting in bookmaking offices on a firm legislative footing. Mr Deputy Speaker, as with the licensing bill before it concerning, concerning alcohol, all of us will also have personal views about gambling, based on experience or perhaps our beliefs. However, we are here to legislate for all of society. It will therefore be the job of the committee to consider all of the evidence and arguments presented and advise, the, advise this House accordingly. The committee is supportive of the principles of the bill and looks forward to considering it in much further detail during committee stage. Mr Speaker, I then just want to make a few points on a personal capacity and as our party spokesperson in, the, in communities. I am disappointed with the bill's lack of ambition and I know the Minister had said that it was not realistic in the remaining time of this Assembly to bring forward a more fuller bill. The Minister has stated she is taking a two-staged approach, introducing this legislation now and then hoping that regulation can be put in place in the next mandate. It is clear to me that this bill is a missed opportunity. Problem gambling in Northern Ireland is endemic. Lives are ruined, families torn apart, children are condemned to greater levels of poverty, poverty and people in the grips of gambling are more likely to take their own lives. In this context of the issues of problem gambling that we face here, it is astounding that this bill, rather than take the opportunity to regulate the in industry, seeks to further deregulate gambling in Northern Ireland. 
regulation of the gambling industry is not novel, new or unusual. It is, in fact, the stated position of the Minister's own party. This makes it all the more curious as to why there is no meaningful regulation of the industry contained in this bill. In the rest of the UK, regulation exists to protect problem gamblers. While these regulations are not perfect and more needs to be done, especially in relation to young people, as well as greater advertising restrictions, regulation is in place. But it is shocking. Yes, certainly. Is the, minister, is the member aware, is there any reason why simply the ambit of the gambling commissioner in GB, any reason why their powers couldn't be extended to Northern Ireland uh, and therefore bring some regulation and oversight of an independent nature? I thank the member um, for his comments. I think that's up to probably the minister to respond to that, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't have followed suit. Mr. Speaker, it is well known, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is well known that Northern Ireland has the worst incidence of problem gambling in the UK. It is clear that we need gambling regulation to help those in the grips of addiction. Yet, at a time when regulation is needed, we, what we have in this bill is greater deregulation. Clauses 2 and 6 of the bill extend opening hours of betting shops and bingo halls. This isn't an insignificant increase in high street betting. The changes proposed in this bill represent an increase of 16.67 per cent of opening hours. What is worse is the increase in opening hours disproportionately affect those on low incomes. There are over 300 betting shops on the high street in Northern Ireland. Almost 37 per cent of those shops, that is over one third of the total number of betting shops, are found in the bottom 10 per cent of areas of social deprivation. Over 80 per cent of betting shops are located in the bottom 50 per cent of the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. Not one betting shop is located in any of the most affluent areas here in Northern Ireland. An increase in the opening hours of betting shops will obviously affect those areas that can least afford to suffer the harms of problem gambling. A wider question should perhaps be asked as to why large betting companies have been allowed to cluster around the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. My constituency has the most betting shops of any constituency, with 31 shops. That compares to North Down, that has less than 10. Gambling is of, is, of, is of greater prevalence in our more deprived areas, but also research shows that people in deprived areas are more likely to bet on outcomes that have greater odds and consequently, consequently more chances of losing. This is particularly true in sports betting, which is more pre prevalent in betting shops. Yes, go ahead. She mentioned the issue around, we, we don't have, uh, she, she took the intervention previously about lack of uh, a similar type of commissioner that exists in GB, but she also recognised that this bill doesn't do anything about the anomaly that exists on a north-south basis, which is the fact that uh, gaming machines are not allowed in pubs or bookies south of the border, but this bill doesn't do it. It's completely silent on that. Yeah, I thank the member for highlighting that as well. Um, I think he's absolutely right. And it, again, I, there, the, there are anomalies throughout this bill, whether that is north, south or east, west. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the legislation does, not, it does nothing to legislate for fixed odd betting terminals, as Mr. Allister had brought up earlier. In the rest of the UK, these types of terminals are regulated and limited to two pounds per bet. There is no regulation in Northern Ireland, rather a voluntary code is in, is in place. Not all operators have signed up to the voluntary code and it is not universally applied. Given that fixed odds betting terminals are inside betting shops, most of these types of machines are located in the poorest areas of Northern Ireland. These types of machines, especially if they are not limited, are huge money makers for the gambling industry and more worryingly, these machines are more attractive to young people. While Clause 7 of the Bill does make it an offence for under 18s to be enticed to play gaming machines, the Bill does not go far enough. Betting shops, by clustering around deprived areas, are targeting those that can least afford it. This Bill does very little to help those in vulnerable positions who are being targeted by mega companies who simply exploit them for profit. It is time that something was done to help those who need it. This Bill is an opportunity 
to bring real and meaningful change by that opportunity I feel has been missed somewhat. While other parties have taken little action in this regard, my party colleagues at Westminster have been at the forefront of helping better regulate the market. In Westminster, the Licensing and Advertising Bill proposed deregulation of advertising for online gambling. It was the DUP taking their seats at Westminster that made the case that gambling cannot be deregulated unless regulation to help and support problem gambling is in place. It was my party colleagues in Westminster that went against the government and put together a coalition across the House to ensure that meaningful self-exclusion me measures for online gambling were put in place. As a result, the government introduced multi-operator self-exclusion measures. That resu this resulted in the creation of GamStop. As of Christmas last year, 170,000 people had received support for gambling addictions. This is why I and colleagues feel so passionately about ensuring that any deregulation of the industry is balanced by regulations to help those who find themselves in difficulties. It is clear that if this bill passes second stage, substantial amendments will be required to protect families and communities, help problem gamblers and ensure people get the help that they need. Thank you. I call Kira Ferguson. Thank you for the chance to speak on the second stage of this very important bill. Firstly, it is important once again I think, uh, to acknowledge that many people, approximately two-thirds in the North, enjoy the activity of gambling, and most do so responsibly. Sinn Féin are not seeking to take this enjoyment away from anyone, but what we do understand is that for some people and their families, gambling can become a serious problem, and more often than not, this can lead to heartbreak and pain for so many individuals, families and communities. In 2016, the Gambling Prevalence Survey, the second of its kind here since 2010, reported 2.3 per cent deemed themselves as problem gamblers. This is obviously high, which has been mentioned today, over four times um, than in England, three times Scotland and twice as much than in Wales. We can and must do better to not only support those who suffer from gambling addiction, but also to make striding efforts to help reduce the number of individuals that may be affected in the future. That is why we and Sinn Féin welcome this extremely important piece of legislation brought forward by the Communities Minister. We also would like to recognise and acknowledge the endeavours of previous ministers to try and bring about imperative reform of our gambling legislation. This, until now, has not been achieved, and this is why we must ensure that these reforms are implemented as soon as possible. A special mention must go to my colleague Sinead Innes, MLA, for her commitment to ensuring we see change to this outdated legislation. In 2019, Sinead, along with our colleagues in the South, launched the party's All-Ireland Problem Gambling document. This document sets out key recommendations and proposals on how to tackle this growing issue. This document looked at specific issues, with some of them being here debated today, um, and hopefully others being discussed in the not-so-distant future. Within this document, some of the key recommendations are to tackle the issue of fixed odd betting terminals, to bring greater protection for children and young people, especially in terms of online gambling, advertising, sponsorship and promotions, and the issues of casinos, to name but a few. These recommendations and proposals will allow for greater protections to be introduced to protect the most vulnerable within our society. As the Minister has stated, our current gambling legislation is extremely complex, outdated and requires a lot of reform, as seen with the interest from the consultation um, that was closed back in February 2020 and then published in November. We believe that the Minister for Community's decision to reform our gambling legislation in a two-phased approach is the smart and correct way to go about this. The Minister and her de department plan to deliver tangible changes to around 16 key areas, which include greater protection for children and young people, powers to impose a statutory levy on gambling operators, and mandatory codes of practice, amongst other key recommendations. 
We have seen recently that the Minister announced that she is changing legislation to allow local voluntary community groups, along with clubs, to raise vital funds by selling lottery tickets online. This is extremely important, especially with so many of these groups being impacted as a result of COVID. This is just one step in terms of coming up to speed with the technological advancements in modern society. In terms of the specifics of the bill, it is great to hear the Minister reinforce the point that when the bill passes, this is not the end of reforming our outdated gambling legislation. It's simply the beginning. We welcome all proposals, and I will not touch on them all at this stage, as we will have plenty of time in further stages to get into greater detail around the clauses, etc. I welcome the Minister and her Department's work around the introduction of a new article in regards to codes of practice. This will enable the Minister and her Department to issue and publish one or more codes of practice about the manner in which gambling facilities are provided. This will ensure greater scrutiny on the industry and that the vulnerable are not being exploited. In conclusion, it is clear that many in the House would like to see more radical reform, but we fully understand what the Minister has said in terms of bringing through what is possible and what is realistic within this mandate. We also welcome that the Minister has stated that there will be a next phase after this phase has been introduced. That will include more radical proposals. We look forward to getting stuck into them when the time comes, but in the meantime we have a job of work to ensure that the introduction of this legislation is done in the best possible way that will ensure greater protections are given to our most vulnerable whilst ensuring our gambling industry comes up to speed with technological advancements. Thank you. I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity today to, to speak on this bill uh, and, I suppose, the opportunity to speak on the, the very important matter of gambling-related harm within our communities. And I hope in doing so we can raise awareness and break some of the stigma surrounding this addiction affecting swathes of people within our society as well as legislate to prevent and mitigate against the damage gambling can and does do. In real terms, and others have lent on some of these figures, the North has a total of 40,000 problem gamblers. That's 40,000 individuals and their families who desperately need protections and support. I believe this piece of legislation fails to provide either. It lacks not only ambition, but also substance in that regard. The statistics are clear, and all our members have already used them, uh, the chair of the committee and my constituency colleague from FOIL. The North has a gambling problem, the most profound on these islands, or across these islands, and I think that's in no small part attributable to the fact that we have not witnessed any significant gambling law reform for almost four decades. It is hugely disappointing, therefore, that this bill fails to address the root causes of gambling and omits significant safeguards. I recognise, uh, as the Minister said, that this bill is a starting point, and while some elements of it are good and, and welcome, essentially uh, this legislation that the Minister is bringing forward is notable for what it does not do, rather than what it does. The issue is not isolated to the north, but rather it is a problem for the whole of this island. And Mr O'Toole referred to an anomaly between both jurisdictions earlier. I note with interest that the Minister's own party has contributed very vociferously to a similar debate in the Dáil, calling for all the trimmings that we would like to see in this legislation, a gambling regulator, online regulation and self-exclusion regulation. My question is why is the minister or is the minister opting to deviate from her own party policy in the north? Surely we should be pushing for a 32 counties strategy that applies protections for vulnerable people. We need regulation right across the island and islands. Turning to the detail of the bill, we welcome clause 7 which makes it an offence to invite a person under 18 to play gaming machines. Clause 12 and 13 focus on enforceability of gambling contracts, and that is another very welcome inclusion. But I fear that in aiming for the very low-hanging fruit, the Department fails to tackle the bigger issues at hand. We would have liked to have seen the inclusion of a regulatory provision for fixed-odd betting terminals, 
I appreciate this is a legally grey area, but the exclusion of such a key component is regrettable, to say the least. The voluntary reduction of the fixed odd betting terminal maximum stake to £2 by larger gambling organisations was a welcome step. However, the absence of a regulator or regulatory body to oversee the number of gaming machines in operation or determine how many have been recalibrated to reduce the maximum stakes puts people at greater risk of gambling-related harm. Looking briefly at Clause 3, which permits betting shops to trade on Sundays and Good Friday, I recognise that this clause has proved already a, a point of contention for some within this chamber, and I am sure we will hear more on that throughout the day. Criticism has been levelled at it normalising gambling within our society, and I do not want to gloss over these concerns entirely, but to dwell on this one element is to lose sight of the real issues of this bill and the wider problem of gambling-related harm. For example, online gambling, which accounts for so much of gambling here, is available 24-7 and accessible from one's home or work or wherever someone might be. I would argue that attention should be focused on the online element and toward the overall failure of this bill to provide a framework of protections. Personally, certainly. The member agrees that a good friend of mine and former teammate, Oshin McConville, is one person who speaks with enormous power and enormous credibility on this issue. And he has identified the proliferation of online gambling, the proliferation of sponsorship of gambling companies within sport, and how destructive they are potentially to young people's lives. Someone who have, someone who's gone through that experience has let himself and he will speak with real authority on it. Do you not agree that this must be addressed from a sponsorship perspective and especially from an access to online gambling? It has to be addressed and that bill should seek to do that. I thank the member for his contribution. I think it's very important that we listen to voices. We listen to voices of those who have been damaged by gambling and those who are being damaged by gambling. I'd like to commend Mr McConville for the courage that he has demonstrated. And just last week I, I watched a documentary. It's another code on the the nineties and the premiership in England and Keith Gillespie. Another uh, man from this part of the world was very good in terms of him outlining the risks of gambling to people. Personally, I do see some rationale in permitting, permitting uh, Sunday opening for bookmaker shops. Many of our major sporting events do reach their climax on Sunday, and therefore local businesses miss out while online providers and bookies just over the, the, the border and indeed illegal bookmakers can prosper. Clause 14 establishes a levy on the betting industry levy. levy. There are concerns that this proposal would place restrictions on smaller businesses like bookmakers and bingo halls, thus reducing the effectiveness of garnering funds to support people experiencing gambling a a addiction. Once again, it seems to let online providers off the hook. So you'll have bookmakers who are established here, who are paying rates, who are employing people uh, left to carry the can for the whole industry effectively. The levy proposed is eerily similar to the provision made under the Gambling Act 2005, the shortcomings of which have already been highlighted at Westminster and by stakeholders. We need to do better than copy and paste from existing legislation elsewhere, particularly when it is an outdated piece of work that we are lifting from. We need to take a more comprehensive approach, one that takes into account the North's unique set of challenges, and one that keeps pace with the industry to address the exponential rise in online gambling. The current voluntary model in place is inadequate and neglects to look at the bigger picture. Figures provided by NI Turf Guardians Association revealed that in 2019 only £24,000 was paid towards counselling services to support uh, problem gamblers. Now, consider that the commitment made by five of the largest gambling companies in England, Scotland and Wales of £25 million per year until 2025 to support those affected by gambling addiction. Bearing in mind that this problem, as, as all members have said so far, is most profound in Northern Ireland, £24,000 is but a drop in the ocean, a complete pittance 
uh, in comparison. Now turning to clause 15, the term set out for a code of practice is once again a clause remarkable in its feebleness. In cases where some within the industry should breach the code, this provision fails to even impose a slap on the wrist, as it were. Without enforcement powers, it proves meaningless. The oversights and indeed shortcomings of this bill, which I have outlined so far, highlight the need for in-depth scrutiny and amendments, which I hope will be considered and passed at committee stage, to strengthen the sentiments embodied therein. Mr Deputy Speaker, to bring my remarks to a close, I find it difficult to comprehend that despite, I think it's fair to say, universal support across this chamber for strong regulation, the Minister is presenting a bill that does little to help those experiencing uh, problem gambling and their families. Even more confounding is that the Minister is missing an opportunity to implement her own party's policy. Ms Ferguson referred to her party's all-island approach, but it would seem more like a 26 counties gambling strategy here in the six counties where Sinn Féin actually have the power to improve things meaningfully and radically for people. They are tinkering around the edges. So the bill before us makes for quite a disappointing read. It does not provide the bare minimum of regulating online betting or fixed odds betting terminals. I am of the belief that if something is worth doing, then it is worth doing right. The delay to bring forward the necessary regulations will only compound problem gambling and does nothing to help those caught in the grips of gambling addiction. The bill has no teeth. To leave a place recognised, accepted, uh, by all to be at the greatest risk of gambling-related harm without appropriate protections is not only unconscionable, it is actually quite reckless. The Minister has cited a lack of time as a reason or some sort of justification for this piecemeal approach, but whose fault is it that we have not had a full mandate? Is the fact that we were not here for three years is, and were not able to legislate at all does that mean that now we should accept substandard legislation? I do not think so, and I do not think that is fair on people either. I am mindful that the gambling industry is also an important employer here in the North, and that gambling, as Ms Ferguson has pointed out, can be and is enjoyed responsibly by many. And when enshrining gambling protections into law, these points must also be considered. However, rather than being nuanced, this bill is neglectful. Overall, the SDLP supports the broad principles of this bill, but as you may have gathered, we recognise its significant shortcomings and failure to provide a bespoke set of safeguards for those at risk of gambling related harm across the North. This bill had potential, but it is looking like an opportunity missed. It will be up to us uh, in the committee and us as an assembly to work hard to improve this bill. So we will support its passage today in order to give us the chance to do that important work to protect people from the harm and damage that gambling can do. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And like the member across the chamber, um, we will be voting in favour of the, uh, moving this bill in second stage. Um, but in doing so, we will encourage the committee to uh, apply a huge amount of scrutiny. I know the chair has already alluded to the fact that, given the, the volume of legislation that the committee is sitting under, that good legislation is essential and it won't be rushed through. And there's, there's a lot to draw from. We are only talking about the broad principles today, but actually encapsulated within that, we need to ensure that we give voice to those that suffer most from the ill effects of gambling. And, I don't think there are too many uh, prohibitionists that maybe will be speaking today with regard to gambling. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, just to declare an interest, I am the chair of the All Party Group on Reducing Gambling-Related Harm, and it's an APG that has met um, uh, religiously now for about a year and a half, and it's had a, a Philip McGuigan is the vice chair, and, and you know it's, it's been one of those well-attended APGs. So there's an absolute appetite uh, in this uh, house across all the parties to ensure that any legislation protects those that are most risk. And we've heard some testimony, and uh, Mr. McNulty was just dropped in there to, to talk about Oshie McConville, uh, the GAA player, who shared uh, 
not only with the APG but also on a, on a mental health podcast because the correlation between uh, gambling-related harm and poor mental health is inextricable, as is most uh, addictions, Mr Deputy Speaker. Others have already said in this debate that Northern Ireland does indeed have the highest incidence of problem, problem gambling uh, in the UK and indeed uh, on this island. And the gambling here, as has been said, but it's worth saying again, is over four and a half times worse than England, three times worse than that faced in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, and twice as bad as that in Wales. And that's why we need something quite actually quite radical here, because the risk here has been measured to be infinitely worse. Many people hide their gambling, and by the time it is uncovered, they find themselves in deep debt, and financial problems can escalate quickly. Uh, Oshin McConville, uh, when he shared with us, and sh has shared openly many times, has actually talked quite candidly about the impact on his family and on himself, and the lengths that people will go to to hide uh, that addiction. In the internet age, Mr. Uh, Speaker, the betting shop is always on offer. People can chase their losses 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as problem gamblers try to recoup what they've lost, bills go unpaid. And in Northern Ireland, we allow credit cards to be used for gambling, and these can quickly be maxed out. And that really is a problem. As people get into this type of problem, uh, we've heard from witness testimonies that they can steal from loved ones. They can beg, borrow, steal, and, and often not find themselves able to repay their debt. And then relations and relationships become incredibly strained, and very often uh, they can break down. And even children at home can go without when parents or carers find themselves uh, using money that was for things like food or for clothing or for heating. And actually, because of the nature of their addiction, fire it into a machine. We've heard a lot about the, the fixed odd betting terminals, or go to the bookie shop, or go online, unfortunately. Uh, we know that through COVID, for instance, that there's been micro-targeting uh, of uh, prevalent gamblers. And very often, these prevalent gamblers, um, that's where the high profits come from. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it kind of is getting out of control, Mr Deputy Speaker. Many people at this point will see no way out. They keep, gam they keep on gambling and trying to recoup their loss as, as they just chase after the money uh, that has is, that is literally slipped through their fingers. And often the despair is suffered alone, as many of the problem gamblers keep their addiction a secret, and it's only uncovered when that person has no way out. As I've said, Mr Deputy Speaker, this impacts on people's mental well-being, not just person with the addiction, but in fact those around them. And people caught in problem gambling are more likely to be depressed, feel anxiety and be stressed, and unfortunately they're more likely to have suicidal thoughts. Problem gamblers are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide than anyone else in the population, and they're four times more likely to attempt suicide than any other people uh, with an addiction. And we know already that we have a problem with poor mental health here in Northern Ireland and very high rates of uh, suicide and suicidal ideation. And that is why when we get the facts that are before us with regard to where these problems lie, that's, that gives us the impetus to actually go and do something about it. And Mr. Speaker, we can no longer choose to ignore what's in front of us. What's needed is action now. And if we get to the next mandate to bring in regulation, it could be another three years before gamblers here are given the same statutory protections that people from in the rest of the UK benefit from. So, Mr Speaker, people are in the grips of the problems now, and today is when we need to act. To turn to the bill, um, Clause 2 and 6, which has already been referred to with regard to Sunday opening, uh, I suppose it's disappointing that rather than regulate the industry, this bill will give problem gamblers even more time to spend in betting shops and bingo halls. And I take the point from the member across that with the, the, uh, the explosion of online gambling, that's already there. And I suppose in some ways it levels up uh, the playing field. Um, but my point isn't necessarily about opening on Sundays and having any um, real problem with that. But my, my issue is that we're going to open them up without um, making sure that the protections are in place for gamblers if we do indeed open up the premises on those days. Perhaps the committee could look at how these clauses could be passed but amended to take effect that the regulation and protections need to be in place before um, the shops are indeed opened on Sundays. It would be like a negative resolution, if you like, um, but that would be something I think might have some value. Clause 7, uh, we're going to talk about gaming machines. Mr Speaker, the regulation of gaming machines for under-18s in Clause 7 is to be welcomed 
and a new offence prohibiting the enticement of young people to gaming machines will protect young people from the dangers of gaming, which is a gateway uh, to problem gambling. And it's obvious that um, the earlier a person starts gambling, the more likely it is that they become addicted. So preventing children and young people from developing a habit that could lead to problem gambling is obviously to be welcomed. I suppose one of the disappointing parts of the, the bill for me is um, I, would love to, I would like to see a much more preventative approach. So whilst we need to have that interve intervention strategy and those that help for those people that have an addiction, what we're learning is that the addic addictive behaviour is, it can become imprinted in young people at a very early age. And I would like to have seen something much more in there with regard to the education piece and the preventative piece. Uh, we need to go much further, um, and I've, I've already alluded to the fixed odd betting terminals, which are regulated across the rest of the UK, which are limited to a £2 bet. And this regulation is voluntary in Northern Ireland, and many of the large companies comply with the voluntary code. In fact, many of our uh, gaming establishments already do. Not every fixed odds betting terminal is limited to £2, uh, and that cannot be allowed to continue. It's time for a comprehensive regulation that allows for age verification. Self-exclusion, the banning of the use of credit cards, as I've already alluded to, and to mandate the use of algorithms to ensure that problematic patterns of play are picked up uh, and acted upon. Many of these regulatory practices are already in place uh, in the rest of the UK, sadly not here. And problem gamblers need the same protections here as that are available in Great Britain, and it's time indeed for the Minister to act. Clause 10, which is the qualifications by age, uh, residence or corporate status. Mr Speaker, I'd like the Minister, perhaps, if she could clarify uh, for us today the purpose and what amounts, uh, in my eyes, to a deregulation at Clause 10.4 and 10.5. That's the removal of the need for a body corporate to be registered under the Companies Act 2006 in Northern Ireland. It seems to create a layer of risk and seems to serve no benefit at all that I can see. Um, and the reason I raise this is that given that there has been a rise in unauthorised and unregulated bingo style events uh, across Northern Ireland, particularly during COVID, uh, with instances of children under the age of 16 be being given access to bingo cards uh, with cash prizes, it seems uh, that the relaxation without a robust code of practice, an independent regulator or indeed a gambling commissioner may uh, increase the risk of the development of gambling related problems and habits with our young people uh, with, across our communities. Clause 14 is the statutory levy. Mr Speaker, if we are to help problem gamblers, then we need the resources in place, that, and that will require a huge financial investment. In 2019, the top five bookmakers in the UK posted profits of almost £15 billion. Of course, that is not uh, the entirety of the gambling profits in the UK. That's just those that are reported. But it's estimated that gambling costs uh, roughly about a billion pounds in the UK each year. And it's easy to see that a gambling levy uh, to redress the balance is required, and I know it has been addressed in some way. But that levy needs to be mandatory, and it needs to be significant in terms of what the gambling industry is required to pay. Moreover, and of crucial importance, uh, money for research, education, as I've outlined, we need to get upstream with our problems, and treatment for gambling-related harms is needed more urgently in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the UK, or indeed on these islands, because of the high levels of gambling-related harm here uh, at home. Clause 15, the Code of Practice. Mr Speaker, a Code of Practice is welcome. The industry needs, uh, to, it needs to be set the highest um, standards to follow. However, it is concerning that the Code of Practice we see before us is not enforceable and there is no sanction for those who breach the Code. A Code without meaningful sanction when it is breached is worthless in terms of combating harms related to gambling. And the omission is something that should be looked at, at in committee stage. Finally, I just want to address uh, some issues with regard, regard to online gambling. Mr Speaker, it is disappointing that the bill does not tackle the key area of online gambling. And I'm sure most of the members in the chamber will have been contacted by someone, uh, perhaps a constituent or someone ac uh, across the country. They'll have known someone who has become affected and, and has, has fallen foul to the enticements and those flashy advertisements and the, the promise of the get rich quick and that addictive behaviour that can quickly follow. It's essential that we follow the regulation in the rest of the UK and properly regulate online gambling to protect those people and do it as soon as possible. Online gambling is now a substantial part of the gambling market. Appro approximately 40% of the gambling market in the UK is now conduct conducted online. The bookies, in that sense, never close. So problem gamblers can never escape their addiction. 
with 15% saying they bet while they're working. Online gambling has become much more destructive than high street betting in that, in that regard. I understand the constrictions in some way with the minister with regard to how we've got this, but uh, to be fair to those um, terra firma betting shops and so on, at least we'll have something there. And it's maybe regrettable that we're not seeing this, the online um, part coming either with this or even first. People chase their losses. I've said that, and they can do it any time of day or night. There is absolutely no escape for those that are addicted. And it's clear that people need to be given the tools to escape and walk away from online harms. Online gambling is not just the big bookmakers. There is significant online harm aimed at children and young people too, Mr. Speaker. Children are encouraged to pay money and take risks in computer games, as many games employ what is termed loot boxes. Loot boxes are virtual treasure chests containing undisclosed items that can be used in games. These might be ways of customizing characters or weapons. Loot, box loot boxes are random. You could get a significant character or boost in a game, or you could get what amounts to nothing. So games encourage children to spend more money, to buy more randomized prizes in the hope of getting a, a large in-game return. It's easy to see the links between gambling and gaming. The same techniques used by the gambling companies are now found in children's gaming. This should alarm us. This may seem subtle, but it's a clear introduction to gambling and something that should be re regulated to ensure online safety. Mr. Speaker, we will support the bill progressing from second stage and look forward to the committee's scrutiny and amendments that come forward. I call Kelly Armstrong. Speaker, um, and thank you, Minister. Um, I know you're hearing a lot against the bill today, but it's a step in the right direction, and you're certainly keeping us busy on the Communities Committee. Um, Deputy Speaker, I'm going to declare an interest. I have played the National Lottery. I have bet on Grand Nationals. I have been to Drumbo. I'm not going to say that gambling is all wonderful. It's something that is treated as entertainment, but when it's not entertainment, that's when it becomes a problem. We know that this bill that has been put forward is an amending bill. Minister, I say to you and your department, expect amendments to come forward. Your bill will amend parts of the existing 1985 order, but it does not legislate for, as others have said, online activity, as the 85 order is too old. And for those of us who were teenagers, maybe slightly older than that in 1985, we didn't even have the internet in those days. So the times have certainly changed. It's not possible to import modern day terms into the structure and language of the 1985 order. I get that and I get why there needs to be a second piece of legislation. But the current piece of legislation in front of us, as others have said, is somewhat disappointing. However, just to let you know, Minister, I will be voting for it because I think there's a way to amend this. There may be a few amendments coming forward to make this more fit for purpose, especially during this mandate and how we're, we've got so little time. Um, we know, I, I want, others have talked about other clauses, but I want to come back to clause 14 at this stage, the industry levy. I have difficulties with this clause. I understand what it's trying to achieve, um, but the Department of Finance will need to give approval to communities for what it can be spent on if we do get a levy. The only people who are going to be paying the levy will actually be those gambling venues that are here in Northern Ireland. The online gaming industry, the online gambling industry is not going to be paying. They're not going to be asked to contribute because they won't have an address here. There's very little information in the bill of what or how the levy will look like. And through the committee, I hope to tease that out to see what we can do with a levy within um, the bounds of what the current gaming industry, the gambling industry is within Northern Ireland. I know that you're in the process of setting up a cross-departmental group that will look at some of the issues around health promotion, and my colleague Paula Bradshaw will talk about that later when she's discussing this um, piece of legislation. We need to, I know that you're thinking about what is gambling and what are some of the indicators of potential harm. Um, many would like to see a standalone addiction service for gambling, and it's one thing, Minister, that's not just your department. This will have to go across education and health. At the moment, if someone presents to their GP surgery saying that they have a gambling addiction, there's very little that that GP can direct them towards. Sunday operating hours, there is protection, as we know, in the bill for workers who do not want to work on a Sunday, and that brings us in line with the rest of the UK and Ireland. The second phase of the legislation, the Minister, that you have talked about is going to be enormous. 
absolutely enormous. And I get the fact that we can't do that in the, what we have left of this mandate. But there are lots of questions, and I look forward to working with the committee and with yourselves on, on how we can move what we can at this stage forward. At this point, um, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to Gambling With Lives, who many in the All Party Group will have worked with. I absolutely support their campaign that appropriate legislation to restrict gambling needs to be updated in Northern Ireland. Gambling does prey on vulnerable people and it does ruin lives. Around 10% of people who take their own lives do so as a result of their gambling addiction. Addiction to slot machines, online betting and lotteries is more than an issue about money. Gambling kills. It is vital that the Assembly moves forward on gambling legislation as a matter of urgency to save more people from being pulled into a life-destroying habit. And while the Minister says online gambling will be dealt with in the next mandate, online gambling does mean access to betting is available 24 hours a day and often with very little checks on the age of people using those sites. I am disappointed that we haven't taken the opportunity to align with the rest of, of GB by bringing in the ban on credit cards being used for gambling. Gambling with credit cards allows people to use money that they don't have. For addicts, this t can be too tempting and a proposition to ignore, particularly at a time when online and virtual gambling is, gambling, sorry, is more popular than ever before. During the coronavirus lockdown, we have seen an increase in the number of people using these outlets, so legislation is more important than ever. Gambling can be fun. This Assembly has used gambling and the outputs of gambling to save us an absolute fortune. I know just from looking at a piece of research that the National Lottery has put £43 billion into the UK economy, and a significant amount of that comes into Northern Ireland. Quite often we fund those charities, those organisations that prop up government through lottery funds. We have to consider if we're doing this the right way. If we want to fix gambling so it doesn't cause harm, then we need to fix how we budget within this Assembly to ensure the most vulnerable do not have to depend on gambling for the income to cover their charities. Although this bill does throw up a lot of questions, and I do think that there will be amendments. I welcome any opportunity to act on gambling and support the bill at this second stage. I call on you, Murphy. I welcome this opportunity to speak on the second stage of the betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements bill. It is clear to see through the various different speakers so far that this House is in agreement that urgent reform is needed of our gambling legislation here in the North. Again, as mentioned by others, it is not our objective in Sinn Féin to remove the enjoyment of gambling for all, but more importantly, our objective is to see the introduction of changes to ensure greater protection for our problem gamblers or and at-risk gamblers and their families. Sinn Féin recognises that urgent action is needed to tackle the growing rise of problem gambling on the island of Ireland. The north of Ireland has the highest rate of problem gambling in comparison to that of England, Scotland and Wales. The north has approximately four times the amount of problem gamblers that England has. It is widely accepted by many, including the Department for Communities, that the current gambling legislation that exists is complex and outdated. The legislation has not kept pace with the increased technological de developments, including online gambling. The Minister for Communities recognised the urgent need for reform when she launched a consultation on the regulation of gambling here in the North. The level of responses and engagement to this consultation speaks volumes in terms of the importance of this piece of legislation. This has led to the Minister bringing forward this piece of legislation, which is a two-phased approach with the current phase, including 16 key areas, which include greater protection for children and young people, powers to impose a statutory levy on gambling operators, mandatory codes of practice, amongst other key recommendations. We would agree and support these recommendations. The recommendations will ensure greater protection for our most vulnerable, along with more scrutiny and onus on the industry to protect those at risk. 
These recommendations would be in line with our problem gambling document that my colleague Sinead Ennis launched in 2019, which included some key recommendations and proposals. Some of these proposals are being discussed and debated today, such as the introduction to include greater protection for children and young people, powers to impose a statutory level on gambling operators, mandatory codes of practice on the industry, and the beginning of the process of establishing an independent regulator to oversee and scrutinise the industry. In terms of advertisement and promotion, English Soccer Club Bolton Wonders just last week took a big step by announcing that they are cutting ties with all betting organisations and instead, and instead back charities providing support for people with gambling addictions. In regards to the specifics of this bill, we welcome the Minister's words around the introduction of an industry levy. This will go a long way to, to controlling and tackling the growing rise of problem gambling here in the North so long as the levy goes towards greater research and education of problem gambling. With greater investment into this, many more problem gamblers or at-risk gamblers will have the requested help and research needed to help them as best as possible. In conclusion, I again welcome this debate around the long overdue piece of legislation. I again must remind people that Sinn Féin's policy is not to remove the enjoyment or stop people from gambling, but it is to ensure greater protection and regulations are in place to protect the most vulnerable. I look forward to debating this bill again as soon as it comes, as soon as it comes through the committee and back onto the floor of the Assembly. Members, question time is due to commence at 2 p.m. I suggest, therefore, that the House takes its ease until then. This debate will continue after question time when the next speaker scheduled to speak is Paul Frew. So I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments.
Okay, members, it's now time for questions to the Executive Office. And I call, uh, before I call Andy Allen, just remind members then that we have questions 1, 5, and number 8 are withdrawn. So I call Andy Allen to ask the first question. Bear with me. Andy Allen's question has been withdrawn. Apologies for, for me. And I call Sinead Ennis. Question 2, can I call you? Minister. I would again call you with your permission. Junior Minister Kearney will answer this question. The member will be aware that discussions are continuing between the British Government and the EU in relation to the protocol. We continue to engage with the British Government and the EU on issues relating to the end of the transition period, including through the Joint Committee and the Partnership Council, and in meetings with David Frost and Maro Shevchevich. We will continue to take such opportunities to highlight the impact of the end of the transition period on our traders and to reiterate the need for permanent solutions to the issues they are facing, which is often the necessary first step to ensuring they have the capacity to grow their businesses in a range of markets, including the British market, the EU and further afield. Our officials are also in regular contact with their counterparts in Whitehall and Brussels and they regularly meet with officials in the Irish Government to discuss matters of mutual interest. The primary driver for investment here remains our skilled workforce, competitive cost base, and the fact that government, academia and business collaborate together to provide a platform for growth. As an executive, we will never stop promoting the message that our region is a great place to work and do business, through both the Department for Economy and invest NI, but also through our international offices in Brussels, Washington DC and Beijing. And I thank the Minister for his response. Would the Minister agree that the, the wholly negative presentation of the protocol by some quarters um, is not only inaccurate but it's also irresponsible? I absolutely do agree with you. As the member will appreciate, much of the narrative around the protocol flies in the face of reality, and, and it's directly contradicted by the fact that many businesses are seeing and utilising the advantages with which the protocol provides them, such, for example, the dual market access that is available. So there's a lot of dishonesty and fake news about the place, and as the member states, that type of inaccuracy becomes irresponsible when it's accompanied by inflammatory rhetoric and not so thinly veiled warnings. And that creates more economic uncertainty, but it also creates political apprehensions. So I would urge all representatives to be responsible. And where there are issues that need to be addressed, let's do that in a pragmatic way that actually finds durable solutions. The Joint Committee is the forum for how we can find solutions that will implement the protocol in a flexible way. So our businesses, farmers and manufacturers must be allowed to use the opportunities presented by the protocol to create and protect jobs and attract investment. What our business community needs now is certainty, stability, and they need to and want to get on with embracing the unique opportunity that the protocol provides. As for the political repercussions, the sabre rattling needs to stop. Those whipping up tensions should step back from the brink. Let's implement the protocol properly and maintain power sharing. I'm going to call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Minister, um, uh, First Minister, can I ask, um, in relation to uh, the impact on the economy post-Brexit, um, what impact study has been done by the Executive Office of the catastrophic effect on our economy of loss of EU labour? Uh, the DUP Agriculture Minister last week talked about the devastating impact it was having. Has there been a study done? Because manufacturing NI, the FSB, indeed every major business group has talked about the you cost of the Northern Ireland economy please. of losing EU labour since Brexit, thanks to the hard Brexit backed by the DUP. What study has been made by the Executive Office of the impact? You're absolutely right to pinpoint that particular fault line. It is essential that we get to grips with the repercussions that we are seeing. If we look to what is happening in the British state, 
there are serious repercussions and fallout now flowing from the impact and the uh, result of, of Brexit itself. We are now being caught in the tailwinds of that. So it's essential that our power sharing executive and all departments now come together to ensure that we have resilient strategies to ensure that we do not face any more difficulties that are already being posed as a result of Brexit and also the failure to properly implement the protocol. I'm going to call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if I could ask, what efforts and representations have Invest NI made internationally to ensure maximising the opportunities that could arise due to the unique access Northern Ireland has within the UK and to the Republic of Ireland? Well, I thank the member for that question. And the Department for Economy, alongside Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland, is continuing to engage with many sectors to clarify the terms of access to the different markets that are now available and to encourage and enable export growth that could help to drive our uh, economic recovery. But our own industry is capable of analysing these scenarios uh, in and of itself. Uh, I would hope to, uh, in the next few days, meet with a number of local business leaders to explore precisely these kinds of issues. Uh, we have already seen uh, reports from Invest NI that, uh, latterly, there were up to uh, 30 new uh, FDI, prospective S FDI investors looking at the north, looking at the opportunities that in fact the landing zone of the protocol could provide in relation to maximising opportunities to do with dual market access, both the British market and also the single European market. Moving on, I call Paul Frew. Number three. The coronavirus regulations fall under the responsibility of the Department of Health, who will be best placed to provide an update on their continued requirement. At present, and in line with the pathway out of restrictions, the regulations will remain in place for as long as is necessary to protect the health and well-being of our people and to reduce the pressures on the health service, particularly coming into the autumn-winter period, which is predicted to be a difficult period. Supplementary, Paul Frey. I think, Mr. St uh, Speaker, I think the Deputy First Minister, for her uh, question, I certainly have asked the same question of the Health Minister. But given the draconian nature of the emergency powers and the undemocratic harm they are doing, the brutal impact of lockdown measures on mental health, suicide, self-harm and isolation of our people, what work has the Executive undertaken to establish the true cost of the Executive's undemocratic decisions? Well, there's a bit of an irony, I think, in that statement. Um, I mean, the, the executive has taken democratic decisions the whole way through the pandemic. The executive has sought to work together to protect lives and livelihoods. The executive and every minister sitting around that table is there to do right by the public which we serve. And it's important that we continue to do that because we're not out of the woods yet and we still have a way to, to go. Um, I think it's important to note that we are making some progress and I'm glad to see that even at this stage um, we're starting to see a decrease in hospitalisations um, and I hope that that's the trajectory that we're now on and we hope that that continues. Um, we've set out our pathway to recovery, uh, we've set out very clearly how we'll uh, continue to make progress. It must be steady progress, um, it must be sustainable progress because none of us want to go backwards and I certainly don't want us to ever be in a position again where we have to consider things like circuit breakers or lockdowns. So therefore, the preventative approach today is crucially important. Uh, avoiding getting to that point is crucially important. Making sure we have a health service that can serve the population which we serve when they need it. Making sure they have access to the GP, making sure they have access to the hospital service if that's what they require. We need to work to make sure that we can have our business community open, but open safely, that the staff are safe and the public who use those facilities are safe. Um, so I am very confident that it has been a democratic journey in which we have been on in the executive to try to take ourselves from what has been very dark and difficult days into hopefully what is going to be a brighter future. We have set out our recovery plan. Um, that is very clear for us all to see. We are going to have an executive meeting later today and a further one on the 7th of October, which will set out the winter plan. So what do we do in terms of the, the pressures which we will see in our health service? Excuse me, over the coming months. So there's a large, large body of work um, underway, and I think we just need to continue with this work in the period ahead, keep making steady progress. Very mindful of the fact um, that the health service is in dire straits, and very mindful of the fact that we're dealing with healthcare workers up. who are exhausted. Thank you, Nicole. Colin McGrath. 
Mr. Speaker, and can I um, welcome the Deputy First Minister back after her recent illness? And it's good to see her back again. Um, could I ask for some details of the legislative timetable going forward in the period ahead? I know through the Business Committee and uh, the Executive Office, we're keen to see what work will happen between now and the end of the mandate. Uh, and will we be able to get a full list of all of the various pieces of legislation that will be tabled in the coming period? Yeah, uh, th thanks to the member for his um, wish good wishes. Um, the question was in relation to the coronavirus regulations, but very happy to provide in writing just the, the um, legislative, uh, the short legislative window that we perhaps have in front of us um, and what that looks like. But I'm, I will provide that in writing to you. Call Kira Ferguson. Thank the Minister for the update on the future of the COVID emergency measures. Can I also ask for the Minister's assessment of the impact here? when the British government cuts uh, the COVID financial measures, including the furlough scheme and the universal credit uplift? Uh, well, well thank, thanks to the member, and uh, you're very welcome to the Assembly. It is my first time to officially say that to you in the Chamber, um, and good luck with your new role as MLA for FOIL, and I've no doubt you'll be a fantastic representative for the people of FOIL and champion their needs here in this Assembly. Um, in re reference to your, your question, um, I think with, I mean, there's no doubt that with energy and food prices rising, uh, the universal credit uplift ending and furlough ending, that this is a time of real economic hardship and also a time of real uncertainty for many families, particularly those who rely on benefits to put food on their table and, and to heat their homes. That's why um, it's important that Conor Murphy wrote to the, Chancellor, the, the British Chancellor seeking an, an extension to the furlough scheme last week which is obviously very, very important, and also to the British Government to end the £20 weekly uplift that is currently in place. Um, you know, it's just it's beyond crass. It's absolutely offensive that the Tories would consider doing that at this time. Um, and I, I don't think I have any other way to describe um, that action. So let's be in no doubt that these ideological decisions by the Tories will drive more and more people further into poverty and more and more people into the doors of food banks. And it's again, if evidence was ever needed, that... Um, this is the reality that a Tory government doesn't care about the everyday reality of the people who live here. Um, and I think that's, that, that's very clear for all to see. So that's why what we need to see now is immediate progress on the things that are within our gift. That's ending the bedroom tax as brought forward by the Minister for Communities, Sturgey Hargey. This proposal commands the support of the Cliff Edge Coalition and the wider sector. So there can be no more delays and no more prevarication. We now need action to protect the most vulnerable. So as Joint Head of Government here in the North, I will continue to challenge Tory austerity at every turn, continue to stand up for families, for workers, for those who are most disadvantaged in our society, and to fight for a more equal and fair and just society. Professor Salford. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Sir, in response to a question that I tabled to the Minister for the Economy, I was told that the cost of COVID thus far to the local economy has been more than £6 billion. This week, we have launched a £145 million high street scheme, voucher scheme. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that if we enter a situation where you have another lockdown in around October time, whether it's called a lockdown or a circuit breaker, that will have the, net, the net result will be that that high street voucher scheme will have been money spent in vain? Just to, to say to the member, I mean, there clearly is an economic cost. We've always said that the COVID was devastating, um, both on a personal basis for families uh, who've went through it, whether that's through sickness or indeed by losing someone they loved. Uh, there's certainly an economic cost to it, as we we all know and have all engaged with businesses who, who felt the, the worst brunt of that. The, the hospitality sector, you know, all the sectors across the board, all who've had different times of the pandemic face real challenges. That's why we must do everything we can to prevent us having to go backwards. That's why we need to keep making steady progress, keep moving forward uh, and making sure that that's sustainable. Let's never go into reverse if we can absolutely avoid it. So that should be all, where all of our efforts um, are faced. A, a recent um, medical evidence and advice, scientific advice says that the earlier you can go in with the lower impact mitigation, then that's going to serve as well um, and hopefully then lead to a point where we never have to go back into the lockdown or, or, or circuit breaker approach. So I'll be want to take that approach. I'm hoping that all others around the executive table will want to take that approach also. And that's where we're going and on the meeting on the 7th of October when we're talking about our winter plan. These are the very things in which we'll be discussing. They call Nicola Brogan. Question number four, please. Can I call you with your permission, Junior Minister Kearney will take this question. At the NSMC plenary on the 30th of July 2021, an indicative schedule of NSMC meetings was agreed 
to take place from September through until December, the end of this year, 2021. Agendas for NSMC meetings in the various sectors are developed jointly by the lead ministers from each jurisdiction and will reflect the priorities in each sector at that time. NSMC plenary meetings involve the executive, led by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and the Irish Government, led by Antisha. The task of the plenary is to take an overview of cooperation on the island and of the North-South institutions. The next NSMC plenary meeting is due to take place in December. It is not possible to be specific about what the agenda will include at this stage, but recent meetings have focused on cooperation in the response to COVID-19, as well as other relevant matters, such as the implementation of various NDNA commitments, which have a cross-border element. I get Ken Corlett, and I thank the Minister for his answer as well. Does the Minister agree with me that North-South ministerial bodies are an integral part of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement alongside the Executive and the Assembly, and that the DUP boycott of these bodies not only undermines the agreement, but also does a huge disservice to the people that they claim to represent? Well, we and I do agree that the North-South bodies as all of our political institutions are an integral part of the three-stranded approach to the Good Friday Agreement. They are interlocking and they are interdependent. You can't have one and not have the other. And as the member knows, the North-South all-island cooperation bodies are a fundamental part of our political architecture. That's the bedrock of our peace and our political process. I am due to attend, as an accompanying minister, uh, sectoral meetings on the 14th and the 15th of October, and I expect these meetings to go ahead. Any DUP boycott of these bodies would be a very serious matter, and the party involved should reflect very carefully on the implications of such a decision, as the requirement to attend ministerial council meetings is embedded within the ministerial code. So reckless threats to pull down the Assembly and or the Executive and boycotting NSMC meetings places an immediate risk on the €1 billion Euros of EU Peace Plus funding, which is waiting to be signed off on by the Executive and by the NSMC. And that's about supporting jobs, communities and major projects. So for the DUP to undermine the required all-island response to that crisis, uh, to that crisis for party and electoral uh, reasons would be a huge disservice to the people they represent and all the people of this island. And, and to do that while we are still in the middle of coming through a global health crisis against a disease that does not respect any border or boundary, I find to be just beyond belief. So any threat to disengage from the NSMC, in my view, is race to the bottom politics. We need greater north-south and east-west cooperation at this time, not less. We need to build greater resilience and strengthen our power-sharing institutions. And we all collectively, at this point in time, need to double down and commit to delivering a progressive pluralist Time's and up. progressive future for all our people. Thank you. I call John Stewart. I thank the junior minister for his answer so far. Does the junior minister agree that the Belfast Agreement was established on the basis of mutual respect and the principles of consent, and that east-west relations as well as north-south must be conducted in good faith? Does he also recognise that a trade border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK runs contrary to the ethos and to the spirit of the Belfast Agreement? I can agree entirely with everything that the member has said. I am against any type of border uh, that impacts on our people. And it is essential that we see the uh, British Irish Council, the NSMC, all function. We need to see all strands of our political architecture working, and that is why it is the height of madness for any political party, for sectional, political or electoral reasons, to threaten the basis of how those institutions would work. Justin McNulty. Can the joint DUP Sinn Féin First Ministers confirm, is there a legal requirement on the North-South Ministerial Council to sign off on the £1 billion of peace funding, as was detailed by the Finance Ministry, and which can breathe life into communities who are falling behind because of this pandemic? I am not sure if the, the, the member fluffed his lines there. Uh, he and his party are members of a five-party coalition, power-sharing executive here in the north. Uh, there is an executive office, and that reflects 
uh, the role of the joint and the, uh, the, the joint first ministers, the first minister and the deputy first minister. So I'm kind of a wee bit confused to know where exactly he's coming at all of this from. But if he had been listening to me earlier on, he would have probably heard, maybe not, that in fact I made the point that uh, this is a requirement under the basis of the, the ministerial code to attend and also that we require NSMC sign-off in order to ensure that we access that €1 billion Euros of Peace Plus funding. Why does the Minister and his party value the discredited protocol above the north-south bodies, as they must realise that if their partners in government are as good as their word, if there will be no more north-south meetings so long as the protocol subsists? I thank the member for that question. And Barb, the reality is that we have the protocol because you uh, and your fellow travellers fought for, campaigned and then secured the hardest Brexit possible. So the protocol exists as a way to blunt the worst effects of the Brexit that you championed. I would far rather not see a protocol in place. I would far rather not see Brexit exist at all. So the protocol needs to be used in a way which guarantees that our people can live together on the basis of progress and prosperity. And instead of asking silly questions like that, perhaps the member could turn his intellect to working alongside the rest of us in relation to how those kind of landing zones and solutions can in fact be secured, because the protocol is not going away. Question five has been withdrawn, and I call Mervyn Story. Number six, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Um, firstly, let me say how pleased that we are that the scheme is now open for applications. Um, it is hoped that the opening of the scheme will have a positive impact for all who have suffered permanent disablement. We would also like to put on record our thanks to the victims and survivors organisations for the support that they have provided in the implementation of the scheme and also for the assistance that they are providing to victims and survivors through the application process. Funding was provided to the Victims and Survivors Service by TEO in the last financial year. Um, as well as this year, to manage the anticipated demand for support and advice regarding the scheme. This funding provides an additional uh, resource of 14 full-time equivalent welfare staff in the Victims and Survivors Service funded organisations, as well as funding for additional administrative support. It will also enable the Victims and Survivors Service to provide ongoing coordination across the sector to ensure consistency of approach, collaborative working and learning, liaison between organisations and the Victims Payment Board, referral of clients and the monitoring and evaluation. Part of the funding has been allocated to allow for any increases in demand for, um, for health and wellbeing services currently provided by the Victims and Survivors Service funded organisations. Officials will continue to meet with a range of sector representatives and to support meaningful and productive engagement on the scheme. Reverend Story, supplementary. Mr Speaker, it is so sad that we have to, in this House, come to a place where we have to provide money for people who have permanent disablement as a result of the acts of terrorists and the acts of those who endeavoured to take life. It is ironic that in this House today there are those people who want to talk about preserving life, but we are quite happy to justify the taking of life. Member, will, will the Deputy First Minister uh, clarify whose responsibility is it now to run the scheme? Because it seems as though the Minister for Justice has said, I have created it and it is now over to the Executive Office. Is that the case? Well, well firstly, um, can I say that it is so sad that anybody suffered in any way at all throughout the course of conflict. There is hurt caused on all sides, and whilst we never agree, there is hurt caused on all sides, and whilst we never agree in terms of the past, we can agree to never drift backwards, to only move forwards and to build a better society for all, and to ensure that we don't uh, lumber today's generation with the past. Let's build for a better future, but let's do that together. That's certainly uh, where I will focus all of my efforts. Um, I think it's really, really important that after uh, it taken you know, a considerable period of time to get to this point, that in the first instance we welcome the scheme is opened. Uh, justice were uh, the, the, the department um, that designed the scheme, that brought it forward, or sorry, that put the practicalities, if you like, um, together. I am not interested in passing the buck around who is responsible. I mean, uh, the Victims and Survivors Service is all done through the Executive Office Support Scheme, so that is certainly our responsibility. 
Um, I listened to uh, question time last week um, in terms of some of the contributions were where does the responsibility now lay if it, in terms of the delivery of the scheme it comes under the board um, and that's independent in a sense but certainly um, supporting the victims through the scheme is, comes under TEO and, and we'll make sure we play our part. Paul John O'Dowd. And the, the Joint Force Minister gives an update on the provision for the actual funding for the scheme. Yeah, thanks uh, for that. The, so at the outset, I am pleased, as I said, to confirm that, um, the, that we have been able to get the scheme open. That in the, is in the first uh, place, I think, that's the, the best outcome. Um, but in terms of funding the scheme, um, you'll know that um, it's put a huge pressure on the Black Grant, and you know that the ministers are working together. So the Finance Minister and con con or continues the conversations that he's having um, with the British government in relation to the fact that they took policy decisions that have implications for this executive and it puts a huge financial strain on this executive and therefore um, the executive office and the Minister for Justice are continuing to work together around um, putting pressure on um, ensuring that we have the, the right funding and that the British government actually lives up to their commitment, their own funding, uh, statement of funding policy which states that um, where a decision is taken by the British government and imposes that on another on a devolved uh, administration, and then, then they must um, fit the bill. So it's really, really important that we continue with that. And also just to confirm that the Finance Minister has uh, wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, requesting that he considers, reconsiders the Treasury's position around the funding of the scheme. And he will also uh, be looking at dispute mechanisms in order to also raise this issue further. So I think there's a, a journey to be travelled collectively um, in the executive uh, with the, the British government in order to try to uh, ensure that they provide sufficient funding in order to allow us to continue with this scheme. Well, Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the main campaigners for this scheme uh, was blown up on the 4th of March 1972. Can the Minister uh, tell this House that she is certain that this victim will receive a payment before the 50th anniversary of being confined to a wheelchair? Um, well, well, firstly, um, as I said, I'm very glad this scheme has opened and I think that um, uh, victims have had to wait far too long to get to this point. Uh, I will not discuss any individual's application on the floor of this House. That would be completely inappropriate, um, to say the least. So I um, ensure that um, all victims that have applied to the scheme um, receive their, their pay payment promptly. Um, I believe that from the scheme opened up on, um, on the 31st of August, um, there's been 421 applications received. I hope that they're um, processed as speedily as possible and that that, that uh, support gets to victims as quickly as possible. If the member wishes to uh, query an individual's um, particular circumstances, then I suggest you do that through the appropriate channels instead of across the floor of the chamber. Can I ask the Joint First Minister, in relation to families who have been bereaved, many of whom are excluded from this scheme, have any representation made on their behalf? Because there's a lot of misinformation and expectation right across the community, particularly amongst those families who have suffered bereavement. Yeah, we're very aware of the issues affecting bereaved families and survivors, and we're very keen to address their needs. And also, I think, importantly, to acknowledge their loss, and that's been felt by, by so many people. We're delighted that the payment scheme for bereaved victims um, administered by Victims and Survivor Service that, that re has reopened again. Um, it reopened in April. And again, we would encourage all those who are eligible to get in touch with the service and because they can assist them in, um, with the process and also provide them with additional support, like wellbeing support, which is very important as well. I called Stuart Dixon and you're like, not likely to get a supplementary. Question number seven. Uh, uh, with your permission again, uh, Junior Minister Kearney will take this question. The executive discussed the FICT report at its meeting last Thursday and agreed that the report should be published. Consideration is being given as to how best to facilitate this. Stuart Dixon, supplementary. Briefly, yeah, please. Thank the Minister for his reply so far. Minister, can you explain to the House uh, and indeed elaborate for this House what exactly is holding up the publication of this report and what meetings have been held since your last announcement that the report was in preparation? I thank the member for that question. The same, the, the same blockages remained over the summer when I was committed to making progress, and I reported on those blockages on the 28th of uh, June. 
My efforts have again been frustrated in relation to taking this forward. A special executive meeting to discuss the report and recommendations and approve next steps should have convened at the end of April, beginning of May, and that did not happen. So I then formally proposed to the executive on the 8th of July that a full report be brought to the executive by mid-September and to publish the report and recommendations at that time. The last scheduled meeting of the FICT Working Group was due to take place on the 21st of September. That was cancelled. During the executive meeting on the 23rd of September, I called for the procrastination to end and urged again that the report be published with an implementation plan. The executive agreed with that position. That is appropriate. This is an executive report. I intend now to ensure that this commitment is delivered imminently. There is no excuse for any further delay or blocking on this matter. That ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Question 7 has been withdrawn. and I call Mr Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Ministers, for your answers thus far. And Deputy First Minister, I'd like to wish you well on your road to recovery. Could the Minister provide an update on the Northern Ireland Bureau in China further to the success of the 2017 Leaders Summit? Please. Th thank you to the Member for your, your good wishes. Uh, they're very much appreciated. I'm glad to say I'm doing well. Uh, can I? Um, Thank you for your question. So, in relation to our bureau in China, um, it do, in Beijing, it continues to engage with key economic contacts in our um, partner provinces and agencies in China to discuss ongoing economic cooperation following the COVID pandemic. The bureau is also um, working with Invest NI in preparation for future trade mission um, to our partner provinces in the northeast of China, and that will also include working with a number of our councils in our um, friendly city. Um, agreements that we have in that region. The Bureau has also supported Invest DNA, and there's been a number of our local businesses um, that have been able to attend trade shows in China. Um, the ministers, TO officials in the Bureau continue to work with the Chinese consulate here and the government departments in China to develop and maintain market access for a number of companies in the agri-food and the pharma sector, particularly following um, as we come to, uh, towards more easing of COVID restrictions there. So TEO and the Executive Bureau in China and Invest NA is working also with the University of Ulster and the Confucius Institute on a research project to provide advice and information to organisations in the early stages of doing business in China and also to encourage organisations to consider China as a target, um, uh, a target market in the upcoming period. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I agree the link with China is vital for future economic growth locally. What potential is there to further increase the number of Chinese tourists visiting Northern Ireland in the coming years, and what can the Bureau do to assist that aim? Well, I think the, the Bureau is going to have a key role to play. I mean, I think we, we were making real strides forward actually before the pandemic, and we had real um, a huge increase and in, major increase actually in tourism from China. Um, so that work is going to need to now continue at pace, particularly as things start to open up and their opportunities come again. And we look forward to the day whenever we can get back to the tourism se um, sector enjoying a, a strong economy again. So I think that there are lots of opportunities for us to maximise the potential for the number of inward um, tourists from China. Um, but it's going to be key, as I said, we work across our councils, we work with the executive, the Invest NA, um, particularly in terms of the economic opportunities. But certainly there is great scope for, um, for positive progress to be made in terms of tourism in the years ahead. I call Kelly Armstrong. Speaker, um, my questions today will be on action plans. Um, I was very interested with the answers we received earlier, and I would like to ask: When the FICT report is published, will it be published with an action plan? With your permission, can I will ask the Minister Kearney to take that question? Yes, absolutely. The, the report needs to be published with scaffolding. Work has been done in relation to an implementation plan. I've mentioned this in the House before. I've also raised it within the executive. So my expectation is that we should have the publication of the report. We should accompany that with a specific plan which addresses the 45 areas or recommendations where there was, in fact, consensus uh, within the Commission. Uh, members will know, because every single party in this uh, chamber has access to the report. Every single minister has had access to the report. So there were 45 areas, 45 recommendations where consensus existed. There are other areas where challenges remain, 
and the executive needs to deliberate on how best we address the issue of where challenges remain in order that we in fact move forward in a cohesive way and ensure that this particular report is finally published and that it is published in a responsible and in a strategic way with the type of next steps and uh, uh, rec recommendations for action that you uh, speak of. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank um, the junior minister very much for, for his response. We are coming into budget setting time. Can I ask if that action plan will be taken into consideration across all departments when the budgets are being considered and will that be a direction through from the executive office to ensure that there is a cross-cutting commitment to that action plan? Well, I thank the member for the supplementary. Yes, the FICT report is owned by this executive. Uh, that means that it is cross-departmental. All ministers and all departments will have some form of responsibility for the, uh, the delivery of the report. And therefore, it follows that uh, we need to see uh, budgets profiled to accommodate the particular requirement that will be made uh, of certain departments in their shared responsibility for the implementation of the report. So, yes, those issues need to be priced into our budgets to ensure that we have got the resource to ensure that when we finally publish, and I hope that will be sooner rather than later, and I have already asked for a plan to be brought forward to indicate when, in fact, we will see uh, the deadline for, uh, for publication and implementation by the executive, but that we actually have the resource and the capacity to ensure that that's successful. I call Keith Buchanan. Deputy First Minister, I was listening to some of your responses earlier, and I take it you wouldn't be a fan of the Tories from your, your commentary back. What would you say to the uh, commentary that Angela Rayner, the Deputy uh, Leader of the Labour Party, referred to the Tories as homophobic, racist, scum, absolute vile, and she referred to that as street language. I'm glad I didn't live on that street or don't live on that street. So what's your opinion on those comments? <laughs> well, firstly, you're right in, in my assessment that I'm not a fan of the Tories, nor will I ever be. Secondly, the, the reasons for that are purely political and ideological. I think that they prioritise the, the, the needs of few against uh, the needs of, of the majority of citizens. So um, the the stringent cuts uh, that we have had to uh, deal with here as a result of budget cuts from the Tories come into power. The health service crisis is brought about by many reasons, but certainly one of the major contributors is the fact that the budgets have been cut for health for far too long. So my opposition to the Tories is purely on those basis. I think it's important in political discourse that we try to be as courteous as we can, make our political points, um, and that's certainly the approach that, that, that I would take. Keep you can and supplement it. Thank you. So I didn't really hear a condemnation of those terms, but we'll take, leave it at that. Regarding language and actions, uh, Deputy First Minister, they're massively important to public messaging. So everyone's language and actions are important to that. Do you feel any regret that you destroyed the pandemic messaging and have you attended the funeral last June, last year? Um, so here we are um, today and almost the end of September. Um, we've made huge strides forward in terms of responding to the pandemic. I want to continue with that progress. I have continued to lead us through this executive and to take the right approach to support the health service and to support our people with, in terms of protecting lives and livelihoods. That remains my focus. I'll continue to be focused on that. I think that we're continuing to make some progress and we need to create a sustainable way forward and bring in preventative measures that takes us through the winter months and takes the pressure off our health service. That should be the focus of everyone in this chamber, instead of just um, going down rabbit holes again. Call Anya Murphy. Can Collier, can the minister tell us why there has been a delay in the executive agreeing to get rid of the bedroom tax, which penalises the most in need? Thank, thank you to the member for um, her question. And I mean, when we talk about the Tories, uh, the, the thing that comes to your mind is. Uh, welfare cuts. It is the issue of targeting the most vulnerable and making sure and the implications of all of their actions have been to make it so, so difficult for people just to survive, to put food on their table and to heat their homes. So it is time to bend the bedroom tax once and for all. This issue has been delayed and it's been stalled for far too long. Uh, despite the best efforts, and I mean the best efforts, of the Communities Minister to bring forward the legislation that will put this to bed once and for all, it has failed to get on the executive agenda, and that is really not acceptable. But it is for those who have blocked this matter from getting onto the executive table to explain the rationale for their position. 
I can assure the member that the blockage does not rest with myself. Anya Murphy, supplementary. Gurmi Agat, and I would like to thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Joint Force Minister support the request from the Communities Minister, Derry Hargey, for an urgent executive meeting to agree her proposal to get rid of the bedroom tax? Y yes, uh, in short, yes, I do. Um, as I said, the legislation to bin the bedroom tax and amend the welfare mitigation scheme by closing the loopholes is ready. The money has been budgeted for. There is no reason for delay. Uh, the Minister for Communities, Dirdre Hargey, is ready to get this done. Uh, the bedroom tax, as I said, is a Tory attack on those most in need, and that's whether you live in Coleraine or you live in Belfast or Ballymena. It affects everybody equally, uh, and I think that it's time that this needs to be uh, dealt with. I want to see the executive making progress uh, on this issue. I want to see the blockage ended. I want to see the Communities Minister uh, move forward this legislation and for once and for all, uh, bin the bedroom tax. That is where we need to be, despite some uh, political parties saying that that is their public position. Legislation is the way in which to actually confirm that to be the case. Call Mark Durgan. Uh, uh, the Deputy First Minister will obviously be aware that the Climate Change Committee uh, presented to the Executive last week. Can the Minister outline any details of the discussion that took place? Well, I mean, it was a very informative. We had a presentation um, and we had an opportunity to question the, the guests that, were, that had come along. Um, I'm quite sure the presentation isn't a secret, so I'm quite sure we could probably have the, the presentation that we got sent to, to the members. So I would, We'll clarify if that's okay, but I would imagine that, that it is. But it was a very detailed presentation around the opportunities, the need to be ambitious, the need to support rural communities. It was all those things we're all discussing around. And I think that, that um, it was timely that we had that uh, conversation now, particularly in, in advance of, of um, the upcoming summit. Mark Durgan, supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer and do look forward to seeing more detail of that um, important presentation. Uh, the DFI Minister Nicola Mallon has won executive support for a climate summit ahead of COP26. This summit is to, to be organised by the Executive Office. Can the Deputy First Minister provide an update on when this will happen and confirm that a wider range of stakeholders and experts, including Climate Coalition ANI, will be invited? I say, I mean, I think um, last week's presentation was a direct response to the infrastructure minister's ask for a, a discussion on this issue. Um, so maybe, per perhaps, the um, hard to hear when people are, are mumbling away. But um, I think it's important that, that we had that decision. Just, thank you. Thanks, Can Corley. I think it's really, really important that we had uh, that discussion. So I am more than happy, as I have done consistently, uh, working with the. Infrastructure Minister, to, if a climate is where we should be, then that's a climate summit is where we should be. Then I am more than happy to receive that formal proposal, which the Executive Office has yet to receive. Alan Chambers, not in his place. The next question is withdrawn. I move to Daniel Crossan. Daniel Crossan. Sorry, Sorry Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, m uh, Minister, there's been a lot of uh, Interesting commentary in the media of late, particularly from uh, colleagues across this chamber, about who will be the next first or deputy first minister. Is it not the case, deputy first minister, that this is a joint office and that both positions are of the same equal power, and therefore both are joint first ministers? Well, well the simple answer is yes. I can confirm that the uh, first and deputy first minister. It's a joint office. Um, it has joint authority. It has joint uh, ability to. to take decisions uh, and one doesn't operate without the other. So um, that is certainly the question. I, I note a lot of the commentary around this issue. My only desire is actually to do right by the public that actually elect us. We're here uh, to deal with the most challenging issues of today and certainly what's weighing on most people's minds is the issue of hospital waiting list, is the issue of um, the health service, is the issue of getting us out of COVID and into recovery. It's about jobs, it's about health, it's about housing. And I think that's where the public want us to be very much focused in the time ahead. Very brief question indeed. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for that answer. So, is it the case for Joint First Minister that this is in fact an electoral ploy by some in this chamber and it is meaningless and actually doesn't focus on the core issues that we should be dealing with here uh, as an Assembly? Thank you. 
I can assure the member that I will be more interested in our own uh, approach to the election than I will be of others. Um, I put my own mandate or my own manifesto to the public and I'll ask for their support for progressive change for dealing with issues like health, housing and jobs. That's where I think uh, I set out my stall is for others to do which they wish to do in terms of what they do. And members' time is up. And members, please take your ease for a moment or two to be moved to the next item. Okay, members, sitting is resumed, and we now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance. Questions seven and twelve have been withdrawn, and I call Robbie Butler. Number one, please, Minister. With your permission, Concord, I will answer questions one and three together, as they both relate to health and the social care le levy. My officials are in discussion with the Treasury around the health and social care levy and how it will impact on the executive's budget. However, I understand that there will be a legal obligation for the cash, to be raised, the cash raised from the levy to be directed to health and social care. For clarity, while the announcement referenced £400 million, this included levy-funded spend which is not England-specific, such as vaccine costs, and as such will not give rise to a Barnet consequential. The actual funding provided to the Executive will not be known until the spending review outcome, but the current estimation is that the Executive will receive an average annual amount of £300 million. The Executive recognises the importance of directing funding to our health service, and this will be a wider consideration in the local budget process. My recommendation will be that funding provided by the levy should be ring fenced for health. Thank the Minister um, for his answer. The, the Minister has now uh, given us some tangible uh, figures in around the, the reduction from 400 to 300 million. Could you maybe uh, expand on that a little bit for us to, to understand just where that gap would be? Yes, as I was saying uh, when I was responding, some, some of the, the, the figures when you, when you just brought them across each of the devolved areas uh, allocated are, it appeared to in, indicate that we were receiving a receipt of 400 million, but some of that spend is not England specific spend, therefore it doesn't become a barn consequential for us. Some of that is, is broader spend in terms of vaccine, which the cost would be attributed to all of us. So our estimation, and this is yet to be confirmed, uh, and will only be confirmed, I suppose, uh, finally in, in uh, the outcome of the spent review at the end of October. Uh, but our estimation, current estimation, is that there's more like three hundred million than four hundred million pounds. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, as we enter another winter, we're all mindful of the pressures faced by the NHS. Can I ask what other plans there are to ensure the health care budget is prioritised? Thank you. Well, I uh, thank the member for his question. As he will know that we are, have begun the exercise of planning for a multi-annual uh, budget outcome, uh, and uh, this obviously is what we have been seeking for many years, uh, because in order to address the longer-term transformation 
issues within the health service and tackling some of the issues like waiting lists. We need recurrent funding uh, to make sure that we have the staff in the health service that can carry that on. And that was never possible under a, a one-year annual budget scenario. So now that we have got uh, uh, clear that we're having a three-year budget, uh, the executive have already begun planning. and I have put uh, a paper to the executive uh, identifying that health has been our consistent priority right across the executive since we came back uh, in January 2020, and that we need to consider then how we would meet the, the requirements of the health department. And of course, health uh, interests span beyond the health department, but in, in, in cert in certainly in the primary area in relation to uh, acute services, and, and that it would be through the health department. So we've also been talking to the health department itself about its needs, uh, what it thinks it would require in terms of transformation, and then that's the discussion the executive will be getting down to hopefully in the next week or so uh, to begin to match some funding towards that priority or some estimated funding, because we won't know the amount until the end of October, uh, but towards that priority to make sure that we can actually plan to have a better outcome for health over the next three years than we've been having over the last number of years. I call Colin Giller now. And uh, thank the Minister for his answers to date, especially in light of the severe pressures that our health and social care services are under, both in terms of demand and in terms of provision of services. And can I ask the Minister what discussions you have had, Minister, with your executive colleagues to ensure that health will be prioritised in the forthcoming budget? Well, my own department has been talking to the other departments over the course of the summer uh, in, related, in relation to the budget uh, outcome and the, the budget planning that we need to do uh, ahead of the outcome of the spent review at the end of October, uh, so that we're ready actually to draft and launch a, a draft budget uh, and go out to public consultation as quickly as we possibly can then beyond that point. Uh, and so of course, I've, as I've said in the previous response, I've written to the uh, executive colleagues, I, I, I spoke to this at the executive meeting last Thursday. I reminded people that our priority had consistently been supporting the health service, and that was probably more acute uh, even than when we, when we came in in January 2020. The, the needs of the health service itself uh, are more pronounced now than ever. Uh, and so we will need to consider, uh, firstly, in, in dialogue with the health minister and his department, what the requirements are, and then the executive are going to have to take some decisions in terms of prioritisation. We don't know what the outcome of the spending review will be. Uh, we have no sense that it is going to be an improved position in terms of our budget, so that may mean we have to look at other departments and how we prioritise to meet the health needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, in relation to uh, pressures on the health service currently, we do want to see health prioritised. But, Minister, I am also mindful that we have seen the biggest cut uh, in benefits by the British government since World War II, and I note, I note the mental stress that this has caused uh, for many people uh, who are on benefits. Will the Minister commit to working with the Communities Minister to give it back? Thank you. Well, as the member knows, this decision was taken in Westminster, uh, and any decision to give it back uh, should be taken in Westminster's interest, and there seems to be an attempt to pass the problem to one that is now the executive's when it is actually a decision that was taken over in Westminster. The Communities Minister has asked for an urgent executive discussion in relation to all welfare mitigations, including uh, the money that will be lost in that uh, end of the universal credit top-up. Uh, and I hope that that uh, meeting takes place as soon as possible. Of course, we have to then uh, discuss what we have in terms of our budgets, what we expect in terms of the spending review outcome. Uh, but I would say to the member that this decision should have been fought in Westminster. Uh, I, I understand it will affect people here, but it's almost as if the problem has been presented as if it is the executive's problem. The executive didn't cut this top up. The decision was taken in Westminster. At the end of June, the minister, in a written response, indicated to me that of the 769 million of Barnet consequential arising from allocations to the Department of Health in England, only 504 of that had gone to our own Department of Health. Could the minister give an update, if not today, by other processes, of what the present situation is in terms of the Barnet consequentials on health? and the actual spend of that consequential on health, because I think there is much talk and much concern about austerity, but we want to make sure that we are actually spending the money we get for health on health. Well, I, it goes back to, I suppose, the discussion in terms of the three-year as the one-year budget. If we get a barn consequential in-year, it has to be spent in-year. Uh, and if it's a substantial consequential, it may not be the case that health is in a position to fully spend that out. Uh, I will get the member uh, the detail, but I know that this year alone we have given over £70 million uh, to health additional to deal with uh, 
with uh, waiting list issues. We are expecting a Barnet consequential of £180 million, which we will allocate as part of the October monitoring round, and Health has asked to have all of that, and I would support that request from them and uh, make a recommendation accordingly. But it is the case that with Barnet consequences, particularly those that arrive late in the year, it may be the case that Health had said such a level of consequences could not be spent by them, uh, and they did not ask for all that. But I am happy to, to get the detail in relation to that and, and pass it back to the member. Call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. I'm just wondering about discussions or any um, update in terms of additional funding for healthcare workers, and in particular nurses' pay, and any discussions you've had with the UK Treasury around that. Thank you. Well, as the member will know, that the, the British government didn't make uh, the, the type of pay offer to healthcare professionals and nurses and others. Uh, so. Applauding them outside 10 and 11 Downing Street didn't mean much when it came to actually allocating uh, 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 an amount in terms of a pay award. We have been discussing, uh, obviously the Health Minister has been discussing that pay award issue. They've also been discussing the additional uh, £500 pay. Uh, I know his department are progressing that at the moment. Uh, and that's, that's where that is. is. It's the, their progress, not through healthcare workers. Uh, but certainly in relation to the pay awards for healthcare workers. It was very disappointing, but perhaps not un unexpected uh, from Treasury. Well, Diane Dodds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has uh, started to answer the question I was really uh, trying to get at, which was, does he and can he give the House an update on those uh, healthcare workers who are in the private sector in relation to the additional £500 that was promised to them? Well, I, I've seen responses. It's not, it's not the responsibility of the Department of Finance. We allocated, as, as the member would know from her time in the executive, we allocated the funding uh, to cover uh, those issues, and the Department of Health is responsible for uh, distributing it. Uh, I know they seem to have run into some technical and procedural issues which have delayed. The latest responses that I saw uh, were talking about this being sorted in the autumn. So uh, I know people are anxiously waiting on that £500, and it has been the subject, I'm sure, for all members of a lot of uh, inquiries. Uh, so I would hope that that is expedited as quickly as possible because I know uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to that and very much need it uh, in the time ahead. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two. I was delighted to recently launch the new Civil Service Operational Delivery Apprenticeship Scheme alongside Minister Hargey and Minister Lyons to recruit 45 operational delivery apprentices. This is the largest civil service apprenticeship recruitment to date and offers successful candidates an entry-level route into a career in the civil service, allowing them to earn a wage while undertaking a work-based qualification over a two-year period. Apprentices who successfully complete their apprenticeship will progress to the next grade administrative officer within the operational delivery profession. Robin Newton, supplementary. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I just say, Minister, 45 apprentices out of a as I understand it, workforce of some 23,000 seems to be a very small number. But can I ask the Minister, in terms of what are the qualifications necessary in order to gain a place? And can I ask the Minister, would he be mindful to give consideration to those youngsters who have been, in fact, underachieving at school and perhaps finding a route into the civil service within this scheme for those youngsters? Well, the, the apprentice scheme is only one of a number of, of, of options, and there are, the, I think, about 100 student placements as well, where people can come in uh, and, and work for a period and go back to their, their, their training. I, I, will, I will get him the exact entry requirements, but I actually think he makes a very valid point, and is one that we have discussed uh, on occasion in the department, that of uh, an opportunity for, for people who aren't achieving as they might have wished in school uh, to ensure that the civil service uh, has a very broad home for people uh, of all skills and levels uh, of education. So that's something that I will take away uh, and I will come back to him and report to him on any progress. But I think it's a, a very valid point in terms of these schemes. And I would like to see greater numbers uh, in these schemes. We are changing recruitment. We are looking at the whole recruitment practices as per the recommendation uh, from the Audit Office report. Uh, and there are a number of measures, including this apprentice scheme, student placement schemes, uh, open recruitment processes, uh, all of which I hope will have a transformative effect in the civil service. But I'm certainly happy to take suggestions from him in relation to that. Call Phil McGuigan. Uh, 
Minister, given the identified need for changes outlined in both the RHI inquiry and the capacity for capability review, can I ask you maybe to outline steps that you are taking just to improve recruitment in the civil service? Well, the, the reports uh, asked for a, a review of recruitment, and that review is underway. I uh, have agreed the terms of reference for it, and an independent advisory panel of HR experts has been established to support the review. Officials are currently developing an overarching policy, uh, proposed policy framework that will set out the future approach to how the civil service recruits and selects to ensure it is staffed with people who have the necessary skills and expertise. And while that policy is still under development, it will aim to open up the civil service recruitment and expand its resourcing mix, that is, the routes into the civil service, something the previous uh, speaker had, had been asking around, uh, and through the increased use of apprenticeships, trainee schemes and employability interventions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, the apprenticeship scheme is extremely welcome, albeit um, it should be probably expanded. But we also need to uh, fill the management staff cliff edge um, that the civil service face. When will the Minister announce um, a timescale for an extended uh, resumption? of the graduate programme, uh, as the SDLP has called for in the Make Change programme paper that we released a few weeks back? Well, uh, timescales in terms of the policy framework uh, in relation to the elements that come out of the inquiries is uh, intended to be submitted to be in, in October for consideration, and thereafter there will be detailed formal consultation with the trade union side and other key stakeholders. Uh, and that, that's. Uh, obviously, a fundamental requirement in terms of undertaking significant uh, work uh, to change. Uh, of course, we, we do want to see uh, the, these uh, schemes developed. We do want to see opportunities for more lateral entry into the civil service. We do want to see a transformation within the civil service. We want to see the contribution of regional hubs bringing people who previously would not have applied uh, to civil service because of proximity issues. Uh, so there are a range of different measures uh, all underway in relation to that. Some of them, I'm sure, because I did have a discussion with some of your colleagues in relation to the, the, the proposals that you as a party developed and uh, I invited them to engage with the civil service team that are working on this to uh, see where your policy proposals uh, match with those. But there are a range of propositions that are already underway as a consequence of a need anyway for change, but also as a consequence of some of the RHI and Audit Office reports. I call Mark Bradley. Speaker, question four. The actual amount of rates payable by a business is a product of the assessed net annual value, NAV, of the property and the regional and district rate poundages. A 2019 review of business rates highlighted the general feeling in the business community that the rates burden on businesses were too high. In response, I, I reduced the regional rates business, uh, business rate by 18% in 2020, and I have held the reduced rate for the current year as well. Businesses located in town centres have also benefited from $108 million per year worth of rate relief through rates holidays, uh, which has seen many town centre businesses pay no rates at all for the last two years. This is in addition to the 5.8 million of small business rate relief uh, awarded to town centre businesses. I have asked LPS to carry out a revaluation of non-domestic properties. A new valuation list will come into effect on the 1st of April 2023, based on the property market in October this year. This will ensure that businesses are paying rates based on values which take account of the market changes because of the pandemic. And finally, I continue to urge councils to show restraint and setting their non-domestic rates poundage in order that we can limit the business rate increases going forward. Morris Bradley, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. He's actually probably answered my supplementary as well. But uh, I was to ask the Minister had he had any assessment of what the impact has been on the 12.5 uh, per cent reduction of the regional rate during 2021 or the four-month rates holiday of April, May and June and July 2020 or indeed the business support scheme. And if those measures turn out to have been a success, uh, does he envisage further help for our retail uh, sector in helping to regenerate town centres and keep business in business in town centres and not these out-of-town retail centres? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, the, the member's right. That, I mean, they, uh, I've I'm sure, like uh, other members, have been out and about engaging with business, and have taken the opportunity over the summer months to go out into different towns and engage with people who did benefit from rate support and rates reduction. Uh, and undoubtedly, it has, has, uh, the feedback I've been getting has kept a lot of businesses open 
Uh, we obviously wish to keep them in the open in the time ahead. A lot of the money that paid for that was COVID money that we got from Westminster last year, uh, and we have no guarantee of that level of funding, if any at all, in the time ahead. So I have asked the University of Ulster, who did the initial piece of assessment work in terms of which sectors most required intervention, uh, to do a further analysis of that to see if there's anything particularly we can do when this financial year ends and the, the, obviously the rates holidays that we introduce come to an end at that point. Well, public can the Minister tell us the value of rate support that has been provided to town centres this year? Well, the total value, I think, is over 100, uh, well, over 100 million pounds. Uh, I, I'm happy to give the member a breakdown town by town. He would be pleased to know that, that Derry got almost 10 million pounds of, of support, and I think Straban got nearly one and a half million pounds of support, uh, which is his own council area. Uh, but I'm happy to provide him with a, a full breakdown of each town. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, it's sort of been alluded to in the previous uh, answer, but business rates is by far the biggest uh, or, or, or one of the biggest uh, taxation levers that we have here uh, locally, the non-domestic rate. Um, but it's also because of the crisis hit by COVID, one of the most insecure. There's a fiscal commission looking at this at the minute, Minister. But what is your long-term vision of business rates? Because clearly it would seem to be unsustainable at the minute to have such a high burden of taxation on one area of small business and very little guarantee of it going forward into the longer term. Well, the member is correct in that uh, I think we get about 10 per cent of our intake in terms of, of uh, funding and finances available to the executive, which, as he, he will know, is used to support public services across a range of departments. So it's, it's a very significant uh, income for the executive. Of course, we want the burden of that to be uh, fairly distributed. Uh, and we had been hearing from businesses that they felt that the, the business rates were excessive. They have been reduced by 18 per cent. Uh, many people didn't, I suppose, get the full value of that because we also introduced a rates holiday uh, to cope with the pandemic. Uh, and we have kept that business rate down at 18 per cent. And we've been speaking to councils about the need to ensure that businesses can uh, recover from the pandemic. So in the longer term, I want to continue to review and engage with business organisations and businesses themselves. Uh, one of the other asks in relation to the non-domestic side was for uh, uh, more frequent revaluation exercises so you didn't get this significant jump in terms of the valuation over a longer period of time and, and, and the redistribution of that burden then having a more severe impact on some businesses than others. Uh, and so we've gone for a three-year revaluation exercise in the next, the next one, which is the, the shortest period of time between revaluation exercises that we've ever had. So it is about listening to businesses. It is about trying to work through a fair system uh, of rates, which takes account of the issues they raise. But of course, the, that uh, income for the executive is very important in terms of our public services generally. And given that we have faced uh, nine, ten years of austerity budgets, then we do need to rely on these things to supplement the income that the executive get. Well, Keith Buchanan. And thank you, Minister, so far for his answers. Minister, you obviously referred to rates, holidays, etc. And those rate bills are going to arrive back on businesses' mats, I presume, April time next year, May time. Is there anything that your department can do or LPS can do to ease that burden over and above what you currently do? You obviously can pay over a month and pay over a period of time. Is there anything else to relieve that shock which is going to hit those businesses? Well, they, they, as I said, they, 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 the ability of, uh, of the department to, to manage two years full rates holiday was due to the COVID money that we received and, and the, the real sense from business that the rates bill, as he will know, is one of the, the key burdens uh, that businesses have. And, and the feedback, as I said, from any of the business I've been speaking to is that that has been a lifeline for them. They recognise that the only guarantee was the end of this financial year coming. Uh, and beyond that, we don't and haven't have any indication of that uh, or any level of COVID uh, support that we previously got. We will continue to talk to Treasury about that. Uh, and that's why I have asked the University of Ulster again to look at a more specific target. And if it were possible, if the executive had the resources and the executive obviously agreed uh, to apply the resources at a more specific target to those sectors which were really struggling now. I think what we can all do is try and encourage uh, local people, as I know we're all doing with the, the voucher scheme that's coming out, is to shop local, to support our local businesses, to spend in our local high streets and our rural businesses as well, uh, to make sure that whatever spending power we have goes into supporting our local, our local businesses. Call Diane Dodds. 
Can I uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far? And he refers to the very considerable amount of support that was given to businesses during the rate, uh, uh, in terms of rates, um, and the, all of the other schemes that happened uh, with uh, the funding from COVID. Um, he also um, allocated 300 million for an economic recovery action package, which uh, has been adopted by the executive and is fully costed a uh, set of interventions for the economy. However, some sectors of our economy continue to be closed because of the restrictions that have been imposed by the executive. As furlough ends, what provision can we make for those businesses to support them should uh, the decision of the executive still be to continue to close those particular sectors? Well, uh, firstly, in relation to furlough, I have written to the Chancellor on a number of occasions, including recently, uh, to argue the case that they continue with the furlough scheme, even in a more targeted fashion, uh, because I do think that even as we emerge from the pandemic, thankfully, and we've been able to open up, uh, a lot of uh, businesses in a lot of areas, uh, the economic impact of that will still continue with us for, for a significant period to come. The executive haven't taken the decision to close businesses. What I, I think some of the restrictions mean is that some businesses consider whether it's viable for them to open or not, whether it's commercially viable for them to open. Uh, but they aren't uh, there. We're, we were able to pay out in terms of when uh, the member was in her department and, and, and my department was on the basis of regulations from the health department which said you have to close and that gave us the various to be able to pay uh, people support for business. That situation doesn't exist. But what I do hope is that we do get to the situation where restrictions can continue to be eased and that obviously depends very much on the virus and the transmission in the community and people following the device and behaving sensibly, uh, and people uh, ensuring that our health service isn't overwhelmed. Uh, and so I think we're progressively moving in that direction. I know we're facing a difficult time over the winter. And I know the health service is challenged. Uh, but I think if society as a whole can continue to cooperate with the advice that we've been given, then we will be out of this quicker and, and some of those businesses will be able to open up in a more commercially viable way. I call Mike Nesbitt. Question five, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, can Court, I'll answer question five and 13 together as they both refer to Peace Plus. The budget for Peace Plus has been confirmed at almost £1 billion sterling. SEUPB is finalising the programme document which requires approval from the Executive, the Irish Government, the North South Ministerial Council and the EU Commission. It is planned to seek, an executive, to seek Executive and North South Ministerial Council approval in October before submission to the EU Commission. This would allow the SEUPB to open the programme for calls in early 2022. The Minister publicly warned of a grave danger of losing the money if the DUP were to boycott the North-South Ministerial Council. My question to the Minister is how much EU funding was lost in the three years following Martin McGuinness's resignation as Deputy First Minister and the consequence, uh, consequent collapse of the North-South Ministerial Council? Well, the reality is it's probably none uh, because this is a new Peace Plus programme which requires approval to get running. The peace, uh, peace 4 was running over the course of the time, had all its approvals in place and was able to continue on as per approvals. So uh, I'm afraid the member's uh, question is misplaced. This is a new programme, it's Peace Plus. In order to get up and running over a seven year period, it requires its initial approval through the British government, the Irish government ourselves and the uh, North South Ministerial Council in order to go to the EU Commission for final sign off. Uh, and so that wasn't the case over that period. I'm sure he's relieved to know. There's a follow-on question there. The, uh, the DAP leader is uh, threatening uh, the stability of these institutions. And what, what would be the Minister's assessment of the DAP walking out of the executive here? What, what impact that would it have in terms of agreeing and allocating this funding, funding and getting it out into rural and, and indeed all community and voluntary organisations that, that badly need it? Well, firstly, I don't think we should be distracted by the behaviour of other parties uh, that much. We all have responsibility to get on with the work that we're elected here to do. Uh, but if the North South Ministerial Council was not able to meet in October, then it would not be able to approve the uh, SEUP proposition for a Peace Plus programme, which, as I've said, is just short of a billion pounds sterling, over one billion euros. Uh, and they Need, they allocate on a yearly basis to, to organisations saying which would apply for that funding. So 
that funding, that billion, almost billion pounds sterling, is allocated over seven years. Uh, if it's not spent year on year, then that funding is lost. So any delay to approving uh, the programme itself and allowing it to open for calls in early 2022 uh, would lose money on an annual basis then if it was not up and running. Uh, and so any interference in the north-south arrangements will have a very uh, detrimental impact on obviously border communities, rural communities, but also communities right across the north, working class communities uh, and others, community and voluntary sector groups. Uh, and very many capital programmes who uh, have applied in the past to peace uh, programmes but undoubtedly will be applying to this, which is a very significant programme which not only incorporates peace but also in the previous interreg programmes as well is incorporated in Peace Plus. So undoubtedly a lot of groups are waiting on this uh, as the funding from peace, uh, previous peace programmes starts to run out uh, and any delay to implementation of this will undoubtedly have a negative effect on Two minutes left. I call Dinah McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answers to this question uh, so far. Minister, Peace Plus funds are vital for people in cross-border communities. I know that too well as a representative of a border constituency. Uh, one of the major issues in border areas is the closure of banks, and Brexit has contributed to complexities of cross-border banking. What has your department done to protect the cross-border banking sector from the damage caused by Brexit? Thank you. Well, the member would know that we don't have a regulatory function for banks. Unfortunately, that resides in London. Uh, but I have met with the banks and, and bank leaders on a number of occasions. Uh, I have pressed them uh, not to be in the business of closing branches uh, in, in small rural towns, which uh, I think would have a very detrimental effect, regardless of the fact that banking practices have changed for people. Uh, undoubtedly, the loss of, of banks on, on small high streets does have a very negative impact. I have asked them to hold back on those decisions until the very least we emerge from the pandemic and have some assessment of the economic damage and what economic recovery can take place. Uh, unfortunately, some banks have pressed ahead with those decisions, and we will continue to press them uh, on that uh, and, and to urge that they, they, they hold back in terms of uh, negative decisions in relation to the number of branches uh, across Ireland. A new procurement policy note on scoring social value was published in July following endorsement by the executive. In support of this policy, training on bidding for, pro for government contracts will be rolled out to voluntary and community groups. In addition, I plan to bring a new policy on the procurement of social and community type services to the executive. This policy will ensure that when commissioning social and community services, departments must engage with communities and service providers to establish whether grant funding is a more appropriate mechanism. If procurement is the appropriate route, departments will be required to remove unfair barriers for community and voluntary groups. This policy note provides guidance on reserving contracts for the voluntary community sector and highlights the provisions within the existing procurement legislation to create markets solely for third sector bodies. Currently, there are only two local examples of contracts being reserved in this manner, and this needs to change. And that ends the period for a list of questions. Unfortunately for Mr McHugh, we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And topical questions 1, 6 and 7 have been withdrawn, and I move now to call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, during uh, the, the height of the pandemic, the business intervention grants were hugely welcome and have helped a lot of businesses through very difficult and challenging times. However, uh, there was money overpaid. How much money was overpaid? How much was paid in er error? How much was claimed fraudulently, Minister, uh, uh, during that period? Well, I, I, in terms of all those figures, I would need to come back to the member. I don't have them readily available to me. I, I know that the margin of error or fraud was, was relatively small, given as he uh, would understand the schemes were delivered on a very quick uh, basis, which wouldn't have been in the norm uh, for the particular schemes which, which give out money. Uh, there was a, a relatively low level uh, of either error or fraud, uh, and, and certainly a very significant level on follow-up ALPS to make sure where error occurred, uh, that that was corrected, uh, both in terms of people not receiving what they should have, but also in terms of people who received perhaps what they shouldn't have. Uh, the, the rules and regulations of that scheme changed so many times, uh, and at, at one stage I think there were probably 16 different iterations of it had come through, so it was a, a challenging scheme to manage. Uh, nonetheless, as he will know, uh, and I certainly know from visiting uh, a lot of businesses in a lot of towns over the summer, uh, the interventions were very much welcome, and they very much kept businesses alive uh, when the consequences would have been uh, very bleak otherwise. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the, the Minister in terms of the importance of the intervention. However, Minister, there were uh, monies, public monies paid wrongfully or claimed uh, in error or wrongfully. What is your department doing to ensure that that public money uh, is clawed back uh, to, to the centre? Thank you. Yes, what the LPS are doing is uh, where we have discovered that money was paid in error or indeed claimed fraudulently to pursue that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, certainly a significant amount of that has been returned, uh, and, and where people were overpaid in certain circumstances but were due a different type of grant, uh, then had they not got LRSS, we have managed to then have an arrangement with other departments to take it out of that rather than take the money back off that business but actually remove it from the, the grant they should have had or, and maybe uh, either re uh, recover the difference or in some cases uh, the difference was, was in the benefit of the business itself. So there has been a, a very proactive programme to try and retrieve any monies which were paid out either fraudulently or uh, in error. Call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, sir, New Decade New Approach contains a commitment within it to a review of arm's length bodies with a view to rationalisation, is the words used in the agreement. Can I ask the Minister for an update on where that process is at? Well, that, uh, we did begin a, a, a programme of work within the department. We produced a paper for the executive in which we did a, if you like, a desktop analysis of all of the arm's length bodies and where we felt uh, there should be, uh, and I agree entirely, it, it, it wasn't just an exercise in terms of review, it's review with a view to rationalisation. That means action will be taking place in relation to these. Many of the arms length bodies are a product of direct rule uh, administration, which, which they were created to try and create some veneer of local democratic input, uh, but are no longer fit for purpose. There is no very little standardisation between them, so a whole range of different functions, different arrangements in terms of their relationship with departments, different management arrangements, some are remunerated, some aren't. Uh, so to try and make sense of all of that and to provide a programme then for departments to say, you know, you really need to start proactively looking at these ones which are a responsibility. We will create a piece of legislation which may not be done in time uh, for this mandate, but uh, we, we hope that it will, uh, depending on what time we've left, and maybe the member could advise us on that, but uh, we will create a piece of legislation which will give departments the tools they need to do their own review and, and, and as, as we say, a programme of rationalisation in relation to these. And I think we will produce a report annually so that committees can hold their individual departments to account to say, justify the existence of this. Uh, should it be brought back in? Should it be done away with altogether? Or should it be left as is? Or should it be reviewed to have its own functions in, in some way uh, looked at again? Uh, so there are a range of approaches to them, but what we want to do is get on and get that work done as quickly as possible and to give departments the necessary legislative framework to be able to undertake that piece of work. Christopher Stalford, supplementary. Thank you, and I welcome very much the Minister's response because I think this is an area of work that has just been left for far too long. Uh, if I could press the Minister a little further in terms of a time frame, in terms of putting those legislative provisions in place, um, in an ideal world, independent of other political considerations, does the Minister have a time frame in mind in terms of bringing this process forward to a conclusion? Well, as I said, I want to see the legislation done in this mandate, and if it's possible to do that, we will. I, I've been doing meetings in recent days and uh, weeks with department officials in relation to this about progress in this matter as quickly as we can. Uh, what that will do is, is give, if you like, the basis legislation for departments to go off and do their own more in-depth review. We have done a desktop exercise uh, to draw attention to the departments of the a number of, of arms and bodies that there are, the, 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 in our view, uh, what we think should happen to them, but I mean, it's obviously up to the department themselves. But if we give them the necessary framework to be able to do that, I would suspect it will be in the new mandate before departments start to conduct reviews. And whether they will do that on, on a kind of rolling basis and take some of maybe the more obvious ones uh, and consider those first. But I think one of the benefits will be an annual report, which means this assembly and the uh, committees within it can monitor each department's activity in this, in this regard. And call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister of Finance for an update on the Northern Ireland Civil Service domestic abuse workplace policy? Well, I know I think I've written to the member in recent times uh, in relation to this. I, I think, uh, if not, I've written to someone, someone in very recent times, but I think it was herself. And there are a number of workplace policies uh, that are being un uh, undertaken in reviews uh, by next HR, uh, uh, and this would be one of them. So I'm very happy to write to her with the full detail of the review where it's at uh, currently and, and when we hope to conclude that. 
Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And can I ask if the Minister agrees with me that victims and survivors of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland should be entitled to safely for, them, for their job, should they need to avail of it? Yes, I think we have to be uh, as sensitive as we can to people's individual circumstances. And I know there is a discussion. Uh, that's one of the key focuses as to uh, what time people are entitled to in order to, to deal with issues of domestic abuse and to, uh, in order to uh, readjust their lives if that is necessary, including uh, sometimes accommodation and other issues. So I do think that uh, policies need to be continuously under review to make sure that we have the most appropriate and sensitive and supportive policies of civil service staff in the time ahead. And I hope that that, that that, that certainly would be my intention in terms of any review and that that would be the outcome. But I am very happy to correspond with her and if she uh, thinks that there are issues in it that perhaps aren't addressed sufficiently, then I am happy to hear from her. Call Colm Gilderney. I can call you. And Minister, I know you have touched upon the issue of RHA um, in, in, in your earlier questions, but could you give us an update on where that uh, process is at present? Well, the RHI subcommittee met uh, on a number of occasions following the publication of the report, agreed uh, recommendations arising from the report, and I have been seeking to get uh, the executive to table uh, and uh, approve a report in response to the RHI inquiry. I have not been able to secure that, uh, despite submitting a paper on a number of occasions. Uh, and, and I hope to secure that in the near future because I think that uh, it is long beyond time and the executive had a formal response to the RHI inquiry. Supplementary, Colm Gildernut. And Minister, would you agree with me that improving recruitment to the civil service is crucial in addressing the deficiencies highlighted by RHI? And can you outline the ongo ongoing work in relation to recruitment to the civil service? Yes, I, I do. It, but I mean, civil service issues were one part of that. There were a whole range of, of things, and we have improved things like the codes for ministers, the codes for spads. Uh, some of that work has already been done and brought forward through the assembly as well. Uh, but there are a range of measures, uh, some of which flow from the RHI report and the audit office report as well into recruitment. Uh, and we have undertaken reviews of all of that policy, initiated some new measures, and we will continue to do that because I think uh, it was very obvious that. Uh, we needed transformation within the civil service anyway, but I think the RHI inquiry uh, brought some acute attention onto some specific areas of, of uh, skills uh, and uh, competencies uh, that were necessary within particular functions within the civil service. So we need to have a more agile civil service that can recruit uh, the necessary people in to do specific tasks at specific times. The following two questions have been withdrawn. I call Nicola Brogan. I got a call up. Um, will the Minister recommend that the budget gives priority to health so that their transformation can be delivered and that waiting lists can be reduced? Yes, uh, I think uh, that is the case. The executive, as I have said, uh, has, has al always had a priority in relation to health and agreed. Uh, I think when we first came back in 2020 that in order to try and take the politics out of health that we would have a whole executive approach to supporting the requirements of the health service. And in the time since, uh, obviously, that has come into even more sharp relief because of the pandemic experience. So we are now in a situation where uh, we had wanted multi-annual budgets to allow us to properly, uh, having done the reports, the Bengoa and other reports, uh, to actually then allocate the resources to uh, create transformation and tackle issues like waiting lists uh, and other problems within the health service. So it is now time, as we're setting those budgets over the next three years, to to try and prioritise and to match those priorities with the resources necessary. We hope for a better outcome in the end of the spent review. We may not get that, and that's why I've asked departments to look and the executive to look at how we would support the prioritisation of health, the health service and, and health spending generally uh, in, the, in the circumstances where the budget outcome wasn't as good as we hoped. That means uh, perhaps uh, asking other departments to, to offer support uh, in terms of health provision, uh, in, in terms of the finances they would have received. Uh, and I know some ministers have indicated a willingness to do that, but that may well be one of the options that the executive have to look at over the next couple of weeks. Dr. Nicola Brogan. I can call and thank the minister for his answer there. Just following on from that, then, um, can the minister give an update on the introduction of multi -annual, the multi-annual budget process? Yes, I have written. We spent the summer, uh, my own department, engaging with other departments in terms of planning and prioritisation for multi-annual budget. Uh, I have written to uh, the, my executive colleagues and spoke to this at the executive meeting on Thursday. 
uh, in relation to a planning session that we want to bring forward uh, next week, uh, in which we uh, we focus entirely on this uh, budget process. And in, in some ways, uh, it can. The fact is that this is the budget for the next mandate. Uh, actually can have a liberating effect on people because they can take off their departmental hat uh, because they will be planning a budget for a department they may not be minister for uh, beyond an election. Uh, so I think we can have a more holistic executive conversation around all of this, agree the priorities. Uh, as I say, my view is that our priority remains health uh, and that will take a very substantial underpinning with resources and that we agree those priorities and we agree how we're going to match them uh, and, uh, and ahead of the announcement at the end of October in terms of the outcome of the review. I call Patrick Delarge. Call Dan Dodds. Yes, can I thank the Minister uh, for his answers so far, particularly around the issues of how we build a more agile civil service and how we build a workforce for the future, responding to all the challenges we have. And I know that this is a huge project um, that has to be undertaken. Can the Minister tell us how uh, he is engaged uh, with the unions um, over uh, the return of civil servants um, to the, the workplace or in, in office working. Um, and we are also, just to record, immensely grateful for all of the work that has been done in keeping us safe and in producing all the question, schemes please. that they did over the COVID pandemic. Well, I, I agree with the members' uh, closing remarks in relation to the, the work that has been done. Uh, the, we are planning a return uh, as we sensibly should do, because at some stage we will get that message uh, from health in, in terms of a safe return to work, and so we need to be ready for that. I think work is going to change, not just in the civil service, but change right across all uh, large-scale employers, uh, and we will, we will be planning for a more hybrid uh, type model, a blended model as it's called, where people will be working sometimes uh, at their desk and other times uh, working from a remote location. Uh, and so I think we have to plan that. Obviously, business area by business area, it depends on the nature of the job each civil servant is doing as to whether they're required in an office or whether that flexibility is built in. So I think we're going to see a very different system. And of course, uh, that's an ongoing discussion with the unions to make sure that people uh, are uh, aware of what those arrangements will be, that workers are aware of their rights within those arrangements, and that we get the best possible outcome in terms of new way of work. And time is up. Um, members, please take a raise for a moment or two before we move on to the next item. Order, Mr. Chambers. Speaker, uh, could I apologise to you in the House? Uh, I was not in my place for a topical question uh, during First Minister and Deputy First Minister's uh, question time. Apologise. I thank the member for that. Thank you. Members, please take a raise for a moment.
Okay, members will now resume um, debate on the betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendment bill, and I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, for calling me to talk to this bill. And again, I suppose I apologise straight off to the members uh, in the chamber, uh, as I have only come on to the Communities Committee of late. I have only attended one meeting, so it may be the case that the committee members, who are much more learned on this subject than I am, will go into far greater detail than I could. Uh, um, but what I bring, I suppose, is life experiences and constituency work to this very major issue. And I suppose when I read the bill and relate on some of those life experiences, the first thing that disappoints me about this bill is that I see none of the essence of gambling within this bill. I think it fails in so many ways. And I suppose what I mean by that is that when we look at any piece of legislation, we really need to produce the best possible piece of legislation possible. Now, a bill will come out of a department, any department, come out, a bill will come out, it will get its airing in this place, in this house, and then if it passes, it goes to the committee. And I fear that what the department have done on this occasion is left all the heavy lifting for the committee. And the minister in her, in her opening speech talked about the problem that we face here in Northern Ireland, but then goes on to say that she is not the one to fix it, that it will be for someone else in another time in the next place. And in a time when our people needs an error of decisionism, we ain't getting it in this House, by this minister, by this department, or by this bill. And that grieves me, because I want to see the best legislation possible produced from this House, and we ain't getting it. And when I talk about the essence of gambling, we can all tell stories about loved ones, about friends who are caught up in gambling. Many people gamble socially. And if you were to walk into any betting shop in the high street, you will see punters, people, who go there certainly to bet, but almost definitely to socialise. And they could be there all day. And they'd be kidnapping out of other premises too, uh, trying to catch a certain race or a certain sporting activity. And for those people, it's a way of life. And for many people, they manage that. And they manage it quite well, to be fair. But there are so many, so many people who fall foul of gambling, who fall into gambling addiction, who start digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and it destroys them. It destroys them, and it destroys their lives. It destroys their families' lives. It destroys their livelihoods. And it can destroy their health. And that's what we need to legislate for. So it's just simply welcoming legislation, legislation on betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendments bill just won't cut it. It just won't cut it. And if it's bad law, it just will not cut it. It needs to be different. Some of my experiences, people have alluded to the 1980s, the 85, the last piece of legislation that governs us here with regards to gambling. And I can remember having joined high school in 86 to 91. So the late 80s, I would have been running about with friends who would have most definitely been addicted to what we would have called those, in those days fruit machines. And it wasn't about money. It's what it led to. So these young guys around my same age, my friendship group, many of them addicted to fruit machines would have been playing fruit machines called Light and Nudge and Copper Win. So you can imagine you're talking about a 2p or 5p deposit to play the game. But what happened there was with, with, with any little money they had, it could have been a pound, it could have been a fiver, it could have been a tenner. It wouldn't have been much more than that. They would have been given that money by their mother or father. And the addiction caught hold that much 
that they would have ended up missing school to go to their local arcade. And then, when they realized at the end of a Saturday or end of a school day or end of a day that they had no money left and nothing to show for it, there was another industry created. There was an industry created whereby a punter in the shop, in the arcade, would have headed up the high street and stole five pounds worth of goods, ten pounds worth of goods, at a discounted price to give that person who had lost their money so that when they went home to their parents, they could show what they'd bought for their £10 or £5 that day. Will the member get away? Yes, I will. Yeah. I listen carefully to what the member has said in terms of that example. But would, the minister, or would the member also agree where some of these places are unscrupulous in their practice as well? Indeed, I've witnessed in my own occasion once been in one down the north coast where the punters, as you describe them, are sitting there playing two machines. And the owners are that excited by their attendance that they're bringing them sandwiches so they won't leave the machines. And I think that shows how unscrupulous some of these people are in terms of preying on the vulnerable when they see this weakness. And you described the two P machines or the, the, the copper machines. But we all know that those copper machines le leads on to the bigger stuff. So would the member agree that many of these people are unscrupulous in the practice as well? Yeah, I certainly will. But, but let me make it clear that when I talked about the punters, I talked about an ordinary person who was in there also gaming or, or playing fruit machines, who then would have went up the street and seen it as another industry, a further industry, to gain a wee bit of money in order to feed the machines again. But they would have taken part in criminal activity, stealing stuff and produce from other shops, which has an impact then on the high street and on that person once they are caught. And that can lead to all sorts of ramifications further down the line, much more than just the gambling aspect. But I, I get the point the member makes, and there are some unscrupulous people there. The very fact that a school, uh, a school pupil can attend during school time, I can remember it being put to me at a time whenever all of those young people should have been pushed out of an arcade. This is in the, early, this is in the late 80s, early 90s. That, well, surely they couldn't be of school age if they're here during school. And that was the naivety, maybe not naivety, of some of the people who would have been working or running some of these arcades. So there is a massive issue here. And does this bill tackle it? We also know that it's the, it's the excitement around gambling and around sport that can really attract people and trap people. I'm a Spurs supporter, so I'm in a very vulnerable, fragile position today. But before the match started yesterday, the North London Derby, no least, there was odds came up on the TV. Tottenham to win 2-1. A whopping 14-1 odd. Now, if anybody can work out the odds there, you put £10 on that, 14-1, you get zero. Because Spurs get beat. <laughs> Spurs get beat, they get annihilated. I'll be honest, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's the, it's the presence of that advertising, that micro-targeting, that is doing incredible damage. If you have someone with a tendency to be addicted to gambling, and they love their sport, and their blood is up, and no matter what team they support, they'll be watching that match. And it doesn't have to be Tottenham to win. It can be Man United to win. It could be their favourite horse to win. It could be their rugby team to win. And if you're of that way inclined, addicted to gambling, you will take that bet. And you will take it again, and you will take it in-game. You will bet in corners, you will bet in throw-ins. You, you will bet in next score, first score, last score. And these companies prey on fans, sports fans, and people who are addicted to gambling. And I believe there should be a mass movement the same way I think it was in the 80s with regards to tobacco advertising. I believe advertising up and in front of, during and the end of games should be looked at. I believe that that should be looked at with regards to government. But that's the wider... That's, I've given you experiences there, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the low end, where it doesn't take much money to get you into trouble, and also the high end, where people have lost hundreds and thousands on gambling 
And so when I look at this bill, I see it as a failed, a failed opportunity. The minister says that there was time pressure. There's time pressure. We're coming to an end of a mandate. Of course there is. But there are still departments in this place. In the exact Yes, I will, yeah. Way. And I wholeheartedly agree with his sentiments in terms of um, broadcasting and how that should be regulated. And uh, much has been, been made of the document that our shelves put together, and that was one of the proposals in terms of the watershed and should advertisers be allowed to um, advertise within the watershed. But and while I said I agree with the, the member's uh, sentiments, surely the member knows that that's not within the remit of this assembly or this um, minister to actually influence uh, the, the rights around broadcasting. That's something that, that rests with Westminster. Yeah, that, but, uh, but I do think. The Department and the Minister here in this House should push the parameters as much as we can to make sure that we have effective law and legislation, but also to ensure that we can make a difference to the wider UK uh, psyche with regards to gambling. But I, I do take the, the Member's uh, point on board. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a massive issue, and for the Minister to say there's not enough time, so I'm going to produce a bill that's suboptimal. That, that, that she wished she could have done more with, but she can't. It just doesn't cut it for me. There are departments in this place, in the executive, who are producing top quality bills at this time. It could always be improved. But I see nothing in this bill other than deregulation at a time when we need, really need to be tightening things up. There are good things in this bill, but there are so many things that's not in this bill, which I believe we need to see. And I believe the heavy lifting will be done in the committee, and I look forward to the work that we do on that. Just some of the issues within it, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Again, we could talk about all the things that's not in the bill, and I will address some of them. But straight away, we have what I believe to be a token gesture with regards to Sunday trading and Sunday opening. And again, people will know my views. Okay, I'm a Christian. But it's even much more than that, because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're giving people with issues and problems more time. You're extending the danger period for those people who are susceptible. And whilst I get the argument about a lot of people do this on the phone now, or on a computer, or even by telephone, the fact that we're just opening up more opportunity to gamble just doesn't sit right with me. And also then the issue about employees. Now, most people who work in a bookies enjoy that Sunday off. That maybe is the only common free time they have with their families. And again, if this goes through in this guise, the chances are that that will be gone for those people. And again, some people make light of this. They will. Some people don't care about the Sunday opening issue. I do. And it's not just on religious grounds. It's about family. And it's about the dangers of gambling. And I would ask members to see that and accept that and see what we can do with regards to these clauses. The issue then, Mr Deputy Speaker, goes on. And, and there is one issue that I would like the Minister to address. And that is... There was an issue brought to my constituency office a number of, well, probably a year ago now, with regards to a scenario that developed whereby a local financial institution, a bank, building society, that offered a cash award or, or, or prizes by simply being a member or a branch member of a bank uh, or building society. And that person quickly realised that they, weren't, they didn't qualify for this prize incentive. Uh, it must have been like a lottery that was pulled every month. But because he was a Northern Ireland customer, he was excluded. And I hope the Minister can address I did write to correspond with the Minister on this, and she did say that she would be bringing forward legislation. So I hope it's contained within this, and I hope that the Minister can point me to the, to the, the, the clause that actually will remedy that for Northern Ireland customers of all the banking financial uh, organisations, so that they can avail of everything that someone from... Manchester or Bristol can avail off with regards to being a customer in that certain uh, specific and particular bank. Something that troubles me also is the fact that I'm sure everyone here will say that the statutory levy will be a good thing. And so it will. 
But how many times, Mr. Deputy Speaker, do we throw money at bad? What is the point of raising money, even if it's from the industry itself, and using it and throwing it away because we haven't fixed the essence of the problem? We haven't fixed the problem, and we're just throwing money at it. Now, I'm not making light of the fact that we need more money to tackle these things, but I just think it's a very big false economy. If we're going to pull money from the industry, I think that they've got that's, that's their moral responsibility over, and then having to fund institutions and support groups and everything else that comes with it, education even, and there's nothing changes with regards to the problem. We need to fix the problem. And I see nothing in this bill that fixes the problem. And I hope I'm wrong. And I hope by the time we get to the end of this process with regards to this bill, there will be fix, fixes within this bill. I just don't see it yet. So whilst the statutory level there is a good thing, it would be pointless just to throw money at bad. And we do it so many times in this House. We, we can throw more money at health. But unless we fix the health service, some of that money will not be well spent. That's just a primitive state of fact. The, the issues also around the code of conduct. Uh, so a code of conduct is nothing unless it's enforceable. We really need a code of conduct that has teeth because these industry drivers are very powerful. They're very rich. They make a big profit. And I just don't see a code of conduct that says that the aim of the conduct, code of conduct is to ensure that gambling here is conducted in a fair and open way. I'll let you know a wee secret. There's nothing fair about gambling. The bookies set the odds. There's nothing fair about that. The bookies get their cut. There's no odd that a bookie will give you that's fair. They might do something to promote something. But gambling is stacked against the punter. That's the way it has always been. That's the way it has always, always will be. So they have a code, code of conduct that says gambling here is conducted in a fair and open way. That's just a misnomer. It just doesn't make sense. That's not what gambling essence is. The bookies will always get their slice. They will always have their cut. It's the punter that loses. Punter wins sometimes. Sometimes they win big but then they lose more, and more often. So there is no fair way of gambling. There really isn't. There really isn't. And what is the point of having a code of conduct? Even if it says you have to gamble in a fair way, if it has no teeth, if these big powerful beasts will ignore it. Also, the fact that the Minister is proposing within this bill to bring, it, bring in regulations next time next time. Are we not kicking cans down the road even more? Are we not leaving it to someone else to bring, maybe, may I think the word is, the department may make regulations for or in connection with requiring every person who intends to make an application to which this article applies to play a levy to the department. There's nothing solid in this. There's nothing. When we need an error of decisionism, where is it? There's no decision that's been taken here. We're passing the can down the road. It's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. We have time. We have time to bring in a piece of legislation that's fit for purpose. It doesn't have to be all-encompassing. But let's get the things that's in this bill and that's going to be put in this bill right. Why? Why? I think the member opposite talked about the time. Now, we were down for three years down for three years. We shouldn't have been down for three years, but we were. What was the department doing? What was the department doing in that time? Because this has been a problem in Northern Ireland for years. Gambling addiction and abuse has been a problem in Northern Ireland for years. It's a bigger problem in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the UK. Why are we coming late to the game? It's not an excuse. Whilst it's 
criminal that we've been down for three years. It cannot be used by any department as an excuse to bring forward per legislation. It's just not going to cut it in this place. And there's so much we can add into this. It was mentioned earlier, credit cards. There is no way that anyone with a gambling addiction should be allowed to gamble with a credit card. It's not their money. It really isn't. But as soon as they put that into that machine, it becomes their money. It becomes their problem. And it not only becomes their problem, it becomes their partner's problem, which then means it becomes their children's problem, because they do without. Such an easy clause, I'm sure, to add into a bill. Why do we not see it? Why is it not here? Think of the think about when the blood's up, when someone's susceptible to an addiction of gambling. That little piece of plastic. We're all doing a bit of shouting at the minute with regards to a bit of card that has hundred pounds on it that you can spend in the high street. I bet you there's many partners in this world, in, this, in our towns and cities and, and villages, that wish their credit card would only spend £100. Credit card can rank up all sorts of untold horrors and debt, which perpetrates through every single family member. But yet we ain't tackling it here. We ain't helping those people. Do you think that allowing people to spend and max out a credit card on a machine, on a gambling machine, is helping them? No. It's helping them dig a hole deeper, a hole of despair deeper. But yet we don't seem to tackle it. It's not here. It's mute. It's not present. It's, we can't see it. But yet so many members have brought it up today. The fact that we have fixed all betting is still a massive issue. It's been a massive issue everywhere. Everywhere's talking about it. The only place it's not talked about is in this bill. In this bill. It's silent. It's mute. It's non-existent. We are ignoring the problem of gambling and addiction to gambling when we've missed so much in this bill. There is no excuse for that. You can't blame time. You can't blame the three years. When, we, when the departments were in place, the minister wasn't. You can't blame that. There are so much could have been added to this bill that's not. And it's inexcusable. It is inexcusable. The heavy lifting will have to come at the committee. And that's a shame. That's a shame. There are so much more that could have been done here. There are good things. But even the good things in this bill are either diluted or weak. That's the shame. So we will have to knuckle down. And I hope the department steps up when the committee comes knocking on their door. And I hope the minister steps up when the committee comes knocking on their door. Because this bill ain't right. It needs fixed. And I'm certainly prepared to vote on it today to get it into the committee to see what we can do. But it's not good. It's not good. And I just don't understand why. Because the member opposite also raised the issue about Sinn Féin Northern Ireland and Sinn Féin Republic of Ireland. And they'll cry and they'll bleat about how the government there isn't doing enough. Yet they have it in their hands here. They have it in their hands to fix it or to, to help fix it. But they've missed the opportunity. Why? Why have they missed the opportunity? We see the blue, blue pages in front of us. Why? When we know this is such a fundamental issue, when we know there's a massive problem with addiction gambling in Northern Ireland, greater, greater than any other part of the United Kingdom, we have a bill that's 10 pages long that pushes regulations on the next minister, on the next place, on the next elected assembly, simply not good enough.
There are so much more I could say, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I will reserve it to the committee. I will support this bill going through the second stage, but I am disappointed because we have lost such an opportunity. Thank you. I, like others, welcome the opportunity to debate this really important piece of legislation here today. Um, and while I'm no longer a member of the Communities Committee, this is one of the pieces of legislation that I had been um, greatly anticipating. Um, it's one of many pieces of legislation, many necessary and progressive pieces of legislation that this Minister is bringing through. Um, that is designed to not only help vulnerable people, but also to uh, modernise many of our outdated pieces of legislation. So I want to wish um, a more to my former colleagues on the Communities Committee and uh, good luck to the Minister also um, in the time ahead with their, their workload. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in 2018-2019, uh, um, I, along with Sinn Féin colleagues in the Oireachtas, undertook to put together Sinn Féin's All-Ireland um, Problem Gambling document. Um, and the document has been referenced quite a bit today um, by other parties. And I would have been really interested to read other parties' proposals um, on the issue of problem gambling. But alas, Sinn Féin were the only party to put together such a document. I, I want to stress that I recognise that most people it's a fact. I want to stress that I recognise that most people enjoy the activity of gambling um, and can do so responsibly. Um, however, I and my party colleagues also recognise the alarming rise uh, in the issue of problem gambling across Ireland. And through our research at that time, we discovered that here in the north, we have the highest rate of problem gambling uh, in comparison to that of England, Scotland or Wales. We have four times the amount um, of problem gamblers that England has. So it was clear, and it is clear, that problem gambling is a serious public health issue. Yet there are no dedicated inpatient addiction services specifically for um, problem gambling. Uh, and that's not to say that places like the Dunluwe Centre and Kewamura and Davina's Ark uh, in Newry aren't doing great work um, on gambling and addiction services more broad broadly, because of course they absolutely are but I think we do need more gambling-specific uh, addiction services in place for citizens here in the north. And I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone at Davina's Ark um, in Uri who allowed me to come into their premises, to chat to staff um, and to chat to their service uh, users um, and give me the opportunity to discuss the proposals that we were putting forward um, and to see how they measured up against their own um, experiences uh, in Davina's Ark. And the trauma that ensues when someone in your family has a gambling addiction is really far-reaching because it not only affects the person living with the addiction, but the wider family. It affects them mentally, emotionally, and of course, financially. And that is why we need properly funded gambling-specific addiction services here that can not only treat the person um, themselves, but can, can uh, treat those that are uh, close to them. Go ahead. Yep. And the member has quite rightly, as has many members, um, testified to the fact that Northern Ireland has higher rates of, of gambling than anywhere on this island or indeed across the UK. And there's a, a focus in, there in the intervention piece which is really needed. Would the member agree with me also that we need to get upstream with young people in our schools and through the education uh, sector perhaps to ensure that we ad address it ahead of time and try and prevent as many people as possible from falling into the dangers of gambling addiction? Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, there's so many other areas um, that we deal with in this chamber that I think if, we, uh, if there were specific focus put on those in our educational facilities and schools, um, it would save us a lot of time, a lot of hassle and a lot of money further down the line. So yes, I absolutely agree with the, the member's sentiment. Um, but that is why I'm glad to see that the Minister is proposing a levy on the industry. Um, so why we need to ensure that there are mechanisms in place to allow people to enjoy gambling in a safe way. There is also a responsibility to protect vulnerable people. And the introdu introduction of mandatory codes of practice and a statutory levy to help pay for research and education um, and, tra uh, and treatment um, in the way in which the Minister has outlined, I think would be a huge way to go in achieving this. Um, as many members have said, our gambling legislation is complex, it's outdated, and it does require urgent reform. Um, and I think the member opposite asked what the, what the department were doing when this place was down um, recently. Um, but what they were doing was taking, uh, bringing forward the consultation piece. And I responded on behalf of Sinn Féin to that gambling uh, legislation consultation um, that the department launched in 2019. 
And some of the key asks that we included in our consultation response um, were from our All Island Problem Gambling document. Um, and some of those were the introduction of modern legislation on gambling, which takes account and accommodates for faster responses um, to future technological advances, um, in order that we can give comprehensive, comprehensive coverage to gaming, gambling and betting, whether that's land-based or online. We would also like to see the establishment of an independent gambling regulator whose functions would include administering a problem gambling fund in order to help minimise problem gambling, um, and this would be financed by a mandatory levy on the industry. We would also like to see the introduction of age requirement uh, verification which would precede gambling online. Um, and I think the extension of an electoral uh, database checking facility to enable this in a speedier way should be explored. And just to give members, um, just to put that into context, what I'm talking about there, currently um, a 14, 15, 16 year old can take their parents' credit card, they can go online, they can sign up for one of these betting um, companies online, and they can gamble away for 72 hours before anybody checks that they are the person they say they are. Now, a 14, 15 or 16 year old couldn't go into a bar and couldn't drink for three days before the barman would ask for ID. So that is something that's totally wrong and something that needs to change. Uh, participation in multi-operator self-exclusion schemes designed and overseen by the gambling regulator should be a licensing condition for anyone operating in the Irish market, uh, whether a shop, um, a track or online. Now, we understand from the Minister's comments that this um, piece of legislation has been done in a two-phased approach, um, and that is due to the constraints of time left in this mandate and the impact of bringing forward other pieces of legislation. And my former colleagues um, on the committee and, and other members today have made hay out of, out of this fact um, that it is a phase one and that, that it doesn't go far enough. And of course it doesn't go far enough because that's why it's phase one. Um, and we know the Minister has said there will be a phase two. And much has also been made of the time pressure that the committee is under with other pieces of legislation. And I know this as a former committee member, but I also know that my former colleagues on the committee member know and they appreciate um, that to completely overhaul the old legislation and intro introduce a completely new regulatory framework would take no less than 360 new clauses. So now if you're telling me that my former colleagues on the Communities Committee really believe that they could scrutinise 360 new clauses before next May, then good luck to them, um, because that is definitely not the same cautious Communities Committee bemoaning the volume of, uh, of, of the workload that they have um, that I just left a, a number of weeks ago. Oh, well, go ahead. The, the member for giving away, and as a member of the Communities Committee, I don't know if bemoaning is the right word to, to use, that we... Uh, or that we use uh, to describe the volume of work that the committee gets. I made, as of other uh, members of the committee, in the debate this morning, the importance of getting legislation right. And in that vein, we'll take whatever comes our way and we'll do whatever we have to do with it. I appreciate that. And if, if the member thinks that they can get 360 new, new clauses right between now and next May, then you know, who am I to, to tell them otherwise? Um, Many of the recommendations that I outlined that I, I said we included in our, in our policy document, uh, document I know will not be included in this phase, but I am very hopeful um, that in the next phase that uh, some of these will be considered. The, the Minister has also touched on um, lotteries, and we know that that is a huge issue for local charities, for GA clubs, soccer clubs, uh, for rugby clubs societies and the community and voluntary sector um, and their ability or rather their inability to, to revenue raise. Um, so we, we only need to look to the, the last year and the, the huge um, impact that these groups and these clubs made um, in terms of their response to the pandemic um, and we need to acknowledge that and we need to make it easier for those groups, those societies and those clubs uh, to revenue raise because we know that is, that is their main source of income. So Mr Deputy Speaker, we need to see this legislation progress. We need to see it progress at pace for all the reasons that I've outlined and for all the reasons that all the other members um, in the chamber have outlined today. And this is not the first, this is, this is just the first phase. This is not the final product. Um, so I would urge my former colleagues in the committee and I would urge other members of this house to work with the minister on this rather than against her and ensure that we do all we can to protect those dealing with a gambling problem and to stop the risk of others falling into gambling addiction in the future. Gurra Muggett. I call Stephen Dunn.
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I also welcome the opportunity to speak on this second stage of the betting, gaming, lotteries and amusement amendment bill here this afternoon, uh, the, the, which is indeed the first significant change to gambling laws since 1985. Over the last 36 years, there has been considerable change to life in Northern Ireland, and it is vital that gambling regulation keeps up with digital technology and the industry changes which have totally transformed the gambling industry, which have made it much more accessible. And I do share the concerns of my colleagues um, that, have, that have spoken so far in the debate that uh, this was an opportunity missed. Certainly that, that's what it appears to be at this point in time, and that the Minister has not went far enough with this bill in its present form. As has been said a number of times, Northern Ireland has a gambling problem. 40,000 believed to have a gambling problem, which is the highest incidence rate of gambling, problem gambling in the UK, four times higher than any other region in the UK and around three times higher than that of the Republic of Ireland. Problem gambling can impact people from all backgrounds, the wealthy and the less well-off. and All can be equally impacted by gambling, and it can bring real devastation into homes, families and the lives of children and young people. It doesn't just impact the gambler themselves, it impacts their families, friends, their loved ones with its knock-on domino effect. Our most vulnerable within society are also adversely impacted on gambling, and they can very easily fall into a vicious circle of problem gambling, even leading to crime to feed their addiction, something my, my colleague touched upon earlier. The COVID pandemic has also resulted in, resulted in people spending much more time at home over the last 18 months, which has led to an increasing amount of people gambling from their homes, including those perhaps laid off through work due to the pandemic or, or on furlough, and often may have more time um, to spend at home. It is also a major public health issue, and I think that hasn't been talked, about much, or talked about just enough, particularly in this bill, and it impacts mental health, depression, and tragically has even led to suicide. I'm sure everybody in this room, in this chamber this, this afternoon, has um, seen somebody touched by, by suicide, um, often which can result from, from gambling. So I think it more needs to be done to highlight the key dangers and, and the, the very real risks associated with gambling. Never before has it been as accessible as it is today, particularly for our children and young people. Schools also can play a role in raising awareness and the public health messaging around the dangers of problem gambling. I think that there's an area of work that we need to focus on as well in terms of um, the, the, our school curriculums and so on, and getting that message to, to the very young, even, even primary school age. The digital revolution has undoubtedly transformed the gambling industry. Almost every mobile phone today has the ability to have a gambling app installed on it. These apps have no set opening or closing times, and they have no doormen on the door to monitor age restrictions and policies. And the betting shop is in their pockets, day and night, 24-7. Online gambling has brought gambling from the high streets to our homes, and the easy accessibility can be the biggest single issue for problem gamblers and those with addictions. And it is addiction. It is an addiction, as has been mentioned earlier in this debate. And I think that, that highlights the need for a, a cross-departmental approach as well, given that it is very much a public health issue. People can bet in their kitchen, living rooms and bedrooms. And people don't even know if someone likes to bet, compared to possibly more in the past when people visited a local bookmaker's shop. And some may not have liked to have been seen going in or out of that shop. Um, but obviously, certainly things have transformed. Another example is the very popular football index scheme, which I'm sure some members here are familiar with, which collapsed in March of this year, leaving £90 million worth of stakes trapped across the UK. This is an example of an online betting scheme which attracted many people into it, as it operated under a guise of being a football stock market where players bought shares on footballers. All of this was done via apps and smartphones, and no player ever had to go over the door of a betting outlet to play, which in turn attracted even more novice gamblers, people who would never have darkened the door um, of a bookmaker's or a gambling outlet. Many individuals lost thousands and thousands of pounds on this scheme, and I personally know some who lost thousands of pounds on this, with not a penny paid out to date following its collapse. The UK government independent report published just last week, into the football index um, scheme, identified significant lessons to be learned and provided recommendations for both the Gambling Commission and the Financial Conduct Authority 
and leave both of these authorities with significant questions to answer. This story highlights the need for tougher regulation to tackle this problem. Users have said to me that it should never have got the licence, and I think that, that's a key point that the Minister really needs to get a grip of, and this is an opportunity to do that. And I don't think the bill is thorough and robust enough in its current format. Several well-known local sports stars have had the courage to speak up and talk, for, and talk openly in recent years about the battles they have faced with very serious gambling addictions, and I think that is to be welcomed. Sports stars will relate to people that many of us will never relate to, and I think it, we should encourage them to, to, to do that. And it's certainly been positive to see that coming forward from right across the community, and from football, rugby, and Gaelic, and other sports as well. Um, so I would salute them for their bravery and, and commend them on it. They have often talked about their financial and personal breakdowns and highlighted the importance of necessary support structures and the need for people to talk openly about their battles as well as highlighting the prevalence of gambling within sport, right across sport locally and right across the globe. These personal stories are powerful and moving, and they reinforce the need for a strong structure through legislation to, to tackle this, this very serious and growing problem. Money for research, education and treatment for gambling harm is needed more urgently in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the UK because of our high levels of gambling-related harm. The multi-billion pound gambling and gaming industry needs to step up to support those affected by problem gambling and addiction to tackle the problems it has created through rigorous mandatory levies. And I think the Minister again needs to really highlight that issue. Um, players should not be also be able to use their, their credit card as a direct form of payment with gaming machines or any other form of gambling. Whilst the ban on credit cards has been in place in GB since April 2020, I firmly believe that a similar ban should be in place here to protect those problem gamblers at risk of getting into serious financial hardship through credit cards, which has been alluded to earlier, which is not money that, that they have and they may never be able to, to repay it. And the, the problems that r relate to that, back to the domino effect, are very, very dangerous and can often be tragic. One of the key provisions in the first substantial piece of Northern Ireland gambling legislation for over 36 years is to actually propose less regulation of betting shops, with them being allowed to open on a Sunday, something I do not believe will help to, help to support those directly with gambling addictions. And it also highlights the issue about staff as well on the, um, the, the one day that they have off to spend with their families. And again, it, it opens up the attractiveness for those who have serious addiction problems. Um, to access them on additional days. Mr Speaker, what this bill should have been was a series of legislative provisions aimed at bringing Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the UK and making it fit for purpose. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is important that we scrutinise this bill to outline what should have been in the legislation and what the committee should consider as it scrutinises the bill should it pass this second reading today. The bill should have included legislative provisions on gaming machines, whilst Clause 7 does introduce an offence of inviting a person under 18 to play gaming machines. This falls well short of what is needed. It was an opportunity to tackle fixed odds betting terminals, and again that opportunity seems to have been missed to date. We know the harm of fixed odds betting machines. They are highly addictive, primarily used by young people and attractive to those from lower income households. And they particularly attract problem gamblers because multiple bets can be placed, meaning bigger wins, but more, more likely people who use them face crippling losses, and there is often only one winner, and it's not those that are playing, playing. Mr Deputy Speaker, while regulation is in place in the rest of the UK, here any control of fixed odds betting terminals is, is purely voluntary. And while, whilst most larger operators have limited odds to two pounds, this is by no means universal. Only legislative change will properly regulate these terminals, and I, I believe more needs to be done by this bill, and particularly around the, the issue of online gambling. Yes, sure. For giving way, not only is he right in what he's saying with regards to re regulation of the industry and the betting fraternity, but we also have a lack of a programme for government and joined-up government here, whereby we know that betting gambling addiction is a public health issue. Yet the programme of government is silent on what it can do to achieve better outcomes for addictive uh, gamblers. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank the member for that. And I certainly concur with that. As I touched upon earlier, there is a role for, for more than just the communities department to get a grip of this, and hopefully lessons can be learned going forward um, in the future to ultimately improve this situation and ultimately help those with addiction problems and those who suffer from problem gambling. Um, while some parts of this bill are welcome, there are many, many gaps, including around the issue of online gambling, which is such a, a key issue and, and is the, the number one means of, of people firstly getting attracted to gambling and also being addicted to gambling. Um, I do have concerns about some elements of the bill, however, and there is clear that more needs to be done to render this bill fit for purpose and maximise its effectiveness in tackling problem, problem gambling. Serious change is needed to address this very serious problem, and I look forward to the, work, the constructive work ahead. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I hear him, Sir Pat Catney, on Kanch, and I call Pat Catney. On the other question, call you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, an NIO officer described uh, the prevalence of problem gambling in Northern Ireland as extraordinary. I would call it completely shocking. Not only do we have the highest prevalence in the UK, our rate is four times that of England. We have a further 4.9 per cent of people with moderate risk and 6.7 at a greater risk. Um, earlier on there today, uh, I, I, I look at myself whenever I was working in the bar, and you'll normally find beside that public house, you'll find a bookmaker's license. And I say to you, to those that find themselves with gambling, there's a small little statistic when you walk into that bookmaker shop, and no attack on the bookies, but you'll find there's six holes or six little units where you can pay in, and there's only one for paying out. So, as my colleague from North Antrim said, the odds are against you. So there is a dire need for legislation that tackles this issue. And while I do agree with some of the provisions in this bill, I can't help but find overwhelmingly as a whole. They levy the introduction of Clause 14 is, is positive, but not mandatory, and only refers to bookmakers, bingo clubs and amusements, permits which will limit its effectiveness. The offence proposed under Clause 7 for inviting a person under the age of 18 to play gaming machines is to be welcomed, but again, without tackling the grey area of fixed odds, betting terminals, again, the impact will be limited. And again, just to state, uh, you like to think you have a fair chance when you gamble. Uh, even in one of yesterday's matches where you might have had uh, America or you might have had the European team, there's always a winning in the middle where it could be a draw. And just like those fixed uh, terminals, they are set, folks. They are set at a percentage of income that comes into them to pay out. So for every £100 that they take in, they're only going to pay out £70. And some could be set lower, some could be set higher. But it needs to be noted as we discuss this here today. It needs to be set and regulated in such a way as if at least if it was going or trying to be fair. The offence proposed under Clause 7, uh, there is also a number of glaring omissions from the Bill. Since April 2020 in England, there has been a ban on using credit or debit cards as a direct form of payment for gambling machines or on any other form of gambling. Why is there no similar provision here in this Bill? Um, I sat here uh, today and I, 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 wonder, I listened to uh, the MLA from South Down. Uh, stating that uh, when this building was closed for three years, in fact, three of the first years that I was elected to it, that they went to the south of Ireland in order to develop a strategy, a strategy that they're not uh, implementing here in the north of Ireland, and they have the power here to do it. They're calling for it in the south, but they have the power to implement that strategy here. I'm asking them, why is that? And stop. I mean, that, that's some gamble, you know, in order to try and pull that off here and tell us here what they're trying to do here, and they have the power to do it, yet they're calling for it in the South. Gambling addiction destroys lives and it tears families apart. Folks, those that find themselves addicted to gambling 
will neither put in them or on them. It's all about the bet. It's all about that big win. It's all about tomorrow. And yes, I know those that, that gambled. I know professional gamblers in my lifestyle. I see some, and they can be very witty and funny. One in particular always was dressed immaculately, was shining shoes, new suits. More times than enough, that man had no money. But he always was well dressed. And his answer to me would have been, it's not a sin to be skint, but it's a sin to look skint. So that is an addiction that can drive you to that. I also say um, I've been disappointed that the ambition of this bill far, far short to addressing the problems of gambling and provide it to those in need of it most. The Minister's own party, as already stated, has the policy document which goes far further than the legislation in front of us here today. It seems to be words, folks, and no action. Whereas other members have said, is the action on fixed odds betting terminals, where is the commitment to car pathways for gambling addictions? Or virtually every measure of this bill is weak, weak, and in fact very weak, Mr. Speak Mr Deputy Speaker. Ultimately, while any legislation is a more important move towards tackling, problem gambling, more research is needed urgently to better understand why our levels are so incredibly high. It needs to focus on the economic and social factors that have led to high levels, and we need to look at what has been done in other jurisdictions in order to help and over those 40,000 members of our community who are living with the massive impact of gambling addiction. Um, I know I've spoke of those that find themselves addicted to gambling, and I know that my colleague from Lagan Valley has spoke on the mental impact that that, that has, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But in real terms, uh, to have seen that, uh, as, you, uh, as you go through your work in life and the harm that that causes to the families. And maybe the man, for the sake, because it was mostly male dominated in those earlier days, find themselves gambling and they gamble with everything and they will borrow to gamble. They will do anything for that gamble and they believe wholeheartedly that the next bet will get them out of it. I just want to go, folks, and tell one little story and I want to come just quickly, and I went to Cheltenham. Uh, we run a trip from the bar to Cheltenham, and I ended up sharing a room with a gentleman whose name I won't mention, but he always seemed to be a very, very lucky gambler. And I didn't smoke, and that year was the second year that a horse was running called I'm for Auction. And he had a hat on his head with a band round it, and he was committed that I'm for auction would win the Queen Mother, uh, um, uh, the two-mile two hurdle. Anyhow, to make a long story short, he had left the savings, which I didn't know, and he had put everything on to I'm for auction. As he walked about Cheltenham with that hat on his head, that night when I went to bed, I noticed the room had filled up with smoke, and as I tentatively looked round over to Charlie, I could hear him praying. Okay, and I'd seen all these butts with the ashes burned down on them, and he was praying to get out of it. He had used all of his savings. That cost him his job, cost him his marriage, and I never saw that man ever again from that day. So that's the price that it causes on that. We will support this legislation going forward, Mr Deputy um, Speaker, but the Minister needs to scale up her ambitions, and quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sir Philip McGuigan, Hon Kainshaw. Now, call Philip McGuigan. Kerr Melgood, uh, last can call you. Uh, I, I should declare at the outset, uh, even though it's no secret, that I am a recovering gambling addict and have suffered at the hands of this very serious illness, an illness that unfortunately affects too many individuals and families across this society. And as with anyone who suffers from any addiction, uh, they will know there are many times when it is impossible to believe that there is a way out. So when I say I'm glad to stand today and speak to this important legislation, I can assure you that I really mean it. Gambling addiction is an illness that doesn't discriminate against female or male, that doesn't take into account how much or how little you earn 
what job you do, where you live, nor, nor how old or young you may be. In fact, with the, the design of modern gambling products, it is increasingly a cause for concern, the growth of gambling harm within our young population. Even though our information gathering on gambling harm in this jurisdiction is pretty poor, it is estimated that 2.3% of the North's population suffer from gambling harm. And as the Committee for Communities Chair pointed out, that, that equates to 40,000 uh, individuals. That's four times higher than it is in England, Scotland and Wales, and three times higher than in the South. And I know people have quoted those statistics already, and I mention them purely because they are staggering statistics and should be a cause for concern. Another cause for concern is the fact that suicide from gambling addiction is statistically higher than from any other form of addiction. And I have witnessed people struggle with the impact of this addiction until they couldn't struggle any longer. Like others, I need to state at this juncture that I'm not anti-gambling. My experiences haven't made me anti-gambling. I wasn't anti-gambling before I became addicted to gambling. Many within society, my family and friends included, gain fun and enjoyment from betting on sports or the lottery or so on. But we do have a problem, and it's not a problem with gamblers. It's a problem with legislation. Nobody or no business should have anything to fear from good legislation. Good legislation will have no impact on nor remove the enjoyment from those many people who can gamble safely. But it can and will reduce the potential for gambling-related harm. Minister Hargey is bringing forward the first overhaul of gambling legislation here in the North in over 30 years. She has been in office for 18 months. Others have pontificated about you know, why, why, why the minister isn't doing more, or why this isn't in, or why this isn't included, or what's the cause for delay. She's been in office for 18 months. Other parties, included in this chamber, have held this responsibility in the, some of those preceding 35 years. So I'm delighted that it's a Sinn Féin minister bringing forward this legislation. I also welcome Minister Hargey's intention to rectify a situation that needs rectified. I have listen, listened to the criticisms in this chamber so far in this debate to her two-phase approach to modernising our legislation, even though I felt the minister dealt with many of the issues raised in her opening remarks, and I have no doubt she will deal with them in her closing contributions. It is clear that this bill will tighten up important aspects that need tightened up, such as creating the new offence in relation to allowing children to play gaming machines, broaden the definition of cheating to include attempted cheating, establish a mandatory code of practice for those holding gambling licences, create powers to impose a statutory levy on gambling operators, things that are needed to ha need to happen and can happen now. I'm not a member of the Communities Committee, but I wish them luck in the process of scrutinising the detail of this bill. I don't think any of us will disagree with any suggestions that can improve the outcome of legislation. I do believe, and it has been endorsed already by everybody uh, in their contributions, that we do what need change, and we have waited for 35 years, so it is imperative that we get this legislation through within this mandate. As I have said, this legislation has the potential to improve people's lives and potentially save people's lives. We need a socially responsible gambling industry. We need a much better balance between the freedom to gamble and the protection from the social and financial risks that gambling entails. And this bill is part of that process, and the Minister has already outlined that it is only part of that process. It is the beginning. The second phase, as outlined by the Minister, to bring forward a completely new regulatory framework to regulate online gambling, including gaming machines, will require a longer time frame than we have in this mandate, but it will be a hugely p crucial piece of work. My own experience of gambling was not so much in bookie shops or on gambling premises, but sitting at home on a laptop, an iPad, or on the move using this, my phone. Open access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with absolutely no limits, and little or no effective restriction, control, or regulation. In my time gambling online, in my experience, Online platforms for gambling were like the Wild West and, as a result, created many casualties. Online gambling companies make huge profits. In some cases, they make obscene profits. Those profits, by and large, come from a small proportion of gamblers. In one instance, a company made 83% of 
of its huge profit from only 2% of its customers. I will. I want to just be on record and thanking the, the member for sharing uh, a number of times his own personal story because I think it adds real value to the purpose of this legislation. But the member raises an important point in and around the levy and he's now talking about the online industry. And given that proportionally, when you look at the, um, the money, the revenue that's taken by any gambling company, at least the turf accountants and the betting shops here employ people. Online, there is a decreasing number of people that those people employ, so therefore their profits uh, are exponentially bigger. Would the member agree with me that in the second iteration of this legislation, it's important that a levy for online is reflective of the, the profits that they make, v to v the jobs and the, the social capital that's, that's not created? I thank the, the member for his intervention, and I totally concur. Uh, I mean, I, I have had the, the privilege of working with yourself on the APT on gambling related harm and that's one of the aspects that we certainly uh, discussed and would like to see in phase two. So I mean I raised that uh, statistic about the 83 percent profit from two percent uh, of its customers because if you understand that statistic you, you realize that there's little incentive from gambling companies to regulate themselves. That is why legislation is vital. We need to see responsible policy and legislation from government followed by responsible provision by operators to allow and assist responsible consumption by customers. Nick, I will. I would echo the, the comments also from my other colleague here with regards to the member's personal story. and We share a constituency together uh, and you know, I wish the member all the, way, all the best in the future uh, with regards to uh, his story. Uh, he's right about regulation, but is it not the case that we could have easily adopted some of the regulations that are already in place in GB, not least the, the Gambling Commissioner, whereby they would then regulate and look at um, these things in a more in-depth way? Uh, and I will come to answer that, that point uh, later in, in, in my contribution. I mean, dealing with online gambling is very, very, very complicated. Uh, and, and the point w which I will make, and I'll, I'll just make it now, I mean, they've been looking at this legislation in Westminster since 2019 and have yet to reach a conclusion because of its complications, which is the point of why we need here, with a short time left in this mandate, to uh, approach this in the way that the Minister is proposing we approach it. So, nicotine, of, I mean, in terms of addiction uh, and other things, you know, nic nicotine is put in cigarettes for a particular reason, and we all know what that reason is. Similarly, uh, you know, that could be said of some of the gambling products offered by gambling companies, particularly online companies, along with the growth in in-play betting, the speed of online games and betting, introductory offers, free bets, VIP schemes, and much more. These are the things that I want to see tackled in the next phase of the legislation that will be brought forward in the next mandate. And these are the things that are currently being looked at in Westminster, but they are complicated and, and do require time to get them right. So I totally agree with everyone who has laboured on the points and the importance of dealing with these issues arising from online gambling. I thank Mr McGuigan uh, for giving way, and again would like to be associated with the remarks of the speakers across the, the chamber in terms of his own courage and contribution to this debate, not just today, but over his time as an MLA. Uh, the, the, the member has outlined the fact that this is the first overhaul of gambling in 35 years and lamented the fact that previous ministers, say for social development, for example, haven't acted to do that. Would the, man, would the member be as sympathetic to this legislation if it was a minister from another party uh, bringing it forward, or might he find fault in the fact that it does not include the provisions that he is outlining now must be in the second piece of legislation? And is he saying as well that we have to wait and see how Westminster do it? Because I think that is a strange position for someone in Sinn Féin to be taking. Uh, it, it isn't what I was going to say, but I note uh, your, your, your party colleague in his last contribution said we need to look at other jurisdictions' legislation. That's the point I'm making. You know, I, I, I'm, I, the point I'm making is that this is complicated. And I no, the tr to answer your question, I would not, uh, I would not uh, 
argue against any minister who has come before and put a rational approach in terms of providing the way forward with regard to important legislation, which I believe uh, the minister sitting beside me has done. And uh, you know, there are very good reasons. Myself uh, and uh, Mr Butler uh, sit in the APG. We have explored some of these issues. They are very, very complicated. There's issues when you're dealing with online companies about jurisdictions, about offshore, about regulation, about you know, gathering information. All of that is very, very complicated. And there's absolutely no way that it would be dealt with properly in the remaining length of this mandate. Uh, Kelly Armstrong, for example, and her contribution said that it would be an enormous piece of work, and I agree with that. Uh, as just you know, my experience of APG and reducing gambling harm has taught me anything. It is not only that it will be an enormous piece of work, uh, but it's very complicated legislation to get right. Uh, in my view, it would be impossible to tackle within the remainder of this. And as I said, they've been tackling with it for over two years in Westminster. They are tackling with it for a long period of time in the South. Uh, and whilst I'm not saying we would be copying Westminster, I would never accept that. Uh, but I do think that we can learn and share because, as has been pointed out with regard to other things, it would be foolish, not that we can do it anyway, in terms of advertising, uh, banning advertisement or tackling advertisement, when we all can switch on our TV as we do and watch Sky Sports or any other uh, sports programme. Adver no, we're, we're, we're inundated with advertisement. So, you know, there is a certain amount of logic to dealing with this important issue across these islands. That's the point I make. Yep. And I thank the member for giving way. Um, the reason why I believe that there should be two pieces of legislation is when we look at the breadth and the width of online gambling, we're not, we live in this tiny place. How can we possibly bring in legislation that will compete with people who are coming from America, from China, from whatever country that's coming in that people are given access? Does the member agree with me that a second piece of legislation is something, as you have just said, that will need to be across these islands because we can't ourselves on our own deal with online gambling? Absolutely. I mean, uh, just to assure uh, Mark H that, you know, as regards gambling and any other policy and legislation, I want an all earned approach. Uh, but the point has been made in relation to this, that this goes much further and wider than this particular island that we uh, live on. So mention has been made earlier uh, in terms of the campaign group Gambling with Lives. And I look forward, uh, along with my colleague uh, Robbie Butler from the APG, to welcoming Gambling with Lives here to uh, the Long Gallery tomorrow to launch their education programme for young people on gambling issues. That group has been to the forefront of the campaign for better legislation and laws across these islands. They have also been to the forefront of a campaign around gambling advertising, which, if you're a sports fanatic like I am, uh, you will realise is its saturation point on TVs, online platforms, print media, and unfortunately, some sports grounds and uh, on players' shirts. So I want to see this issue addressed, but any legislation, as we've We've said time and again that we can take on advertising to be effective has to be compatible on this island uh, and beyond to be effective. Uh, we aren't going to be able, as I said, to stop people watching their favourite uh, soccer team, even if it is Spurs, uh, on the on the TV. So, you know, in terms of the work that the APG on gambling harm has done, you know, we, I believe that we have conducted an inquiry, and the evidence that we have obtained have made for some very useful recommendations and hopefully the committee and indeed the minister will, will find this report helpful in their work and their deliberations over this phase and uh, any future phases. The report recommendations on self-exclusion, advertising, affordability checks and much more in my view is a, a useful contribution to this subject. Uh, and I noted the points on credit cards that others have made earlier in this debate and as someone who was able to rack up a substantial debt uh, solely using credit cards and a range of credit cards for the purpose of only gambling with no restriction, uh, you know, I would be extremely disappointed if this wasn't an issue that is to be addressed in this legislation. And I would hope the Minister can detail that uh, if that is to be the case in her uh, summing up. Uh, just n n as I come towards the, the end of my remarks, uh, last can call your, you know, I can't let any discussion on this subject go without expressing my view, and others have made it, 
that to properly tackle problem gambling harm, gambling related harm, we must go beyond uh, legislation from within the Department for Communities. Uh, I have stated that gambling addiction is an illness, so it thus needs to be treated as such, and this requires a public health approach from our Chief Medical Officer and from our Health Minister. Whatever about addiction services here in the North through the health services for alcohol and drugs, when it comes to gambling, they are non-existent. Uh, I welcome the mandatory levy in this bill that will produce a gambling harm fund, and that is a good start, but it should not absolve our health uh, services from treating gambling harm with the seriousness that it deserves. Uh, and I commend this bill. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I just would like to add a few words in relation to health primarily, but for, before I do so, I just would put on record that I'm a member of the APGO on reducing harm from gambling, and unfortunately I'm not able to get to as many meetings because it clashes with health, but I, I would recognise the amazing work that they have done since that APG was set up. I would also um, put on record that my son, who I left to university this weekend, is paying his way through university by working in a betting shop. And you can imagine my heart sank when he told me that that's where, how he was going to do that. And I, my only hope is that he sees, uh, working in that environment, how exploitative it is. I also... Go ahead. The member gives... Thank you, the member, for giving way. But, uh, and saying that, I wouldn't lose heart in that, that regard, because some of the people who work in betting shops are the most responsible people out, who actually look after a lot of the punters at times with regards to making sure they're sensible, trying to keep them level-headed, trying to even get them home at times. Uh, so there are good, really good people who work in the, the bookie shops. Um, thank you for, for that intervention. I don't really want to labour the point, but my, my point is he's a 21-year-old football fanatic, um, very impressionable at times, and the last thing I would want him to do is to see that as, as a glamorous. But going, knowing what his um, uh, hourly rate will be, I can assure you that they're just as exploitative of their staff as they are of their customers. Well, in my opinion. Um, I would like to wish, uh, sorry, put on record um, that I understand the concerns of those who have cautioned about the ap approach inherent in this bill, namely that of the middle road of amending parts of the 1985 order rather than going with an outright replacement piece of legislation. Given that problem gambling is a markedly bigger issue in Northern Ireland than elsewhere in the UK, I understand fully where some are coming from when they warn that what is really required is a fully considered piece of new legislation fit for the 2020s. I think most of us would, in an ideal world, be wanting to proceed in that direction. Speaking personally, this is particularly the case with the industry levy proposed in Clause 14. I am unclear, given that this will itself have to go without, sorry, go out to full consultation quite why this has been included at this stage, but I look forward to hearing more about that. However, as others have indicated today, um, having already lost three years of legislative time, I do not think we have time to leave this untouched for the length of time it would take to draft and approve what would inevitably be a piece of compromised legislation of something which is considerably complex. So while fully recognising, understanding and indeed even agreeing with the notes of caution, I do not think that we have much option but to proceed on the basis we are proceeding. That does not necessarily say that it would be perfect, that this is perfect. Um, and as my colleague Kelly Armstrong has indicated, um, the, health, the committee, Communities Committee have a lot of work to do that um, around this in their deliberations and putting forward potential amendments. Mr Deputy Speaker, I broadly agree with the measures contained in the Bill, which bring Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the UK, allowing customers access to the same games and fixing the oddities around Sunday trading and operating in the internet and social media age. Where I have my own concerns is around what appears to me to be a lack of priority given to the health aspects. These appear to have been left to later legislation when the 1985 order is completely overhauled. I am unconvinced that this is good enough because there is an increasing recognition that problem gambling is a health issue. We need therefore to include the health aspects at the very start of any deliberations or any drafting. I personally tend towards the view, for example, that there should be a standalone service 
for addiction. And at this point, I would thank um, the John Louis Addiction Services, Extern and Gambling for Lives for the work that they do. But they are not sufficiently funded. And I, um, I think um, more commissioning of services in this regard would be particularly welcomed. Um, we need to do so much more to provide support in a way um, in which it can be accessed, to remove stigma, and ultimately to use the experiences of those, unfortunately, um, who have experienced addiction to help um, with interventions to prevent addiction occurring in the first place. And I think um, Mr Butler referenced that around this has to be a more comprehensive piece of work to ensure people don't get into gambling in the first place. This is not entirely a matter for legislation as much of it can be done through adequate resourcing and policy prioritisation. However, it should be at the core of everything we do around this issue. So in closing, um, this is a matter of public health and it requires a public health approach. And I would like to see this become more evident in deliberations around this legislation and indeed around this issue generally. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt you there because, but um, I mean, just for the sake of this debate that's here, I find myself that I mean, yesterday I had a, a little gamble, a little punt at, at the golf, but I can either take it or leave it, and um, there, there, there is nothing wrong with that. It's when it's in control, and I, I, I take on board what Mr McGuigan has said. He's not here just now at the moment. And I understand when it gets out of control how difficult that can be, and I've seen it at first hand. And may I also just add to your young son, I wish him all the best of luck going across to university, but I can tell you, he will get an education in that betting office. He will never get in a university, so good luck to him. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I suppose this is the, the point I was making, that, you know, that it, it, some people, I, as Kelly had indicated as well, you know, we will all do the lottery, we'll all put a, a small bet on, go down to the amusements in Newcastle. It's whenever it becomes exploitative, whenever they take advantage of people um, and, and gambling for lives. Um, sorry, gambling with lives, for example, have indicated in the past the, you know, the messages coming through at two o'clock in the morning when you're lying in bed and you've been not gambling for a few weeks and they, they just hook you back in with all the offers and all the deals and stuff. So it is a really important um, piece of legislation and I wish the Minister and the Committee all the best going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've been... Um, uh, listening with interest to um, the debate on this um, draft legislation, with which, as my um, colleague uh, Mark H. Durkin says, substantively, we, we, we don't have any deep objections to the bill on its own terms. Um, but I suppose I do have uh, an objection and a concern about the way in which uh, this entire debate has been framed, which is that this is a bill about protecting consumers from harm. That's not true, insofar as I can see, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, this bill, when you net it out, is a bill which liberalises our gaming laws. I should say up front, because everyone else has said it, though it's almost a slightly tiresome disclaimer, I don't have any issue with uh, gambling on moral grounds. I enjoy a bet, as the cliché goes. Uh, I too had a bet on the golf over the weekend. Europe um, uh, let me down. It's the first time I'll use that phrase in this... <laughs> Uh, Assembly Chamber, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker. Um, but um, the point is that, I mean, I, I don't have any issue with uh, gambling. I enjoy a bet. Uh, it is a, uh, you know, it's a significant way that lots of people, a significant industry, a significant way that lots of people um, uh, enjoy in a controlled and responsible way uh, their leisure time. I originally come from Downpatrick. It's one of the home of one of the most historic race courses in Ireland. So I'll get that all out of the way. Uh, at the, at the start, because it's not really relevant to what we're actually debating, because we all accept that many of us, most of us, are able to enjoy an occasional flutter, an occasional gamble responsibly, whether that's a scratch card or a uh, bet on the horses. That's not really what we're talking about today, because we all also accept that we have, the world has completely changed since 1985, when the last order was made relating to gambling law in Northern Ireland. We aren't even really talking substantively about the same thing because the regulation of um, uh, uh, gambling, uh, land-based gambling, as it's called, gambling in bookies and indeed buying lottery tickets, is so fundamentally, categorically different from what happens now, which is, as Mr McGuigan said, and his testimony has been very powerful, the 
the ubiquitous and constant presence of the ability to destroy your life at the touch of a button, uh, that being there constantly, it's important for us to acknowledge that that is so fundamentally different uh, and it's creating an epidemic. People have uh, repeatedly, throughout the debate, talked about the shocking statistics in Northern Ireland. We have four times, uh, uh, gambling addiction is four times higher here than in Britain and three times higher than in the south of Ireland. Now, if we accept that that is a shocking and appalling position to be in, then we surely have to accept that the primary purpose of any legislation in relation to gaming is dealing with that harm, which is why it is, I'm afraid, uh, extremely bad that the legislation we have today is, and I don't uh, have any particular substantive objection to uh, opening bookie shops on a Sunday, but that shouldn't be the priority for legislation. If we accept the principle that this society has the worst problem in these islands with gambling-related harm, why in this two-phase approach that has been talked about isn't phase one at least starting to address some of the issues around uh, online harm and the ubiquitous constant threat of that to not just individuals in terms of financial loss, but in terms of mental health, in terms of family breakdown, in terms of all of the appalling consequences of it. Um, and I recognise that Mr Butler and other have, others have done extremely good work on the APG, but recognising how serious an issue that is, why uh, isn't this bill starting to address it? Others have said um, this bill is a good start in terms of uh, tackling gambling harm. Well, is it, to be honest, is it? Uh, of the 16 clauses, two of them deal with harm insofar as I can see. Um, the one that has been talked about uh, most often, I mean, obviously, certainly, I, I, uh, I welcome Clause 7 in terms of, uh, make, uh, in terms of creating the offence. Totally welcome that. I'm, I'm glad the, the Minister is bringing it forward. Um, uh, the, the other um, Clause 14, the industry levy, um, uh, is a, a relatively uh, modest step forward, and I'm glad uh, that it's happening. But in relation to both of those clauses, I think it's really important to point out that we have said consistently today that the primary driver of this epidemic of harm in our society is not physical gambling. Now, that is a real problem which I'll come on to because this doesn't touch on one other area of physical gambling harm. But in relation to both of these, they both relate to land-based in-person gaming. It says nothing about uh, online harm, in, in, unless I'm wrong and I'm happy to be, cor be corrected. Um, by the Minister if someone wants to intervene. The industry levy specifically relates to new licences granted for in-person bookies. Um, uh, if you know much about the, the gaming industry, then you'll know that there frankly aren't that many physical bookies opening anymore. It's not, uh, uh, the, the, the premises are not, a, the bookie shops don't tend to open that much anymore. The, the business, all the growth in this industry is in online, and it's in online for a reason, because that's how you get a hell of a lot more money out of people and destroy their lives and make more profits. Candidly, so uh, the concentrating this levy on new bookmakers' premises uh, and indeed new fruit machines uh, and indeed new bingo halls. And yes, there are bingo halls opening, uh, uh, but you know I'm afraid we have to focus on the fact that this isn't. That's not where, where the primary growth is in terms of the harm uh, in society. So I don't um, uh, I, I, I don't dispute them uh, on their own terms, but I do question the suggestion that this is somehow uh, a completely seamless prioritisation, phase one, then phase two, in terms of dealing with harm. If we accept that the priority has to be dealing with online harm, then why isn't that the priority? Why aren't we starting uh, with this uh, bill? It's been said by, it was said by Ms Ennis um, in her previous remarks um, that it would take 360 uh, clauses. I don't know where, I'm not on the committee, I don't know where that number came from, but I'm not sure why it should take 360 clauses. No one says that you have to boil the ocean um, uh, to, to do these things to, to start. Why not have uh, some clauses? Why not have particular measures? And I do hope that the committee members and others will look at amendments to try and strengthen uh, and add a little bit more um, ballast to this, um, uh, to this bill and its, I'm afraid, complete uh, lack of ambition. Uh, as I was uh, listening to some of this debate earlier on, I was paying attention because there were lots of very interesting contributions, but as we all do, my mind wandered a little bit and I... Um, uh, and I flicked onto Twitter, um, I, I'll confess. And when I flicked on Twitter, I saw there was a, a, a news story on PR Week, which is a, an industry title for the communications trade. And the story that was being linked to in PR Week was Paddy Power, a brand I'm sure we're all 
familiar with Paddy Power and its great, hilarious banter advertisements. Uh, um, but Paddy Power, the group that owns it, is also, of course, one of the companies that makes uh, outlandish and enormous profits out of the harm that's created. And on P in the, on the PR Week story was referring to the fact that Paddy Power is recruiting ahead of mischief. It's all about a crack, isn't it? God, it's all about a crack. Ahead of mischief, doing fun stunts and having a bit of crack. It's not. It's not whenever you're uh, losing your home, losing your family, losing your marriage and your career. And that's happening every day in this society. And we've all acknowledged it. We've all acknowledged it. So why aren't we doing more to tackle um, that harm? Ms. Ennis also talked about um, the, the strategy. She then said that other parties hadn't uh, produced a strategy. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if other... I've seen both the All Island strategy and then the 26 county gambling strategy. I don't know if that is a, an evolution for a, for a particular reason. We <laughs> agree there should be uh, an All Island gambling strategy, but when I look through the key recommendations in Sinn Féin's 26, gambling, uh, 26 county gambling strategy, I'm afraid uh, I can't see uh, where any of them uh, are taken. I may have missed one or two. Um, uh, I can't see where any of them are uh, being included in today's legislation. Specific, now one of the things that, that was um, said, a reason why, that, that, uh, an area where legislation couldn't be taken uh, in, in Northern Ireland because it was reserved was of course the area of broadcasting and that's fine, everyone knows broadcasting is reserved, but there are multiple other areas. You know, this is, we are, and I come back to this point, we, do, we are in both a North-South and an East-West context. Well, let's look at how, at the contradictions North-South East-West, we don't have, an unlike GB, we don't have uh, an independent gambling regulator. Unlike GB, we haven't taken action uh, on FOBTs. Unlike GB, uh, we, don't have a, um, uh, we don't have any uh, restrictions on the use of credit cards for online gambling. Um, in relation to North-South divergence, uh, one thing, if any of you have been in the pub in the South over the, over the, the summer, I confess, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have been. Um, and I, I should say in parenthesis that their vaccine passport scheme works seamlessly and effectively, but that's not what we're debating today. Um, but one other thing that you'll notice if you go into a pub uh, on the south side of the border is they don't have fruit machines. Isn't that interesting? They don't have gambling machines. That's interesting, isn't it? We do up here. There's a bit of north-south divergence we could address in this bill, but we aren't. That wouldn't require 360 uh, clauses, but we're not doing it. That's fine. Um, I come back to the point uh, I'm making, uh, I made at the very beginning, which is if we accept that there's an epidemic of harm being caused by gaming, particularly by online gaming, then we have to uh, accept that our priority in terms of legislation, whether it's phase one, phase two, well, it should be phase one, should be in at least starting to address some of the appalling harm uh, uh, to do with online, um, but it isn't, uh, it isn't in this bill, and I'm sure the Minister will say, and others have said before, that there isn't time. Two things in relation to that. One, um, that's a good, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid, self own, as is sometimes said on social media, for why we should have had these uh, institutions between uh, 2017 and 2020 in order to progress legislation in these areas. But it also, uh, I'm afraid, re reinforces the point that when you, are, when you do have limited time, you focus on what matters, and what matters at the minute is addressing the epidemic of online harm. Uh, and even if it's a, a clause or two, it would have been good to see something in this bill, um, but I'm afraid uh, we haven't. Uh, and it comes back to this point about prioritisation and about dealing with issues uh, that actually affect people. So as I said, Mr Deputy Speaker, lots of the specific principles in this bill I don't have a, pro I don't have a problem with. I personally do not have a principled uh, opposition with the opening of uh, bookies on a Sunday, I, you know, uh, but, but, but physical bookies are not where the harm is proportionately happening and not where the growth in the harm is happening. So I question why we would be prioritising that as a legislative measure and then presenting it to this chamber as somehow action on gambling harm, because it ain't. It just isn't. And it's disingenuous to say uh, that it is. The chair of the Communities Committee said earlier on, she talked about her own constituency of North Belfast and the high proportion of bookies in areas of high deprivation. She is exactly right. Uh, gambling harm hugely disproportionately affects people in, uh, in, in, in people in deprived areas and people, uh, frankly, who have other uh, issues in their lives. Uh, that's why we should pri be prioritising dealing, dealing, uh, dealing with the online 
online harm. I'm, I wish that this bill had done more, because why do we seek power? Why do we seek to legislate in this place? It's to improve people's lives, and I'm afraid this bill does not go far enough and does not prioritise enough helping people um, uh, deal with the problems that have been created by gambling. Um, and I wish uh, that it did. The lack of ambition is, I'm afraid, uh, uh, disappointing. I'd like to see uh, more in various areas, and then I'll close my remarks there. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I don't know what the odds would have been, but I find myself almost in total agreement with Mr. O'Toole on this matter. Um, I think past form would have been contrary to that, but on this issue, I find myself very much uh, empathising with the points he has made. Sorry? <laughs> Across this House today, I have heard many affirmations about of recognition of the deep, deep harm being caused with problem gambling. And the fundamental question I have is, how then does this bill match up to that? Or in the words of Mr. Catney, is it just words and no action? And sadly, that seems to be largely the category into which it falls. None of us can afford to be complacent about the problem of gambling, about the horrendous visitation that it brings in terms of misery and deficit to so many working families. We have heard the statistic today, 2.3 per cent, 40,000 people in Northern Ireland are problem gamblers. Another 4.9 per cent are at moderate risk of that. But it is not just the gamblers who are affected. It's not just the problem gamblers and those at moderate risk, which probably comes to something like 120,000 people. It's the families. It's the wives. It's the children. It's the dependents. So when you multiply that up, for every problem gambler or person who's at risk of being a problem gambler, there probably are another three or four people affected. That's coming close to half a million people. That's quite shocking. And then when we recognise that the gambling in industry really leeches off the poor in our society. That's why, as Ms Bradley pointed out, that 37 per cent of all the betting shops are in the lowest or in the wards with the greatest deprivation rates. She pointed out that 10% of all betting shops are in North Belfast, which exudes much deprivation. And there's only nine betting shops in the whole of North Down. So we know that when we're talking about those in our society who are suffering from the ravages of problem gambling, they are the very coterie of our society who can afford it least. And yet the shops are there because that's where the profits are being made. And that's where our problem gamblers are spending their time. Yes, the internet, of course. But those who are using and who are 
turning themselves into problem gamblers are predominantly, not exclusively, coming from highly deprived areas. And it is an unconscionable scandal that the gambling firms exploit that to the nth degree. And so when we know all that, and then we say we're going to legislate for it, how is it that the bill we produce doesn't tackle any of those problems? The bill we produce, in fact, liberalises. In fact, the headline of this bill is that instead of being open six days a week, these betting shops in these areas where they're bleeding people dry, they can now be open seven days a week. Is that really this executive's answer to problem in gambling? No one can say they didn't know. The statistics are there. Virtually every speaker has quoted them. And yet, the shocking contribution of this department and this executive to tackling that is to now give us the most liberal betting shop laws in the United Kingdom. What's that going to do? That going to do? <laughs> For problem gambling. Just as online gambling is 24 hours a day, now betting shop gambling is seven days a week. Are we serious? Yes? A really good point, and it goes back to uh, an offering that I made to the committee to maybe consider that if they are minded to accept that first iteration, which is the, the liberalisation, as you put it, of the opening hours on Sundays, that before that is enacted, that the code and regulations need to be in place to ensure that those people that will use those premises are protected uh, as well as they can be. Uh, I think the principle should be very clear. There will be no liberalisation until there's regulation where it can be in other sectors. Why, if we're serious about tackling the scourge of problem gambling, are we making it easier seven days a week to cultivate that problem? That's the question. And now we're told, oh, it's too hard for the executive. Take 360 clauses. That suggests somebody somewhere has drafted a bill. But it's not before this House. But there are straightforward things that could have been done in this bill. In April last year, in, the, in GB, there was a ban brought in on the use of credit cards. Why is that not in this bill? That's not 360 clauses. It mightn't even be 360 words. But where's the appetite to do something as simple as that? Where's the appetite to do something as simple as putting a two pound maximum stake on these wretched machines? That wouldn't take great legislative drafting to do that. But this department has chosen not to do it. And in choosing not to do it, they choose rather to liberalise the law when they could regulate in areas such as that. This is a department which in answer to assembly questions can't even say how many fixed odd betting terminals there are in Northern Ireland. AQW 1378 of 1722, the question was asked, 
I can't remember by whom. And the answer was, the department doesn't know how many fixed odds betting terminals there are. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is not good enough. That does not point to an appreciation in the department that that's an issue that needs to be grasped and dealt with. And we could bring the regulation. There is a gambling commission in GB. We could readily, easily, with a few words, not clause after clause after clause, extend the powers. Is it because it's the GB regulator? Has politics consumed this issue? Because I've heard no rational explanation as to why regulation couldn't be brought through that source. So really, I think this department, this executive, which allowed this bill to come to this house, needs to take a long, hard look at itself as to why it's in the business of liberalizing the law in a problem area and turning its back on regulating. There's no need. Yes, it might be very complex and difficult to regulate online banking. Under no illusion about that. But there are important Simple, easy steps, like the ban on credit cards, like the two-pound stake limit, which could have been taken. Why have they not been taken? What sort of message do we want to send out from this House? I tell you, Deputy Speaker, with this bill, we're sending very much the wrong message. Deirdre Hargi on Confluge Agus Kriya Khorlesh and Jispara. I now call Deirdre Hargi, uh, the Minister for Communities, to conclude and wind up the debate. Yeah, no, thanks very much, and thank you to everybody who's made a contribution um, in terms of this important issue. Um, and again, just to thank the Chair and the Vice Chair, and indeed the whole Communities Committee, who I know me and my officials will be engaging with um, throughout this bill, obviously going through the scrutiny rule within the committee. And I suppose, I mean, to set out from the start, um, just like the, the liquor licensing, just like the private rented sector legislation that went through its second stage a few weeks ago, if there are changes that can be done um, through the engagement stage and the oversight stage of committee, I'm more than willing to work with members um, or any members in this chamber in terms of improving the legislation. That said, a lot of members in this room have talked about getting things right. And that's what I want to do. I would be lying to this chamber and to people outside if I said that I could bring through the full piece of legislation that repeals the 85 order and replaces it with a new one, and that I could do it within this mandate. That would be a lie. Um, and I think it would be disingenuous for any other person in this chamber to say that that could be done. In terms of looking at a regulatory framework, in terms of consulting with the public, um, on these matters in terms of looking at the jurisdictional issues, the reserved matter issues as well. If somebody in this room can do all of that in six months and get it through committee, I will swap seats with you now. No, you're okay. Thank you. You've had plenty of time. In terms of all of the other stuff, and I do recognise, and I know it's been said and recognised by some members of the committee, we are dealing with a lot of legislation. That's not to say you don't do a piece of legislation. But there's the reality of time. Committee only have a certain amount of time to scrutinise. They're already, we're looking at nearly seven pieces of legislation that has gone through the Communities Committee. And therefore, if I just sat and waited on getting the legislation right, I wouldn't be having this piece of legislation being put forward here today. And it's for that reason, because I wanted to bring in some additional protections and to modernise this, the legislation from 1985, I wanted to do that, and the only way that I could see of doing that in a practical way was doing it in a two-phased approach. So this isn't the finality of the legislation, and the executive recognised that as well, that this will be done in two phases over the next period. 
This is 16 clauses in phase one, and we know that phase two will look at an, in and around 360 um, other clauses. The existing Act has 186 clauses. That doesn't deal with online gambling, and that's where the majority of the new clauses would come in when you look at the legislation that it's in place in other jurisdictions. So we don't have time to do all of that, and I'm just being brutally honest with people, because I would be leading them up the garden path if I said it was possible to do that within the time frame that we have. Um, I'm OK. No, I've, I know I have heard everybody, and I don't want to say yes to one and no to another. So in terms of the use of credit cards, this legislation will ban uh, the use of credit cards that will be included as part of the operator licence via the mandatory codes of practice, which is a new article within this bill. Separately, DCMS are working with uh, financial institutions to prohibit the use of credit cards as well. And again, I will update this House and the committee um, as those discussions are ongoing. In terms of an independent regulator, I fully support the implementation and the creation of an independent regulator. But to do that, it will require a new and comprehensive regulatory framework. And there's just basically not enough time to do that in six months. We can't create a new framework, go out and consult with people within a six month period. That said, work is beginning to look at all of those issues in terms of phase two. And we're not sitting about just waiting around. However, as an interim step, I am considering appointing an independent advisor on a temporary basis to look at these issues as we progress this legislation and look at the formation of the second phase. In terms of online gambling, and I can understand the commentary, I can understand that the internet wasn't here in 1985. And again, um, we can't do the bare minimum um, with the framework that we have. So if, I know Mark had said, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing right. There's no point in me trying to rush through a half-written piece of legislation to look at online gambling without the regulatory framework in which you're going to regulate it. All of that needs to be looked at, and that does take time. And we're finding and learning the lessons. It's not to say we're replicating what's in other jurisdictions, but we're certainly looking at the lessons learned were there regulators? Yes, they have them, but they have been heavily criticised as not having the teeth that they need to have. So we're looking at all of that as we're starting to progress that important piece in terms of looking at the issue of online gambling. And I have obviously, through my officials as well, we have engaged those who support people on the ground who are impacted by gambling. And that's why within this I am including an enabling power to look at a levy and obviously ongoing work to look at a gambling regulator, which are two of the areas that those organisations have been calling for. And as I say, we are continuing to engage with our counterparts in the South and also in Britain as they are grappling with these issues and reviewing their current um, procedures and regulators at the moment. In terms of problem gambling, this bill uh, does start to do that. And in the second phase, it will do more. But this is, as was said, a multi-dimensional issue. Education and health, indeed the ministers in the department are critical in terms of this conversation. And I know through the engagements with a variety of all party working groups looking at this issue because it is so cross-cutting. For that reason and after having those engagements, I am in the middle of setting up a cross-departmental group uh, that would look at the issue of problem gambling. I have communicated with the Ministers of Health and Education, and I am hopeful that that group will be up and running within the next couple of weeks and having the first meeting. In terms of changes to the corporate status, I suppose we need to make sure that the law um, is more consistent with other licensing schemes, such as the liquor licensing. We also need to make sure that it reflects a more global nature of today's betting market, and I think some of that was discussed today. It's not even across this island or these islands, it's across Europe and indeed global in terms of how um, gambling is approached here. And we need to look at that um, in a more um, consistent and coherent way. It's not a standalone clause, but it should be read against elements um, of putting new controls on the industry. In terms of the code of practice, it is enforceable and can um, impose 
a condition um, of the licensee in terms of complying with the code of practice. If they don't comply, they don't get their license. And I think that's an important point. They can also be charged quickly um, to respond to emerging problems. So the code of practice will be livable, that if new issues do arise, that they can be changed and the code of practice can be amended um, to meet those new and emerging needs. And of course, the codes are admissible as evidence in criminal or civil proceedings. So therefore, they are acceptable or valid as evidence in a court. As was said, workers' um, rights are protected in Clause 3. And in terms of bank savers' prize draws, that's covered within Clause 8. I know, and rightly so, I mean, I've touched on it a bit, that there has been a lot of talk in terms of the impacts on health and on harm. And of course, that is a close consideration. It's one of the areas, as part of the consultation, but listening to key stakeholders, um, that rightly comes up on a regular basis, and obviously through the engagement that we've done with the all-party um, groups. And again, I say that's why I am establishing the cross-departmental group, um, and that will be meeting shortly. And again, we can update members through the committee, this chamber, and in the all-party groups as to the progress of that cross-departmental group to look at the important issue. This bill is also introduces mandatory codes of practice in terms of health that has an enabling party introduce a levy, which is something that groups out on the ground have been asking for. And also, aside from this, in terms of some of the large gambling companies, um, they have given money in in terms of looking at health and harm reduction. My understanding is there's 100 million, up to 100 million available. And again, I've been encouraging the health officials within the health department to draw down as much of that money as they can to support organisations at the grassroots and to utilise that funding um, in terms of looking at issues around addiction and harm reductions as well. I know there's been some talk in terms of looking at what Britain are doing, what Westminster are bringing in, um, and unlike Britain, this bill doesn't have A, B or C has been quoted. But the existing legislation there is not working. Ministers themselves have said that it's not fit for purpose and that includes the regulator. So if I was to bring in or adopt what's being done there, by the time it comes through, it's already out of date. It's not working, and you would be even more criticised for it, for why did you rush through a bad piece of legislation? Then there are some practical, these matters are um, here under the, the jurisdiction of this assembly. So there is a political thing that you would need the permission of this assembly for those powers to go back to Westminster again as well. So it's not as easy as just saying, why aren't Westminster doing this? Why can't we fall under their regulatory system? But the big critical factor for me is, if it's not working, then why would we adopt a system that has been heavily criticised, even by its own ministers? So we do need to find a system that is robust, that is fit for purpose, and that will meet the needs of people here who need it. And that's something um, that I want to do. In terms of um, going forward, I mean, I know we are at the second stage, sorry, there had been some uh, issues raised around fixed odd betting terminals. And indeed, I am clear that based on the legal advice, fixed odd betting terminals already fall within the existing framework of the 1985 order. Um, in terms of the Supreme Court ruling, they ruled that fixed odd betting terminals fit within the, def the definition of gaming machines. And the legal advice says that that applies to here. In terms of the prize limits in the 85 order, they therefore apply to fixed odd betting terminals. And indeed, our legal limits here on stakes are the lowest of any other jurisdiction. In terms of just closing my closing remarks, many have made the assertion that this is a missed opportunity to regulate and, um, online and also with a regulator. And as I've said, to do this, it involves um, a more substantial piece of legislation. It actually involves a complete rewriting of the 1985 order. And as I say, that would move from 186 clauses that are in the current order to over 360 clauses with the initial assessment that we have been looking at. And there's just no time in this mandate. I have taken the view that we need to do something rather than doing nothing. 
and to extend protections and modernise in the time frame that we do have. As was said, I have been in post um, since January of last year, and despite the pandemic, I am the first minister to bring forward new gambling legislation in 35 years. I was five when the existing legislation was brought in. I want this bill to lay down a marker for the major reform in phase two, which will have over 360 clauses. And in terms of that, I know it was said that we needed to get it right. What we have in front of us um, is about giving additional protections. It's not everything, and I completely recognise that. But what's being proposed here is improving rules for society lotteries. It is banning the use of credit cards. It is including a mandatory code of practice, which will be admissible in court. It is um, introducing an enforceability of gambling contracts. It's introducing new offences, um, for example, of under 18s or in a premises, then that will create a new offence. And it's also introducing an enabling power to introduce a levy, something in which the stakeholders have been calling for. So this bill introduces all of these additional protections that we don't have now. And I think it's important that we don't wait to get it all right, to include it in a much uh, bigger piece of legislation, that we should be introducing these um, uh, protections now. And for that reason, I commend the bill to you for the Assembly approval. Members, the question is that the second stage of the bidding, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendment bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. That concludes the second stage of the bidding, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendment bill. The bill stands referred to the Committee for Communities. Thank you. Um, furthermore, I have received notification from members of the Business Committee of a motion to extend the sitting past 7 p.m. under Standing Order 10.3a. Clark, would you please read the motion? That, in accordance with Standing Order 10.3a, the sitting on Monday, the 27th of September 2021, be extended to no later than 11 p.m. I call Mr. Robbie Butler, Butler to formally move the motion. <laughs> move, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the motion standing in the name of the business committee be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Uh, contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The motion is carried and the assembly may sit until 11 pm this evening if necessary. And members now please take their ease as we move to the next item of business. Thank you.
Okay, members. The next item on the order paper is the second stage of the Climate Change Bill number uh, Ch Climate Change number two bill, and I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. I beg to move that the second stage of the Climate Change Bill number two be agreed. Thank you. And the second stage of the Climate Change number two bill has been moved. In accordance with convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limits on this debate. Members will be aware that a private member's bill on climate change is currently making its passage through the Assembly, while bills on similar topics in the same mandate is not unknown. This is the first time a bill with provisions which are mutually inconsistent to an existing bill has been introduced to the Assembly. Should the climate change number two bill pass second stage today, the issue of mutual inconsistencies will no doubt be a significant aspect of any debates at amending stages. Although this is a unique and challenging situation, which is far from ideal, there is no procedural impairment whatsoever which prevents two such bills from being considered by the Assembly and committees at the same time. Minister and Tyler bring forward legislation on their age within his remit as he sees fit. Each bill will be subject to the normal legislative processes and the procedures for timings and activities within each stage will not be affected by the existence of another bill. Members may decide to support the principles of one of these bills, neither of them, or indeed both of them, and should bear that in mind during today's debate. The committee approach to scrutiny of the bills is a matter for the committee, and any queries can be referred to them for consideration. Ultimately, the progress of both bills is in the hands of the Assembly, but for today the debate should focus on the principles of the Climate Change No. 2 Bill. And I call on the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to open the bill. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first, I'd like to thank my executive colleagues for their support in bringing this bill to the Assembly. And I look forward to working with members and the Area Committee in progressing it further. Climate change is an issue which affects everyone in Northern Ireland, indeed everyone on the planet, and it requires both a global and a local response. And as politicians, we have a duty to take to take action to mitigate the impact of climate change and to move towards a more sustainable, economic and environmental model where both can prosper. And since my appointment as Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in 2020, I have made climate change top priority in my department. And there may be some sitting in the chamber um, who would wish to contest that, but actions speak for themselves. From the outset, I have committed additional resources in my department to take forward work on climate change adoption. And mitigation and on preparations for COP26. I have prioritised the development of a cross-cutting green growth strategy which is being led by my department on behalf of the entire executive. And this strategy will map out the actions we must take to meet sector-specific greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, which will deliver a cleaner environment, more efficient uses of our resources within a circular economy and will provide more green jobs. I engaged with the UK Climate Change Committee within one month of taking office to start the process of identifying what would be appropriate in terms of long-term emission reduction targets for Northern Ireland, and as part of the process of developing legislation which would set out such targets, my department under undertook policy analysis work and issued a consultation on a potential Northern Ireland Climate Change Bill in December 2020. My officials have been working since then to analyse the responses to the consultation, agree the policy objectives and develop a draft bill. Bringing forward a cross-cutting executive bill on an issue of this importance in that timescale has been very challenging, but developing the right legislation is not something which can be rushed. I want to deliver on the commitments that the executive made in the new decade, new approach agreement, and the bill before you today will do so. The bill has a strong focus on greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and puts in place a legal framework for Northern Ireland policy makers and decision makers to build upon. The bill includes ambitious and challenging targets which have been recommended by the UK Climate Change Committee, a committee which is world-renowned, which is independent, statutory advisory body to the UK and devolved governments on climate change. The Climate Change Committee have been and are very demanding <coughs> of the UK government and will not be slow in criticising any lack of action on our part. They have also been clear that we must legislate for a credible, evidence-based target in Northern Ireland, and in their view, a net zero target cannot be credibly set for Northern Ireland at this time. I want to be clear with this. I would like to see Northern Ireland achieve a net zero emissions as soon as possible, through a balanced pathway and a just transition. 
However, the available evidence indicates that this will not be possible by 2015, never mind 2045. So my bill sets a target on at least 82% net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, with interim targets for 2030 and 2040. Crucially, however, the bill allows for those targets to be modified should updated advice recommend this, or if it is appropriate to do so as a result of scientific uh, or significant scientific, technological or legal developments relative to climate change. And I'm very hopeful that such developments will take place and that we will be in a position to make the target more ambitious in the future. The bill is therefore based on current evidence but is also future-proofed to allow us to react, which I hope will be to positive developments. I know there are members here today who have expressed concerns about the fact that there are two climate change bills passing through the Assembly at the same time, as it can cause confusion and has significant resource implications for the Euro Committee and the Assembly. And I recognise these concerns and have met with Claire Bailey as the lead sponsor of the Private Members Bill to discuss the matter. I then instructed my officials to work with Claire and her team on developing a compromise which would involve incorporating some elements from the Private Members Bill into the Executive Bill. The basis of a compromise has been agreed, and I have written to Claire seeking her agreement to the proposed way forward and await a response to this. And I am hopeful of a positive outcome and will update members as appropriate. However, I want to be clear that on the basis of current evidence, I cannot support and will not agree uh, to net zero target as it is aspirational and therefore not real at this time. And the purpose of today's debate is to focus purely on the principles of the bill which I introduced in July, and I will now turn to the detail of. The first part of the bill focuses on emission reduction targets. It then outlines how we will measure our emissions and provides important powers to bring forward future legislation covering a potential carbon accounting scheme and legislation on how emissions from international aviation and international shipping will contribute to our overall measurement of emissions. These are fundamental building blocks of effective climate change legislation. The responsibility for meeting the targets in the Bill is placed on all Northern Ireland departments. And these duties are further clarified in Part 5 of the Bill. And in my view, this approach is essential because all Northern Ireland departments can and must assist in efforts to tackle climate change. The transparent and clear approach is in contrast to the Private Members Bill on Climate Change, which places no duties on any department to take action to achieve this target within the Bill. Part 2 of the Bill covers carbon budgets. These which are an important tool on limiting emissions over a defined period in order to keep us on a pathway towards achieving the targets in the Bill. The approach adopted is in line with the UK approach, and the carbon budgets will be set on the basis of advice provided by the Climate Change Committee with the first period beginning in 2023. Part 3 of the Bill covers reporting requirements against targets and budgets set by or under the Bill. A key requirement on my department is in respect of the production of reports, setting out the proposals and policies for meeting the car carbon budget for each period. These reports will cover the areas falling under the responsibility of each Northern Ireland department, and all departments are required to provide the relevant input and support to assist in the development of the reports. The Bill requires interim reports to set out what progress has been made with the implementation of the proposals and policies. It requires final statements in respect of carbon budgets, including an assessment of the extent to which the proposals and policies for meeting the carbon, bud carbon budgets were implemented. This ensures a high level of scrutiny and assessment of progress through each carbon budget period. Where a carbon budget has not been met, a further report will be required to be led before the Assembly, setting out the proposals and policies to compensate for excess emissions. Further statements are required in respect of each of the emission reduction targets, and these statements must include the reasons why a target has or has not been met. The Bill also includes enabling powers to bring forward future legislation in respect of public duty, climate change reporting duties. This is important because all public bodies need to focus on how they can adapt to or mitigate the effects of climate change. Part 4 of the Bill covers reporting duties to be placed on the Climate Change Committee. I fully understand the importance of having robust independent scrutiny 
The Climate Change Committee are the independent experts on the assessment and scrutiny of the efforts and actions on climate change by the UK and devolved governments. They already have this statutory rule under the UK Climate Change Act 2008. My bill places further duties on them in relation to such actions being taken in Northern Ireland, and this, they will act as independent scrutinisers of progress being made to deliver on the bill's commitments. The approach to scrutiny in my bill mirrors the approach taken in the rest of the UK and indeed in the Republic of Ireland, where there is only one advisory body with a clear role. The Climate Change Committee will have to produce reports after each budgetary period, providing a scrutiny view on the actions taken to reduce the emissions in the period, as well as a scrutiny view on the progress being made towards meeting future carbon budgets and targets by Northern Ireland. The Committee will also have to produce reports after the interim emissions reductions target in 2030 and 2040 have passed. And in these reports, the Committee will have to provide their views on whether any future emission reduction targets uh, set the bill are the highest achievable targets for Northern Ireland, and if not, what the highest achievable targets would be and what further measurements will be required to meet such targets. The Climate Change Committee will also provide interim progress reports in respect of Northern Ireland climate change adaption plans. And adaption is an important part of climate action. My department will be required to prepare a response incorporating from input from other Northern Ireland departments to each of the reports produced by the Climate Change Committee. And all of these reports will be led in the Assembly, and in this regard, the Assembly is going to be kept well informed of progress being made to reduce emissions. I have purposely kept the Bill focused on elements that are essential for effective climate change legislation. The Bill does not specify that targets need to be put in place to address other environmental issues such as water quality or biodiversity, because there are other statutory drivers for this, and a number of strategies and plans in place to deliver in such areas. Moreover, the environment as a whole, and in particular, water quality, soil quality and biodiversity will benefit from the actions required to be delivered under this bill to meet carbon budgets and emission reduction targets. In addition, the Green Growth Strategy, which I hope to launch for consultation in the coming weeks, will be one of the key delivery mechanisms in terms of the bill's aims, and this will address how we plan to ensure just transition towards a low emission society. I want to focus again on the targets in this bill. It is vitally important that we include the right targets in our climate change legislation. The Climate Change Committee has identified that a net zero target for Northern Ireland would not be credible and that setting such a target would be morally wrong. As I previously highlighted to the Chamber, the additional cost of meeting a net zero by 2050 target compared to the, the target in my bill could be up to £900 million per annum on uh, the Climate Change Committee's estimates. Let me put that phenomenal cost into a clear context. By highlighting findings of the draft regulatory impact assessment carried out by my department, the indicative net cost of the executive bill's provisions between the years 2022 and 2050, including the at least net 82 emissions target reduction 2050 target, is estimated to be over £4 billion, or in yearly terms, an approximate £140 million cost per annum. In contrast, a similar bill with a net zero by 2050 target, a whole five years later than 2045, is predicted to be costed at a staggering £30 billion pounds plus between 2022 and 2050. This is an approximate annual cost of over £1 billion pounds per year. The budget of every Northern Ireland department, including health, would be affected by this, and it is an extraordinarily high price to pay to the public of Northern Ireland, especially as while it will decimate key parts of our economy, it will not actually reduce global emissions due to offshoring of our emissions elsewhere to meet food demand. Indeed, you may also have seen the recent independent report from KPMG on the impact of the 2045 net zero target in the private members' bill. And the findings in the report are shocking and will reaffirm the scientific evidence that I and the Climate Change Committee have put out in the public domain regarding the impact of the net zero target. The KPMG report has shown that there could be up to an 86 per cent reduction in cattle and sheep numbers, which would wipe out traditional grass-based farming family systems if net zero by 2045 was applied to Northern Ireland. I will. Thousands of jobs 
Uh, many thousands of jobs will be lost as a consequence and a huge loss in terms of our economic output. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister, are you aware that the KPMG report says that subsidies and grants were not included when calculating each farm's income? And given that the sector gets up to 86 per cent public subsidies, um, if I was to do an economic impact assessment of my household income, removing 86 per cent of my income, um, I'd have pretty damaging effects there as well. Well, I think it would have been uh, a brave consultancy organisation who would have predicted uh, that we're going to be receiving the same subsidies in 20 years that, that we are now. And essentially, um, what we do want to achieve is to make um, the producing of food a, a more profitable exercise, um, as well as one which creates massive employment across Northern Ireland. And in doing so, there are many things. Yes, I'll give away in a moment. There are many steps that we can take um, to ensure that farming responds um, to the needs around climate change, water quality and better environment in general. And in doing so, um, I would be very hopeful uh, that we can have them other products to sell, such as methane, such as phosphates um, and, uh, uh, and even ammonia. And in doing so, we can create a circumstance uh, where farming can become more profitable and indeed um, be better for the environment at the same time, Mr McGuigan. thank the Minister for giving way. And he has outlined uh, some potential costs to moving towards re reductions of greenhouse gases. But is he also uh, of the same view that he was in February uh, 21 in the foreword to his own uh, climate change discussion bill, where he said tackling climate change should be viewed not just as an environmental challenge but also an economic opportunity and that there are plenty of econo economic opportunities for businesses, agriculture and all sectors across the north? Yes, there, there certainly is economic opportunity uh, and I think particularly on hydrogen, um, given the fact that we have already achieved 45 per cent renewable energy and the opportunities that um, are open to us for further renewable energy, I believe Northern Ireland can lead the way on hydrogen. Um, I raised the issue again with uh, Quasi Quartang, um, uh, the, the, the UK Secretary of State, this afternoon. And, uh, I believe that there are tremendous opportunities that exist. And I believe that not just the farming community, the community in general um, are up for the challenges. Uh, but in order to meet those challenges, we don't close down um, farms here. We don't stop um, the, 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 those folks who are on the particularly the marginalised farms and the less favoured areas and the hill farmers, we don't stop them from uh, producing food. What still has to be produced because the consumption hasn't disappeared. But that food will be produced in summer which produces even more emissions and even more carbon. But you'll have um, taken that to somewhere else. So it may be good to solve it. Yeah, we'll give a moment. It may be good to solve the conscience, but it's not good for the economy nor is it good for the environment. And that's the challenge that, that faces you know, all of us uh, uh, and the folks on the other side of the chamber. We need to produce a, climate change, a piece of climate change legislation which takes account of where the reality is in Northern Ireland, the fact that we are a significant food producing region, and then how we can actually continue to produce large quantities of food because the population of the world is going to be rising and expected to put on another two billion by 2050. So we continue to produce good quality food, but we are do it in a way which has minimum impact upon the environment. Thank the minister for, for giving way. And no, he is very detailed in his analysis of per perceived uh, difficulties, problems, and costs with moving towards uh, uh, greenhouse gas reductions. But you know, is he equally as uh, Expert in terms of the potential benefits, I mean, because the, I mean, the CC have said you know, that uh, net zero can provide a significant economic boost in the coming years and support economic recovery. I've quoted what the minister said in his own uh, document. Uh, so, 
he, uh, you've also said we are therefore not able to precisely calculate the cost to the north in terms of reaching net zero. So, I mean, my question is, in terms of all the difficulties that you seem to be an expert at, you know, why would you not engage the same kind of expertise in trying to uh, produce the benefits economically, societally, and environmentally for moving towards net zero? Well, I am very grateful that the member has elevated me to an expert, and uh, I have to burst that bubble. I am not an expert. Um, but I do happen to listen to expert advice. And when we pay for expert advice and employ expert advice, I think we do well to pay attention to what the expert advice actually gives us. And the Climate Change Committee gave very powerful evidence um, to the executive on Thursday. And you know, people had the opportunity of posing questions to them. There was nothing, no questions asked that the Climate Change Committee did not effectively deal with. So uh, I would encourage others to engage, and indeed the Area Committee, to engage with the Climate Change Committee. And uh, the member will have the opportunity to speak to real experts, the scientists who are involved there. And I trust that he will give uh, respect to the science on this issue and will accept the science um, on the issue. Um, yes, I would like to get on with the, with the but, but go ahead. Yes, sir, thank you very much indeed. And quite interesting, you mentioned the uh, CCC's report. Would the Minister lay the report that he had in front of the Executive? Because I understand there was a considerable amount of information in that we have not seen yet. Could he lay that in the library? Because that might be useful for all members of the Assembly to see when we are making up our minds about this bill. I would be very happy to, and we will we'll clarify if everybody else is happy with that and, 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 and do that if, if that is the case, because the more things are in the open, I believe the better um, were possible. So, for Northern Ireland, um, to go back to where I was, for Northern Ireland to even reach on at least 82 per cent net emissions reduction target requires a percentage reduction greater than is required in the rest of the UK to reach net zero. So, by way of example, Scotland. Um, are almost halfway to net zero emissions, having a 45 per cent reduction at 2018, while Northern Ireland, unfortunately, is only a quarter of the way to reaching on at least 82 per cent reduction, because that has only achieved 20 per cent by 2018. So we're starting behind. We need to recognise that and reflect that. So an at least 82 per cent emissions reduction is in no way lacking ambition. We actually have to do a lot more uh, than others um, across the UK to do that. And I recognise that the ERA Committee will play a key role in scrutinising the bill, and I know that my officials have already been constructively engaging with the committee, and this engagement will increase going forward. I appreciate that at this stage in the mandate, the committee is under a lot of pressure to perform its crucial scrutiny role efficiently and effectively, but I know how important climate change is for the committee, and I look forward to further engagement during the committee stage. Both I and my officials will be happy to provide any support the committee needs as they conduct their business in respect of the Bill. In summary, I am hopeful that members sitting before me today will recognise that this Bill, the Executive Bill, will deliver on the New Decade New Approach Agreement commitments. It will help deliver net zero um, for the UK and across these islands. It will set Northern Ireland on a balanced pathway towards a sustainable, low-carbon economy in which key sectors can prosper and grow through a just transition. It is supported by the key sectors that will have the most important part to play in reducing our emissions and will help us to protect and support those sectors. It is based on the evidence and advice uh, from the experts and is an effective piece of legislation which places clear duties on all Northern Ireland departments and includes robust scrutiny and reporting requirements. As an executive and an assembly, we need to tackle climate change head on, and my bill is the right vehicle to do this. I beg to move. Thank you, Minister, for that introduction. And, uh, I now call the Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Declan McAleer. Um, I welcome the opportunity today to speak as Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs on the Climate Change Bill that has been introduced by the Minister. Climate change is one of the most profound challenges facing our society. In recent months, we have seen the devastating impact that global warming has caused to our natural environment, with intense flooding in Central Europe, unprecedented heat waves in Canada, and extensive wildfires in California. In August, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that progress to mitigate climate change has not gone far enough, as more than likely 
uh, the, 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 the nut that the Paris pledge to limit warming to less than 1.5 degrees centigrade by the middle of uh, the century will be missed. In advance, in advance of the COP26 conference being held in November, countries across the world are being asked to do more to meet the global challenge to reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions and change how we live, work and travel to be more environmentally friendly. It is our collective responsibility and we all have a duty to play our part. It is in that context that the Committee welcomes the introduction of the Climate Change Bill that is being sponsored by a Minister. Members will be aware that the Committee has engaged in extensive activities in recent weeks to gather evidence and information to help form its deliberations and scrutiny of the climate change legislation, and stands ready to accept the Minister's Bill for scrutiny. The Committee received a briefing from departmental officials in March of this year on the principles and policy aims of the intended Bill following completion of the Department's consultation. Members received a written briefing on the update of the progress of the Bill in May, and it was formally introduced to the Assembly on 5 July 2021. The Committee looks forward to hearing further oral evidence from the Department of Officials on the Bill on 14 October, should it pass today. The Bill has 41 clauses divided into five parts and seeks to provide a legal framework for climate change mitigation locally through the following aims. Setting targets for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions for 2030, 2040 and 2050. Establishing a system of carbon budgeting and independent reporting on attainment of these budgets. Providing for a duty to be applied to public bodies in respect of climate change reporting. Creation of a process to receive advice and independent reports from the UK Climate Change Committee on Climate Change. Part 1 of the Bill covers emission targets and outlines that local greenhouse gas emissions will be at least 80% lower from baseline levels by 2050. It also sets interim targets for 2030 and 2040. These targets are in line with advice provided to the Department and to the Committee from the UK CCC as to what is deemed to be currently achievable in relation to local greenhouse gas mitigation. Part 1 of the Bill also gives the Department the power to amend the emission target years and baselines, subject to certain justifications, and that any uh, proposed uh, change is in line with the CCC recommendations. Any change will have to be ratified by the Assembly. The Committee is acutely aware of the potential and profound implications for different sectors of the economy associated with any greenhouse gas emission target. We know that many stakeholders, and particularly representatives of the agri-food sector, welcome the advice and recommendations of the CCC in this regard, and that many others feel that, they, that we should be more ambitious and legislate for a net zero emissions position. This is a complex and very significant decision, and therefore it is only right and proper that the Committee has the adequate time and space to consider the implications in detail in order to come to an informed position on what the greenhouse emissions target should be and what flexibility should be afforded in respect of this. Part 2 of the Bill sets out proposals for the Department to establish carbon budgets that will set the maximum uh, permiss permissible greenhouse gas emissions on a five-yearly basis. The Committee understands that all local government departments will be jointly responsible for achieving the carbon budgets and providing the Department with information on the strategies and policies and policies that will be taken forward to achieve the emission limits. The process for developing, laying and reviewing carbon budgets is an essential component of the Bill, and the Committee looks forward to engaging with this in detail as part of a scrutiny should the Bill pass today. Part 3 establishes a mechanism for pro progress reporting and sets out a timetable of how frequently the Department will lay progress reports with the Assembly uh, that will document achievement of the carbon budgets and recommend measures to address non-compliance. The Committee is conscious of the need to ensure a robust accountability framework is in place to hold government to account for delivery against climate change and effective reporting is central to this. This has been a key message arising from the work of the Committee in recent weeks. That individuals and organisations want to be able to see clearly what progress has been made, what the direction of travel is and whether we are on course to meet targets. It is therefore very important that the Committee reviews the proposed reporting framework to ensure uh, that will facilitate transparency and accountability. Part 3 also confers the Department with the powers to impose climate change reporting duties on specific public bodies following consultation. This is an interesting aspect of the Bill and one which the Committee will consider carefully. In other jurisdictions such as Scotland, uh, climate change legislation places not a matter duty on public entities including departments, councils and arm's length bodies to report on their climate change mitigation and adaptation activities. The Committee has heard in recent weeks a strong message that members of the public and indeed public authorities are keen to see more responsibilities placed on local institutions with respect to their climate change actions. 
A crucial aspect of climate change legislation is how independent oversight and scrutiny of government action is catered for. This is essential in order to assure citizens and organisations that performance against emissions targets is being objectively assessed and that recommendations can be made from an independent entity to stimulate improvement. Part 4 of the Bill sets out that the UK CCC will be the primary responsible body for reporting on local progress in terms of meeting the climate change goals by sending reports to the Department following the completion of each carbon budget period and each of the interim target years. The Department will be compelled to lay with the Assembly a response to any CCC independent report. The proposed method of obtaining independent oversight on, uh, is one which the Committee intends to consider carefully as part of its scrutiny work. Whilst the UK CCC is to consider to be a world-leading and credible source of expertise in relation to climate change policy, there are, there are other organisations that could provide useful oversight and advice in respect of local uh, climate change action. There is also a need to consider the most appropriate mechanism for independent oversight, given the unique circumstances of sharing the same geographical landmass with a different jurisdiction that could have different policies in respect of climate change. Climate change does not recognise borders, and the Committee understands the importance of local organisations working with entities in other jurisdictions so that actions taken here accord with that of our neighbours. The Committee welcomes the proposal under Part 4 of the Bill that stipulates that the UK CCC will provide a report to DERA on its consideration of progress made and any relevant recommendations against uh, climate change adaptation programmes laid by Government Department with the Assembly under Section 60 of the Climate Change Act 2008. This should help to ensure greater oversight and independent accountability of such programmes introduced through this House. In summary, on the face of it, the Committee broadly welcomes and supports the principles of this Bill in relation to facilitating greenhouse gas reductions, introducing a system of progress, reporting on climate change and for the obtaining of independent advice and scrutiny on local measures. However, as is so often the case, the devil is in the detail, and therefore the Committee looks forward to the opportunity to consider these issues as part of a scrutiny should the Bill pass today, and to engaging with members of the public and organisations on these matters. Members be aware the Committee launched a public call for evidence in August in relation to this Bill. This was not undertaken to preempt the outcome of today's debate, but was simply a method of gaining views from stakeholders on the salient aspects and issues in the context of the Committee's a wider workload and for, uh, forward programme going forward. Members will also be aware that should the bill pass today, the committee will, will also be in a unique position of scrutinising two pieces of legislation that ostensibly covers the same policy area. I can assure the House that the, the committee is committed to addressing this potentially complex challenge and considering the bill before us today on its own individual merits and potential consequences. The scale of the climate change challenge is enormous and it affects us all. How we live, uh, work, travel and do everyday things will have to change if we are to mitigate against the harmful impact to our environment. Not only that, but we have a duty to younger and future generations to put in place the mechanisms to avoid further climate change damage and ensure that they do not have to deal with an even worse situation. This is why it is incredibly important that the Committee has the opportunity to scrutinise this bill and to ensure that climate change legislation that is brought forward is effective for our local public institutions, economy and society. With that being said, the committee therefore welcomes this bill and looks forward to its scrutiny should members pass it today. Gurmagat, thank you. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, can I say I very much welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate today. And again, I speak as someone who has a lifelong interest in agriculture. With that being said, obviously, I have great interest also in our environment. The bill before the House today is important for many reasons. In my opinion, not least because it represents a much more achievable and less destructive path to a reduction in emissions when compared and contrasted with the private members' bill, which has, by many accounts, been referred to as highly damaging uh, to what is one of Northern Ireland's mainstay industries. Whilst, of course, the bill tabled by the Minister and his department is by no means a walk in the park. It is crucially a bill tabled with important input and expertise across a range of areas, including department officials and the UK Climate Change Committee experts. I made many comments on this issue both in the committee and publicly. It remains the case that for any bill to succeed, it must be reasonable and reflective of the real facts around Northern Ireland's con contribution to global emissions. 
that contribution currently stands at 0.04%. To former representative organisations and bodies, the overwhelming view is a recognition that climate change is both real and present, a present challenge. However, they also believe that the bill represents the best way forward to tackle change locally when considered in the global context. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, this legislation is a huge challenge with a reduction of 82 per cent by 2050. It will require a significant effort across every sector of life in Northern Ireland and in all sectors of business across the transport, transportation sphere and in the home. The challenge is considerable and mu must crucially be viewed in the UK context and overall UK effort around the emissions targets. The Climate Change Committee has recognised this important issue and suggested the benchmark for Northern Ireland on a UK-wide basis and playing to strengths as a key part of this joined-up approach. There are major countries in the world today who account for a significant portion of global emissions, and we must be clear in our ambitions, but they are also realistic in terms of what we can actually achieve. As I have consistently argued, it would be foolish to impose legislation that creates a drastic downward trend in our domestic productivity and as a country, only for the demand to be met from countries with extremely poor records of emissions. Indeed, countries who are at this moment in time increasing their output of emissions as part of an expansive, deliberate economic dominion driven policy. For instance, China will not plan to reach their peak emissions until 2030, and they currently emit 27 per cent of global emissions. I personally resent the fact that we have two bills on the table and again urge the Green Party to get behind the Department efforts. I understand that discussions between the Department and the sponsor of the private member's bill is ongoing. It is important that a sensible outcome is arrived at. This is incumbent on all parties to recognise the support the Minister and the Department in their efforts. As has been said, the targets are a real challenge and will take a significant effort. It is vital that this House gets behind the efforts and embraces actions that are sustainable and achievable, and to do otherwise will only obliterate Northern Ireland's agri-food sector. The expertise of the Department's disposal through the Climate Change Committee will be vital on going forward. Going forward. And this legislation cannot be looked at, uh, at singularly. The efforts around a reduction in emissions is a UK-wide effort which Northern Ireland will play its full part. I think there is certainly merit in the Ministry setting up a forum of committee or committee facility to assist in transition, as I do feel there will be important work to be done in managing this course of action. Also, it will be vital to ensure our farming community and rural dwellers to be able to raise their views and concerns in these matters. I welcome the Minister's thoughts on this suggestion. I thank the Minister for, for his efforts around the huge, this huge issue and I will be interested to see the progress of this bill. And again, I urge the House to play its part in assisting in these efforts. I support the motion. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Irma, Patsy McDonough, I call Patsy McDonough. Uh, yeah. and, um, uh, indeed, uh, the SDLP welcomes the introduction of the second stage of the Minister's Bill, and I thank the Minister for that. Uh, we are behind the curve in legislating for our own responsibility on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is over 10 years since the UK Climate Change Act was introduced, and we still don't have any Northern Ireland specific climate legislation. It is over six years indeed since my party colleague in Foyle, when he was the Environment Minister, proposed a radical climate change climate action bill to pursue efforts to limit the average global, global uh, temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. With the addition of the Minister's Bill, we now have two climate change bills before the Assembly. Indeed, as member of the ERA Committee, I think I can safely promise the Assembly that we will be equally rigorous in our examination of both. That we have reached this point now is very timely, given the imminent 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. At the UN Assembly last week, many countries from across the world, including China and the US, announced renewed commitments and further investments towards meeting the aims of the Paris Agreement. The Climate Change Conference of the Parties may well re result in a new declaration that recommits governments to net zero emissions by 2050, as well as big reductions by 2030. 
There may also be specific pledges on ending coal, petrol cars and further uh, protections for the natural world. Developing countries will hope to see a significant financial package in the short term to help them too adapt to rising temperatures. That's something that's often left out of this debate in here. These measures are expected because mm -hmm. governments have woken up to the realisation of just how serious the global situation has become. They have been helped in that awakening by the effect of more people seeing the devastating impact of human-driven climate change on the environment, and by the efforts of a younger generation who are justifiably angry at the damage being done now to the world around them. There have been successful efforts to date in cutting emissions in some sectors, such as electricity generation, what have been described as the low-hanging fruit. But the most recent NI greenhouse gas inventory estimates for 2018 show only a 20% decrease in emissions compared to 1990. Current projections estimate that uh, that will be a 39% reduction by 2030. Agriculture remains the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions for Northern Ireland in 2018 at 27%. That share is expected to increase to 35% in 2030, a combination of the effect of improved performances of other sectors and only a 3% reduction in agricultural emissions. That isn't sustainable, whichever target this Assembly sets. Given where we are, it would be irresponsible for any member of this Assembly to suggest that any sector of our society will be able to carry on as they've been doing. To reach even the Minister's target will require support and incentives to ensure that the necessary changes are made to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture and other sectors. The aim must be to maintain the profitability of farms while encouraging the use of less environmentally damaging methods and practices. And that's where science does come into this. Also, at the committee ourselves, um, we have been discussing the efforts uh, that are the measures that could be introduced via transitional support. And indeed, I championed that committee that that was not just for farming, but some of the other subsidiary industries which are so dependent on farming. Indeed, they the whole link of industries, agri-food and other supply chains that are affected by it. That will include building social benefits into reduction efforts so that communities can see it working for them, bringing communities with us as we reduce greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, including energy, transport, business and agriculture is key. We will need to shape policy to meet targets set and put in place support and incentives to help all sectors, particularly agriculture and the agri-food sector, to make those changes. There will also need to be greater cooperation across the island of Ireland in areas where we have already agreed to work together. Even after Brexit, the agri-food industry continues to operate on an all-island basis. The latest figures on north-south trade show a 66% increase in trade coming north and a 146% increase going south in the first six months of this year compared to the same period in 2018. That increase in economic activity means more vehicles, obviously, on the roads. As we move away from petrol-driven vehicles, that will require investment, more investment, additional investment in the single, energy, a single electricity market to ensure the network can sustain the increased pressure with more charging points on all routes. On vehicles, roads and infrastructure, air and, quality, air and water quality, we need a harmony of standards to help drive those emissions down. The North-South Ministerial Council exists to facilitate that cooperation, which we will need. That's not questionable. It's a definite. We need that cooperation to see what we can do to make sure that we achieve those targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Sure. Yep. The member for giving way. And the member talks about cooperation, and certainly um, cooperation is, is key to all of this. I would agree with me that um, we also need internal cooperation so that when there are opportunities um, for renewable energy projects, um, then that we would be all trying to ensure that we would get those renewable energy projects over the line. And the benefits um, from renewable energy projects is that we in Northern Ireland um, can then go down the route of producing hydrogen. So the vehicles that you're talking about travelling between north and south can be vehicles travelling on a non-fossil fuel, uh, which is critically important. But if we're going to um, try to resist renewable energy projects, then it's going to be very hard to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, 
I hear some of what, what the Minister is saying, and um, I'm not too sure specifically what, what he's referring to. Um, there have been some contentious areas um, that just haven't fitted well uh, around local communities. And as I made the point earlier, we have to bring communities with us too, Minister. Um, but I do also welcome the fact that your department with the Department of Infrastructure has been carrying out some very useful collaborative work around all this. And um, I, I do know both ministers have, have been uh, working very positively on this too. Um, so passing legislation on climate change is only the first step. Uh, we have a long way to go and difficult decisions to take if we are to meet our obligations to the global commitment on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I guess Shane A. Kuramaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kuramaga, thank you. And I call Steve Bacon. Indeed, may I thank the Minister. And I uh, rise to say that the Ulster Unionist Party supports this Climate No. 2 Bill, as we also support the Climate No. 1 Bill. It is clear to our party, having taken a wide range of soundings, that there is a clear and necessary need for climate emergency legislation. Mr Speaker, Northern Ireland must not be the only part of our nation, or indeed across these islands and beyond, not to have specific legislation. We don't. We are way behind. Not to have legislation will impede our economy, prevent future-proofing of our planning and strategic development, and will considerably undermine our people as they deal with the existential threat posed by the climate emergency. Doing nothing is not an option. Denying the climate emergency is not an option. Somehow discounting the science and scientific advice is not an option. Creating an effective legislative framework with realistic and achievable targets, backed up by an independent commissioner with the necessary ability to oversee and shape our responses, is the only option. We believe, and I will say this now, that both the Minister in bringing this bill and Ms Claire Bailey in her bill, for which we are co-sponsors, need to work together to merge their bills to achieve what we believe are the following goals. Goals that we as a party will seek by adding amendments to both bills if the bill sponsors cannot come together to agreement and see the practicalities of combining their efforts, which I think many in this House would like to see happen. First, there has to be a clear and unambiguous statement that there is a climate emergency and that our executive and its departments will use the best peer-reviewed scientific advice to deliver solutions to adapt and mitigate against the very real challenges we have ahead. Second, we must have an independent climate emergency commissioner with responsibility for monitoring the climate action plans, reviewing the implementation of the bill and making recommendations to the executive. The Executive Office must be mandated to address the issues that are raised by the Commissioner. It must be an all-executive responsibility. Thirdly, in reporting against targets, we must have independent verification in order for trust to be built up in the delivery of measures to ameliorate CO2, methane and other activities contributing to the rising temperature. This can only be achieved by the establishment of an independent climate commissioner and monitoring organisation, ideas that I would encourage the Minister to take from the number one bill and incorporate in his own if he and Ms Bailey will not reach an accommodation, which we would encourage them to do. Finally, we have the vexed issue of targets for greenhouse gas emissions that are achievable without undermining critical sectors of our economy. Northern Ireland is a significant next exporter of agri-food products, with nearly 50 per cent of all our agri-food products produced in Northern Ireland consumed in the rest of the UK. This is not going to change. The Independent Climate Change Commission has said that for the UK to reach net zero target, a fair contribution from Northern Ireland would be an 82 per cent reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050 compared to the 1990 levels. The Ulster Unionist Party welcomes this intervention from the Independent Committee and has accepted its recommendation and will target an 82 per cent or better reduction in greenhouse gases for Northern Ireland as part of the ongoing Climate Action Plan. Adding these amendments to both the No. 1 and No. 2 Bill will both bring them into alignment but, more importantly, actually begin to deliver what is required. However, finally, 
We hope that rather than progressing with two bills, we can merge them to make an effective, durable and practical piece of legislation. I think that is what this Assembly wishes. I think that is what the people of Northern Ireland want. And I believe, given the good will of the Minister and indeed with Claire, I think it is something that is very achievable. And we in the Ulster Unionist Party will do our best endeavours to make that happen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I start by saying that I share with many others the frustration that the incredible delay in progressing vital legislation on climate action, the point has been made before here, including by myself, but it's worth repeating, that the crisis is no longer a looming threat, Mr. Speaker. It's here and it's happening now. Yet we prevaricate and the refusal to act at the pace the science demands is, quite frankly, deadly. We have learned many lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, but a stressing lesson has been that high-impact threats must be acted upon in a timely fashion, and that delay is costly. We need a green recovery with huge investment and urgent radical changes to our economy. This radical change is not just sensible, it is now critical. As the only jurisdiction within the UK and Ireland without an independent environmental protection agency, a climate change act or a specific net zero emissions target, Northern Ireland is in urgent need of policies that will address the climate emergency and economic and social transformation. I will, Mr Speaker, focus my comments on the legal frameworks for environmental government within the departmental bill. My colleague Kelly Armstrong, I understand, will pick up some other points on behalf of Alliance later in the debate. I will start with um, drawing attention to the fact that our exit from the EU and subsequent legislative uh, reassessment and realignment, which will have substantial implications for climate action in Northern Ireland. The Department's bill, I have to say, goes some way towards addressing the governance gaps that Brexit has exposed. However, in its current state, it does not offer the same level of protection and accountability as the European courts did, and as a result, there is a greater ongoing requirement for Northern Ireland to remain aligned to previous EU standards. And I were told, I said this last week as well, that we can do better, and we're going to do better. Well, I hope we do, and I, with my colleagues, am ready to support the doing better when we see it coming forward. In the absence, Mr Speaker, of that independent Environmental Protection Agency, an outstanding, as we know, new decade and new approach commitment, or an Office of Environmental Protection based in Northern Ireland, it is necessary to incorporate a mechanism to independently scrutinise progress on delivering the provisions of such an Act. Unlike the Private Members Bill, of which I am a co-sponsor, the Departmental Bill does not make provisions for such an independent oversight body. The Private Members Bill establishes a climate change commissioner whose duties would involve holding the executive and the Northern Ireland departments to account in relation to, to their duties. However, governance needs to be considered separately from policy. It should go without saying that independence in holding the executive to account on climate action is critical, but that is not the case. It appears it still, still does need to be said. The new powers under the proposed legislation appear to have the effect of allocating the dear Minister and indeed the deferent Minister a uh, central role in shaping guidelines administered by the oversight body, therefore constraining the role, I would suggest, of the OEP and its ability to act totally independently. As we seek, Mr Speaker, to recover from COVID-19, I hope that all departments and sectors work together to protect the environment as well as existing jobs and bringing forward new green jobs. Alliance is committed to a green and just recovery and an urgent and radical overhaul of the policies and practices which have hindered our progress to date. On behalf of Alliance, I do, however, pledge support to the Department's bill at this stage in the hope that sufficient consideration can be given to and progress made on points raised today to ensure support at future stages. These are urgent matters, Mr Speaker and they must be addressed for the good of our people and our future, and I hope that the Minister can address some of the concerns. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Anya Morphe. I welcome the opportunity to speak on this debate this evening. If we are to tackle the climate, sorry, if we are to tackle the climate change effectively, it requires clear, decisive legislation. Even the CCC admitted that the advantage of a net zero target was that it removed uncertainty and the temptation of sectors to lobby for a larger share of the remaining 18% of emissions. They stated 
The clarity of a net zero goal, coupled with good policy design, could help stimulate innovation across all sectors and cut the cost of capital, thereby bringing down the overall cost of mitigation. Following on from the recent IPCC and CCRA reports on climate change, it is quite clear that now is not the time for half measures or piecemeal approaches. That is why I and my colleagues have been working on a number of environmental PMBs that will make quick and practical differences to our environment. In particular, I have been working on the Fracking Prohibition Bill, which will outlaw fracking in the north and, as a result of similar legislation in the south, right across the country. Fracking is a profoundly dangerous practice that presents a threat to both the health of the environment and the general population. Nobody in my constituency where the fear of fracking is perhaps more greatly felt than elsewhere would appreciate legislation offering an 82 per cent reduction in the practice. Nobody wants to deal with 18 per cent of the effects it produces, which is why my private member's bill will outlaw this practice entirely. Similarly, climate change presents an absolute threat to the planet, and we must address it absolutely. Net zero should be the minimum any climate legislation aims for. Gormaghat. thank you. Uh, I call Harry Harvey. Much, <coughs> Mr. Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to speak on the second reading of the Climate Bill today. I think we're all aware of the need to legislatively address the issue of climate change and in so doing ensure that this part of the United Kingdom plays its role in reducing emissions. I'm a firm believer that as custodians of our planet, we all have a moral and civic responsibility to care for the environment and do all we can to create safer and healthier spaces in which to live and enjoy. As I said, as I and others have previously outlined in this House, tackling climate change as a commitment of the NDNA agreement, as such I am pleased to see Minister Putz bringing this legislation forward. I look forward to the engagement at committee stage on the finer detail, but in the meantime, as the Bill commences its passage through the House, I want to make a number of general points. I believe that the most fundamental issue as we consider this Bill is that of striking the correct balance, the need for legislation on environmental targets that is ambitious on the one hand, but does not require us to bankrupt our business at the same time. We have been warned by many sectors, including manufacturing and I, to strike the right balance and not destroy jobs. I believe it is imperative this is to the forefront of our deliberations. It goes without saying, Mr Speaker, that our efforts on this issue will have greatest impact upon our agricultural community. If this legislation is to be of any success in the years to come, it is vital that they have ownership of it and we work collectively to see progress made. It is worth remembering that our agri-food sector represents $5.2 billion a year to the local economy and provides employment of around 113,000. There is often a tendency to pit the farming community against progress in climate change. This is a narrative that I believe needs to be challenged. In my engagement with farmers, it has been evident to me that there are few sectors more clued in to the need to tackle climate change. Farming is on the front line of its impact. It is particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events which directly hamper business. The sector has, of course, already been engaged in efforts to combat greenhouse gas emissions since 2008 through the implementation of the Greenhouse Gas Programme. In 2019, the UK Government put us on the front foot as the first major economy to have a net zero target in law, the only country in the world to have developed a pathway to net zero. With professional support of the UK Climate Change Committee, I believe we are in a good position to do our bit. The Paris Agreement set ambitious targets, but also recognised the importance of safeguarding food security. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the importance of local food supplies, and we must ensure these are protected. 
while Northern Ireland must reduce its impact on the climate, we should not reduce our capacity to produce high quality, affordable food to high environmental and animal health and welfare standards. We must ensure we reduce our local greenhouse gas emissions, not merely export our problem to some other country through carbon leakage. If we set unachievable, tar set unachievable targets and time frames, we will only move the problem elsewhere. If all we achieve is carbon linkage, we will have achieved nothing. The target of 82% by 2050 for Northern Ireland is ambitious, so much so that it asks more of our farmers and of this region than we are asking of the rest of the UK, or that is being asked by our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. Lord Devon of the UK Climate Change Committee recently gave evidence to the DERA Committee, and evidence he stated that a target any higher would, be not, would not be achievable, that it was not scientifically possible and would be morally wrong. And I agree with that position. As such, I believe this bill is best placed to address climate change in an ambitious yet realistic manner. Various elements of the bill will need consideration, such as the accountability mechanisms outlined and whether these can be bolstered. However, following wide consultation, input from the UK CCC and other devolved governments, I am content that the key elements of the bill are well grounded. Mr Speaker, the bill has my support and I thank you. Thank you. And I call John O'Dowd. Uh, I can call you. Um, I have sat and listened with interest to the debate, though I, I suspect when the general public listen into some of these debates, the acronyms and, and the terminology can be quite confusing for people. All of a sudden, everyone has to turn into a climate scientist, an expert, an expert in carbon and carbon linkage and all those terminologies that are flowing around. And is it any wonder those who are at the centre of the debate often, the farming community, are scratching their heads saying, how can we deal with all this? Or how or why should this all be our responsibility? And I think there they have a fair argument to make. But within the terminology and the accusations back and forth and the, the, the scientific reports, the reality is this. Um, we have only one planet. And we have two climate change bills in front of us and two very important questions to answer. How do we arrest climate change and how do we support and protect our farming and rural communities? That is the real questions at stake in my mind today. And a farmer rearing a few head of cattle in my constituency or rearing a few sheep up the spurns will be quite understandably ask themselves the question, how is our actions responsible for climate change or the detriment to uh, the climate. But urban dwellers have responsibilities in this as well, in terms of our consumption of goods, in terms of how we go about our daily lives as well. So I, I too be out and about talking to, to farmers. I too be out and about talking to concerned citizens. And I haven't met a farmer yet who isn't concerned about the climate and about climate change. I have met many farmers who have questions to ask about the bill before us today and, and, and subsequent bills. But there is a mistrust in all of this. And I think where that comes from is the fact that, uh, and I do not want to personalise this around the Minister, but the Minister's record on environmental protection in terms of what international standards are is not a good one. I'm not saying the Minister doesn't care about the environment or the climate, but he has a different view on it than many, many uh, leading experts in this have around the world and around the globe. Now, he's going to quote back to the other experts. It's, it's, like that, it's, it's almost like the COVID debate. You have experts coming back and forth at you. But there is a, a, a recognition that unless we reach net zero within a time frame acceptable, then we are in for a climate disaster, a disaster which has already been faced by many parts of the world. You know, we're talking about the impact of climate change. Many, many parts of the world are already experiencing this. So the question for you, Minister, is this. Are you serious about protecting the climate? 
because thus far you haven't lived up to your obligations under the NDLA in terms of independent environmental protection. We've heard you and several of your other colleagues down through the years in this chamber resisting independent environmental protection. So the question that needs to be satisfied, Minister, is are you serious about playing your part in climate change, not using the farming community as a battering ram against climate change, because I don't believe that's where the farming community want to be. I, I, I believe that the farming community, like urban dwellers, understand they have a significant role to play in tackling climate change. I will certainly. I thank the member uh, for giving way and, and allowed him to develop that as opposed to challenging him immediately because I'm not that easily offended, so, so don't worry about it, uh, uh, Mr O'Dowd. Um, but in respect of that, I, I was previously an environment minister, and during that time I faced the challenge of what I was going to do about renewable energy and put forward proposals for um, dealing with that, which enabled us to achieve 45% renewable energy by 2020, which left you know, Britain trailing behind. It has not reached its 20 per cent target. I also set a target at that time, which was told was too high, which was 50 per cent for recycling. And that was for, for 2020. And when I came back into office, we achieved that. I set new targets for recycling, uh, which I believe, again, we will achieve. But in all of these things, we need to study the science and then set targets which are achievable. And indeed, if we find that we are over delivering or not, then we will up those targets to ensure that we maximise what we have. But to set a target which is not achievable is an aspiration. And the member for Fermanagh South Tyrone um, spoke uh, uh, and indicated that we needed to achieve uh, net zero. Well, net zero in Fermanagh South Tyrone, uh, where there would be a lot of sheep farmers, for example, would lead to a 60 per cent reduction in the keeping of sheep. It would lead to a 98 per cent reduction in LFA farms, from 115,137 to 348. Now, I assume that whenever the member goes round, because Fermanagh South Tyrone, Mid Ulster, and Newry Moore and Down account for 43% of less favoured area farms. I assume whenever she goes around canvassing uh, in April next year, she won't be telling those farmers it is her desire to put them out of business. But that's the reality that we're talking about here. So it's not me that's using the farmers as a battering ram. Others are imposing a battering ram on the farmers. I thank the Minister for letting me back into my speech. Uh, <laughs> but See, this is where it comes down to, Minister, in terms of setting targets which are achievable. Uh, and the private members' bill, sponsored by Claire Bailey and my colleague is involved in as well, has set ambitious targets which uh, is achievable. The question, and I, well, I'll move on because what you've mentioned is renewable energy. Uh, and tomorrow I have a renewable energy bill coming through the Assembly because one of the things that has been noted, particularly in small scale, renewable energy, that small scale renewable energy which helps farmers and rural communities to be sustainable has ground to a halt and there needs to be legislative intervention there which is as much about renewable energy as it is about climate change just as my colleague's bill in relation to banning fracking is about ending that practice but also protecting uh, the, the environment and protecting the climate. So while there needs to be quite clearly an overarching climate change bill with achievable targets, which arrests climate change, which protects the farming and rural community. There needs to be other pieces of legislation brought before the floor of this House and supported as well. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, and I call it Mark Durgan. Uh, the urgent need for a climate change bill has been well established. The extensive body of research demands that we act immediately, globally, locally and as individuals, in response to this emergency. Climate change is arguably the most serious threat that we face, not just to the environment, but to our health, economic security 
and uh, global security. The overwhelming scientific consensus points to the fact that the impacts of climate change are accelerating and they are largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions as a result of human activity. If we are to combat the devastating impact of climate change, then we have a responsibility to act. We owe to ourselves and especially to future generations to face up to this uncomfortable reality. No longer can it be swept under a carpet or buried in a hole in the ground to be dealt with at a later date. It remains a blot on our collective record that specific legislation on the prevention of climate breakdown through emissions reduction targets, working towards carbon neutrality, or preparing industry for tomorrow's economy has taken so long to implement. While the COVID pandemic has maybe played some part in the delay to implement climate change legislation here, the collapse of the Assembly and the shameful three-year stalemate has left Northern Ireland lagging even further behind on the single biggest issue facing this executive and beyond. However, I do appreciate that steps are being taken now to rectify that. As the old adage goes, you wait ages for a bus and then two come along at once. What we need to be make, or make sure of is that we get on the right one, the one that's going to take us where we need to go. What we can't afford to do is, is diller about and they end up missing both, nor do we want a collision between the two. So very much in the spirit of this legislation and maybe echoing some of the sentiment of the member uh, opposite, I think we should be at least exploring vehicle sharing options in order to improve efficiency. As such, in discussing this bill brought forward by Minister Poots, we can't neglect to mention the private member's bill that I have already referred to currently progressing through the Assembly, which, although it shares a similar aim, I would argue is much more robust than the legislation laid before us today. Minister Poots has outlined his commitment to tackling climate change and uh, laid out some very positive actions that he has taken in his role as Minister. I think that is to be acknowledged and welcomed. He outlined the complexity of legislating on this issue. That is something I, I do not doubt for a second. And I do wonder if that complexity has been compounded by the establishment of DERA and the amalgamation of the Department with Responsibility for Environmental Protection with the Department with Responsibility uh, for Agriculture. But we are where we are. In our view, the bill as it stands does lack ambition. It is remarkable in some ways for what it fails to include rather than what it does. Put simply, it falls a bit short. It is not as radical as it needs to be, nor does it treat climate change with the urgency required. Since we last debated this issue in the Chamber, the situation has deteriorated even further. As per the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report, with the UN General Secretary calling it a code red for humanity. How many more wake-up calls will it take? We, we can't continue to push the snooze button on climate emergency. Yeah. Well, as a former Environment Minister, I appreciate his thoughts on, on the issue. And I do recall that, as Minister, um, uh, m m Mr Durkin brought in uh, the single-use plastic bag levy uh, at that time. And that was a far-reaching piece of legislation. I congratulate him uh, on bringing that in. However, currently, I'm looking at that particular piece of legislation to amend it now and to make it tougher. And because we have done it and we have demonstrated what's achievable, and we can take a further step. And very much in this climate change, it is better to set out something which is achievable. And in five, ten, fifteen years' time. If we discover actually we can achieve much more, then we are standing ready and willing to do that. And his action in bringing forward that piece of legislation and my action on actually improving upon that, having the benefit of hindsight all of those years later, is a demonstration of what we can also do in this bill. Uh, thank the Minister for his intervention, and I do not doubt the benefits of an incremental approach to, to, to issues uh, where necessary. 
he does give me more credit than I deserve. It was actually my uh, predecessor in the ministerial role, my party colleague Alex Atwood, who did all the heavy lifting. I came along with time to get the, the headlines. I look forward to seeing the Minister's pr proposals in terms of strengthening the single-use carrier bag levy and hope to see uh, something forthcoming from him on a bottle deposit return scheme as well. I should mention that Dahi Mackay initially introduced it into private members' business. <laughs> yes, I'll give way. I'm kind of a mind reader, but just, it's worth noting that there was opposition to the plastic bag levy in this chamber for a variety of reasons. I think some of the, colleague, the Minister's colleagues were in opposition to it at the start. So it shows when you take a bold move that you can progress legislation and make change when necessary. I thank the member for his intervention, and I'm fairly sure his former colleague, Mr Mackay, will be watching with interest today in his new role. This bill, in our view's most significant shortcoming, is the absence of a net zero target for the North. Scientific evidence makes it clear that Northern Ireland needs to meet net zero carbon emissions by 2045. To deviate from that policy could see the North, or would see the North, North at odds with the direction of travel being pursued elsewhere. We can't accept anything less than net zero. What we have here is a dilution of that target. It's a bit of a hokey-cokey piece of legislation, if you will, half in and half out. As such, we do have significant concerns also about clauses four and five, which will give powers to the department to change emission target, targets, years and baselines. To do so not only could make for a weaker piece of work, but also adds another layer of confusion that we can't afford when there's already so much confusion out there, particularly in some sectors, on such a vitally important matter. The vision of net zero emissions can only be achieved through collaborative working, declaring a climate emergency and establishing a mandate for climate change mitigation and adaptation. The role of a Northern Ireland climate officer and Climate Commissioner as overseers will be integral in accomplishing those goals. This is a necessary incorporation to any climate legislation, and it's crucial that any mechanism of scrutiny is independent. I agree that these targets that I've referred to are ambitious, but they're ambitious because they need to be. For too long, the executive has sat on its hands when it comes to legislation on climate change, and I say that as a former minister, not to mention the three years of complete inaction that we all suffered collectively here across the North, to the, the detriment of both denizens and climate. The Dillerand delay means that Northern Ireland remains the only jurisdiction within these islands without greenhouse gas reduction targets enshrined in law. The focus on green recovery and the creation of a sustainable society is of even greater significance as we emerge from the fog of COVID. If we have learned anything from this horrific year, it is that we must do things differently. The pandemic has served as a reminder of the delicate and unpredictable balance between humans and the natural world. It has also given many the opportunity to reconnect with our natural environment and realise the importance of protecting it. We now need to witness a sea change in behaviours within the powers that be. I must at this point pay tribute to the Climate Change Coalition of Northern Ireland and the many groups and individuals out there who have not let up in, in that regard. They have been an invaluable resource who have worked tirelessly in their mission to put climate action firmly on the agenda. I can't pretend, however, that, and it has become obvious this afternoon, that there is consensus or has been consensus on this issue. Reservations and, in some cases, outright opposition about the targets set out in the the PMB climate change bill from certain quarters in industry and agriculture, and opposition from environmentalists to this bill based on its perceived lack of ambition. Any climate change bill must focus on working with, not against, the agri sector to ensure it is supported and to enable them to establish sustainable practices, such as incentivising farmers to sequester more carbon in their land as we move forward together. We have moved, or are at least are moving, beyond the old world view that environmental requirements must constrain economic performance and productivity. It is possible to create 
a better environment and a stronger economy, a sentiment shared by Mr Poots, as Mr McGuigan reminded us, who is on record as affirming that environmental challenges present economic opportunities. Climate change will affect all sectors, not just agriculture. The possibilities that enacting climate action legislation can bring should be embraced rather than seen as something just negative. It is undoubtedly a vehicle for prosperity and should be grasped with both hands. But regardless of economic losses or gains, tackling climate change and hitting net zero carbon targets can no longer be put off. Delivering a real, tangible change requires difficult conversations and very difficult decisions. The alternative, that of inaction by the Assembly here and now, doesn't bear thinking about. The climate crisis has and is causing devastation to people and communities across the world. The language being used by climate experts leaves no room for ambiguity. As already referred to, we are looking at a code red humanity. The inclusion of a just transition set out in law is a necessity, not a pipe dream. The Minister's Bill and its silence on this key component is as conspicuous as it is disappointing. We need to set out a framework for net zero carbon investment, create work which is fair, sustainable and reduce inequality as far as possible. We live in an interconnected climate where an ecological emergency has been driven by human activities. Therefore, ambitious action is critical. How we live our lives is placing pressure on biodiversity. We must learn to do things differently and to do better. The Bill neglects, in our view, to place sufficient attention on nature, nature-based solutions or biodiversity. It must be strengthened in that regard. The Climate Coalition points to the Scottish Climate Change Act as an example of good practice, which establishes a duty on ministers when setting targets with regards to environmental impacts, particularly on biodiversity. Legislation here should mirror that approach, given our similar geographical makeup. Looking toward a greener future is not about restricting certain sectors, but rather maximising opportunities. We can't afford to do the bare minimum when it comes to a matter which will define not just this executive, but this generation. Failure to act now will have severe repercussions, so we're glad that we've got two acts, but we have to act to ensure that we get a good act. There is no planet B. Commitment to advancing this legislation is an important cornerstone of the new decade, new approach agreement. I'm glad to see that that seems to be uh, being addressed now, because for a while there, there was a suspicion that there was some backpedalling on that. But we can't afford a piecemeal approach, because the time for climate justice is now. In conclusion, we do support the sentiments and broad principles of this bill, but would very much like to see action taken and amendments made to see it strengthened significantly. I look forward to the progress of this bill, and we certainly won't be obstructing its passage. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity this evening to speak to this climate bill number two. The second of two climate bills at the moment that's making their way through the legislative process here in the Assembly. It is both recognised and accepted that Northern Ireland is not immune to the climate emergency that is trundling towards us very, very quickly. And after years of no climate change legislation, work must proceed towards addressing this climate change emergency with haste. Doing nothing is not an option. Both bills have set targets and carbon budgets with the aim of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. One of the major differences is that number one bill includes a net zero target for Northern Ireland by 2050, while bill two includes emission targets for 2030, 2040 and 2050, with a 48, 69 and at least 82 per cent reduction in greenhouse gases. These targets in Climate Bill 2 
are based on advice provided by the UK Committee on the Climate Change and are considered fair and equitable for the different government departments. It is acknowledged that the agricultural and food sector to achieve the required targets, along with many aspects of infrastructure and plans to improve housing standards and waste management, will have considerable challenges along the way. As the years progress, with, techno with technological advances being introduced, together with support from scientific evidence, DERA, if the need arises, will have the opportunity opportunity to change the targets for emissions and introduce newer, more ambitious ones through regulations that must be approved by the Assembly. To meet the targets set, this Assembly must be prepared to carry out economic appraisals around the potential cost of this climate bill and support those whom it will have, great, whom will have greater economic challenge to reach these targets. With reference specifically to the agricultural economy, the agricultural targets are based on the CCC modelling changes in, in consumption patterns, resulting in lower demand and the introduction of low carbon farming practices, including changes to the diets of animals, increased use of anaerobic digestion, and a move to low carbon fuels in machinery. There is also recognition of the higher environmental, animal health and welfare standards of the locally produced meat and dairy products. There is further recognition that Northern Ireland should continue to fulfil the demand there is in Great Britain for Northern Ireland based products. It will be expected that nearly 46% of land will have to be freed up through changes in output and more efficient farming methods. Land may have to be released for forestry, restored peatlands and energy crops. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important that targets are realistically realistic and achievable. We all accept the need to reduce carbon emissions, but this must be put in context. Northern Ireland produces 0.0 4% of the global emissions, whereby China is responsible for 27% of the world emission, and they continue to build more coal-fired power stations in a bid to meet their own internal demand, while Brazil has significant plans to increase their cattle production by millions. Isn't it ironic that Brazil is potentially a country that Northern Ireland could import food from if our own production doesn't meet demand due to the impact of the climate legislation? This coupled with the added food miles that it would take to bring the food to Northern Ireland would certainly not be doing anything positive for the global climate change. However, let's not, let's not put the climate emergency all down to agriculture they are the agri-economy businesses. Of course, the questions must be asked as to what we as members of the community and public are going to do to improve climate change. It is estimated that in Northern Ireland, water consumption is an average of 145 litres per day per person. For 1.5 million people, that is water consumption of 217.5 million litres of water used in Northern Ireland per day. This is an enormous figure. Can we as individuals reduce that daily, daily usage? Can we reduce the usage of energy like electricity, gas, oil and other energy sources? In conclusion, after years of new climate legislation, we now have two bills to consider. While the UUP will also be supporting climate change number two bill, it is imperative that the best advice and evidence is taken to inform decisions and in due course appropriate amendments will be presented. As scientific data and evidence emerges, it must be more desirable to work towards a single climate change bill that would be an acceptable piece of legislation for all. 
I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, uh, last can call you. Uh, I'm conscious, uh, as, as I was listening to everybody else, I, I think this is the, maybe the fifth debate on uh, climate change that I've participated in since uh, we resumed the Assembly. I'm ob obviously also conscious that it probably took the previous four debates to bring the Minister to the position where he, he has brought brought uh, forward this legislation. So, I mean, I just want to pay tribute to uh, the, the activists, uh, particularly the young people and Climate Coalition, who have kept this issue in the headlines and, and have forced the position where we now have two bills before the House. Uh, I, I should say, I, I was going to interject when you, you and, and Mark H were having the discussion about the plastic bag levy, that the Minister will be aware that I have my own private members bill on single-use plastics. Given that I sit in the, in the era committee and we currently have two climate bills as well as other, other legislation, I'm not a glory hunter. If the Minister wants to interject to tell me that he will introduce the merits of the single-use plastics before the end of, of this mandate, I will certainly give way to allow him to do that. Uh, to respond to that, we have a, a series of things on single-use plastics, and uh, it, it, it is my desire, certainly within uh, government circles, to, to, to lead the, the way on that and demonstrate that we can remove single-use plastics from the government the state, and we need to pursue that agenda. And I'm fully supportive of, of any efforts uh, that any other member wishes to bring to the table uh, on reducing single-use plastics in an area that we really need to move on. I mean, the Minister will be aware that uh, prior to being taken out of uh, the EU against their will, uh, you know, we would have been included in the EU single-use plastics directives. That, that's the kind of ambition with regard to that legislation that, that I would like to see uh, brought forward. Anyway, in 2016, 197 countries signed the Paris Agreement. Uh, agreeing to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and to reach net zero uh, emissions by 2050. In August 2021, just a few months ago, the IPCC, and I'm conscious that my colleague uh, did raise the issue of using acronyms <laughs> uh, it's, it, on this subject, it's, it's very difficult not to. Uh, so the IPCC released their sixth assessment report and revealed that we are already on track to miss that target in relation to Paris. The 234 scientists from the 66 countries who compiled that report uh, from more than 14,000 scientific papers were unanimous in their assessment that the world's governments are not doing enough and not doing it fast enough. I am conscious, and if, if I'm wrong, uh, I, I will stand corrected, but you know, it, it is striking that given the seriousness of that report a number of months ago, that the minister uh, in, in this jurisdiction responsible for the environment, as far as I'm aware, hasn't made any comment about that very serious uh, report, which I, I, I think uh, he certainly should have done. At our present rate of emissions, you know, we will reach 1.5 degree global temperature increases by 2040. That's the trajectory we are on. Uh, as has been said on numerous occasions in this uh, chamber, that will have catastrophic consequences for the planet. Floods, fires, droughts uh, and extreme weather will all become more prevalent. Uh, as somebody else has said, you know, the UN Secretary has described it as a code red for humanity. And you know, that isn't a, a uh, just a worry for some far off distant land. You know, it is a worry for people, uh, businesses, groups and organisations who live here in the north. It should be a worry for all of us because its impact are going to be felt here. Uh, in June of this year, the third climate change risk assessment report was released. You know, it did identify 61 threats specifically to the north caused by climate change. More than half were categorised as being in the most immediate level of urgency, while all but 11 have increased in urgency since the last report. And when that, this, this is things uh, not included but not limited to wildfires, flooding, coastal erosion, saltwater intrusion, threats to natural carbon sinks, uh, and an increase in pest pathogens and invasive species. Things that will impact in everyday life for all of us, particularly uh, the rural and agricultural communities, if not addressed. So we have a very small window of opportunity to avert all of this. Uh, and, and in my view, a piecemeal 82 per cent reduction in emissions isn't just going to cut it. Net zero should certainly be the absolute bare minimum uh, that we uh, in this chamber aim for. The Minister's bill sets an overall target of 82 per cent in greenhouse gases by 2050. 
So far from being unique to these islands, you know, as an environmental laggard, that will leave the north here the only cor corner of Europe not even attempting to reach net zero. So not only are we the only jurisdiction in these islands not trying to reach, at least 2050 net zero will be the only corner of the EU. As a result, we will have worse air quality, worse water quality, worse soil quality, and a greater biodiversity loss than the entire continent of Europe. What effect will this have on our ability to trade, not just with the rest of Ireland, but with the rest of Europe, when our produce is coming from a region with lower environmental standards? Our agri-food industry is inextricably linked north and south. And, I mean, it's also uh, you know, a reality that you know, on this island, with the same same island and the same agriculture practice, that, you know, there is uh, legislation in the south that feel they can achieve net zero by, at the very least, 2050. So the bill, uh, the Minister's bill also has zero all-Ireland elements, and you know, that's ludicrous uh, given you know, what we've all talked about here in terms of the island, uh, the environment and climate change on our small island. Air, soil, water, uh, flora and fauna are not limited by uh, political uh, boundaries. Ireland, North and South not only shares the same unique environment, but our economies are inextricably linked, uh, particularly agri-food production. So, and this bill uh, makes no mention either of biodiversity. You know, the scientific community is unanimous in its assertion that climate change and biodiversity are interconnected and that neither uh, domain can be addressed without effectively addressing the other. Uh, as others have said, the bill lacks any kind of independent oversight. It is not enough to legislate for these targets. There needs to be uh, independent oversight to assist with meeting the targets. Uh, the bill, I know the Minister mentioned it, but the bill has no mention of a just transition. Major tra uh, changes are required to all sectors to help us tackle the climate crisis, but this will only be effective if they are made in partnership uh, with industries and communities. And the just transition is necessary. To that, it's necessary to protect livelihoods uh, if we were uh, to take advantage of the many economic opportunities that uh, moving to a net, so sorry, a net zero society offers. So, I mean, just in conclusion, uh, I mean, as others have outlined, th th this bill is lacking. You know, it doesn't contain a net zero target for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's no requirement for climate action plans. Uh, there is no mechanism for independent scrutiny. And the provision for a just transition, or no provision for a just transition, which was, uh, will help and is vital to support sectors moving uh, to net zero. So, I mean, as others have said, uh, Minister, we won't be obstructing this bill. Uh, it is vital that this assembly uh, produces a climate act uh, prior to the conclusion of this mandate. But the minister needs to realise that that isn't uh, saying that this bill isn't weak uh, and. Ambitious because it's neither of those. Sorry, it is both weak and non-ambitious, and it is flawed. Uh, so many changes will be required to ensure that it can be considered of support at a later stage. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, although the need for legislation on this issue is very clear. The Assembly Bill's process means that we will be debating two bills on the very same issue within months of each other, taking up valuable time and resources of this Assembly. So where there is an opportunity for the bills to come together, I would absolutely be delighted to say that. Um, I'm interested in what the Minister said earlier, where Bill 1 and Bill 2, there has been a discussion, and I would look forward to see um, what the potential amendments or coming together of those bills will be. Earlier in this discussion, many others, Mr O'Dowd, Mr Durgan, Mr Hamilton, have mentioned that this is not just an issue for farmers. And it's not. We all need to take action to reduce emissions. And certainly the farming community is one of the communities that can actually help us and guide us in a way forward to better land management and how to improve things within Northern Ireland without damaging their industry. But if we are to tackle the climate crisis, Departmental priorities and budgets will need to change. Difficult decisions will need to be faced and challenging questions will need to be asked. I welcome the requirements for departments to develop and implement appropriate policies and actions to tackle the climate crisis included in this bill. The Alliance Party has called for the creation of a Northern Ireland Executive Department for Energy and Climate Change. 
And in order to make an impactful change across these islands, we must prioritise close cooperation between the Northern Ireland Executive and the Irish Government in an all-island context. It is also vital that those in Westminster place a Green New Deal at the heart of government. There are many different actions that will need to be taken to target the climate crisis, and it's disappointing that more have not been included in this bill, such as a separate oversight body and a specific net zero emissions target. But as I say, I look forward to seeing what discussions have happened between the bills. Just thinking about what those other departments have to do, I represent the, the, or I'm represented on the Committee for Communities. And in that, we know that there need to be targets to ensure any investment to retrofit homes will meet effective standards. New homes must be planned with interconnectedness via public transport and internet access. We need to invest in innovative construction methods. And of course, as Ms Barton had mentioned, the use of energy is becoming more and more a key factor. In my own constituency, Strangford Loch, the tidal energy project that has been worked through with Queen's University and others is something that I would love to see further expanded. Moving on to transport, active travel and sustainable transport should form key elements of any climate change bill. There is a need to rebalance the Department for Infrastructure's budget towards these areas and we should be following the commitment made by the Republic of Ireland to spend 20 per cent of transport capital funding on active travel. The creation of an independent active travel commissioner with a specific ring-fenced budget to deliver upon strategies would also help to encourage people to consider greener modes of transport. Investment in new rural or city road improvements such as footpath repair and lighting to include safe active travel options should also be included in a meaningful climate change bill. An example, for instance, in my constituency, as Mr Hamilton will know, is we have Tail Rocks outside Newton Arts that's connected to Newton Arts Town by a footpath that's no more in parts one metre wide. People drive at 60 miles an hour along that road. Why would anyone walk that, that footpath rather than get safely into a car and drive into the town? We are not working together across departments to ensure that all can be done, is being done, to take the pressure off our farmers. It is disappointing that there has not been more, more of a focus on active travel within this bill. Wales has seen the success of establishing a mutual company to provide water and the mutualisation of Northern Ireland water provided with sustainable and long-term funding would be another commitment that could help us better tackle the climate crisis. I absolutely support the Minister's view that we could lead the way in hydrogen. and I do believe that we have a unique situation in Northern Ireland where we have a water company that is in, within public ownership. We have the opportunity here where we could be actually creating hydrogen and, and oxygen, which is in shortage at the moment. This bill puts an onus on all departments to report on the measures they are taking to combat the climate crisis. In order to take proactive and meaningful steps, climate-proof budgets must be delivered. If each department is to prepare and publish a report for each budgetary period, setting out the policies and proposals for mid carbon budget, sorry, the carbon budget for that period, the financial implications of this will need to be set out in departmental budgets. It's disappointing that this bill does not bring about the commitment and new decade new approach to establish an independent environmental protection agency. This body would increase cross-border cooperation on the protection of the natural environment, ensuring good governance when tackling climate issues. As I say, I look forward to seeing what changes appear to have been agreed between Bill 1 and Bill 2, because I do believe that this bill that the Minister has brought forward does lack in some areas. But I welcome any opportunity to act on the climate crisis that we are all facing and will be supporting this bill at second stage. Thank you. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, tonight as someone who is slowly ageing out of the under-25 uh, bracket, um, and just in recognition of how passionate young people are um, on this top topic matter here tonight. Climate change impacts each and every one of us. Decisions we make today will impact not only our lives, but the lives of future generations. The North is not immune to the severity of the impacts of a changing climate, and it is important that we play our role and our part in the global effort and effort across these islands to tackle climate change. Having a constituency surrounded by beautiful coastlines, I am all too aware 
of the growing concern of climate change and the fears surrounding coastal erosion in areas like Port Rush, Port Stewart and Castle Rock. For me, I believe fundamentally that we have to make our laws uh, tackling the climate crisis as robust as possible to contribute to the protection and the preservation of our land for future generations. To now, I feel that we have failed them. While the, climate Act, uh, pardon me, while the Climate Change Act of 2008 extends to Northern Ireland, specific greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for the North are not included in it, and I recognise and welcome that these issues are highlighted here today within this bill. As we look to the future, I feel it's all about transformation, to limit damage to our environment in all aspects of our life. It's the small steps each of us can take at home, the materials that we use, what we recycle, ethical buying, for example. And I also welcome the efforts of young activists across Ireland uh, and those from the Climate Coalition on highlighting the issue of fast fashion across these islands and the impact it has on our environment. With over-reliance on road use being a contributing factor to emissions in the north, uh, I have to note my sincere thanks to Minister Mallon for her commitment uh, to enhancing our public transport here in the north, which allows us to better connect our communities, uh, but also contributing in tackling the climate crisis. I also recognise the importance of the 20, the importance of, the 20 million uh, of funding for blue-green infrastructure here to support transformation of our communities and play a key role in active travel. In the north, disruption to businesses, services and people's daily lives will no doubt increase if adverse changes occur due to climate change. An increased risk of flooding and coastal wear will certainly put pressure on drainage, sewage, roads, water and habitats. Increased temperature, increased pollution and poor air quality may bring, cer certainly will bring discomfort to the vulnerable uh, and unfortunately threaten our species and our ecosystems here. In the SDLP, we are committed to doing all we can to fight the climate crisis, protecting our natural environment and preventing biodiversity loss. In Westminster, our leader, Colm Eastwood, has brought forward um, the Climate Emergency Bill, so we believe we can make real change both uh, here and in Westminster. We know that any further delay will increase the problem and present more difficulty in how we deal with it. But lastly and most importantly, I personally have significant concern about how reckless profiteers, companies that are driven by greed, continue to damage our environment, especially in the Sperns and beyond. I believe it is our moral duty as public representatives to continue to call this out where we see it and not only continue to encourage but demand that businesses must have legally binding, ethical, environmentally friendly policies to protect our environment and ecosystems for future generations to come. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am glad to get the opportunity to speak on this bill today at second stage, and I don't intend to speak on it for very long, as others have covered a lot of detail already, but a brief comment, like others have done to start, it's worth noting that this time last year we had no climate bills, and now this is the second one in a matter of months to reach the floor at this stage, and it is good to see what can be done when there is a will for it to be done, and we don't need to kick cans further down the road or bury heads in the sand. But on to the principles of the bill, I wish to comment on two, and it's the target and also the lack of a just transition. And clause one, as we know, includes a target for at least 82% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, using baselines from the 1990s, depending on the gas. But we know that this is not enough, let alone um, the issues um, that many have, have, have already outlined in terms of possibly not meeting 82 per cent. The bill also allows DERA to establish carbon budgets which outline the maximum greenhouse gas levels for Northern Ireland for time periods through clauses 2 and 3. And I note um, that each budget will be designed with the allowance that the Department can amend and alter the targets in clause 4, i.e. it gives the Department the power to change 1 and 3 either specifying a different year or a different percentage linked to Clause 31. And I take it, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this um, flexibility would only be amending targets for the better. Um, are you doing better than expected and getting to net zero quicker? Um, the provisions could only be made to allow targets to be revised upwards, and I don't see any reason why they would be going downwards. Um, I also question the lack of oversight and accountability in this bill, and it would be a monumental challenge to everyone in society. And so we need to have a public buy-in and trust in the process. So there does need to be independent oversight and democratic accountability in this bill, giving the Assembly a stronger oversight 
and scrutiny role and creating an independent Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner is a simple way of doing this. But if the 82% reduction from baseline is not met, what protections are there in place to ensure targets are met then? Because most of us currently in this assembly will not be sitting here by 2040, let alone by 2050, for us to scrutinise this. Hopefully, we will not be underwater and living in, but we will be living in retrofitted warm homes, of course. But why does uh, Northern Ireland not deserve to be net zero? Are we going to continue to lag behind? Given that the Climate Bill for Northern Ireland at committee stage has a net zero target and this one does not, it does beg the question, why the difference? What is the problem with the additional and much needed 18%? So there is a lot lacking in this bill, as many have noted, but most importantly for me is the absence of any just transition principles, let alone mechanisms for a just transition to net zero. Without these, it is fundamentally impossible to transition to net zero, which we must do, but without leaving people behind. And we have a very unique chance here in legislation in front of this assembly to change the course that we are on for irreversible climate catastrophe and also to build back better in the context of the pandemic. We do need to rebuild with transformative Green New Deal, with the foundations of a just transition, and we need to end investment in fossil fuels. We need to implement the moratorium on hydraulic fracturing that this assembly voted in favour of last year, and we need to put a final stop to Dalradian's gold mine in Tyrone, just to name but a few things we need to be getting on with. So the transition to a green economy must be underpinned by the values of social and environmental justice and the principle that nobody gets left behind. So again, we must question this, reflecting the will of this assembly that has been shown on many times through motions in relation to a just transition. Why is this absent from the minister's bill? Perhaps the minister can outline why just transition is not in the bill in his summing up. Perhaps it was an oversight to leave out fairness in all of this. Members will not need reminded, but maybe some do, that this is a code red for humanity. This is an emergency. It is not a keep calm and carry on. Low ambition is not good enough, and we cannot wait around any longer. And I've said this before, and I will say it again, there are siren voices who urge us not to do anything too radical. Why spend money on cutting emissions when we're only a tiny part of a huge global economy? Let the others do the harder work and we can follow later on. But that argument is completely morally bankrupt. And if we do not invest in a zero carbon economy and society now, we will be left in pretty short order. And the explanatory and financial memorandum of this bill even admits that Northern Ireland is not immune to the severity of the impacts of a changing climate. And it is important that it plays our part in the global effort. But with no targets and shabby environmental regulation, our businesses will wake up one morning and realise that they cannot compete. And it will not be their fault, but it will be this House's for not providing the much needed leadership that it is needed. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I apologise for the interruption. <clears throat> I've been asked to, to leave the chamber for a brief time uh, for a vote in the executive uh, committee, which is currently meeting. And I'm in your hands, Mr. Speaker, as to whether you wish to adjourn uh, for 10 minutes to redo that, or whether you wish to carry on in my absence. Members, from the member, it is in, in your hands. Uh, I ask, by leave of the assembly that we would have a brief adjournment. Shall I say 15 minutes and then you will stand over it? I don't need to say a time and, and it not be held to. So, members, by leave of the Assembly, uh, I would therefore suggest that we adjourn for 15 minutes. With leave of the Assembly, please, we will put that brief adjournment. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. The Assembly is resumed and I call Rachel Woods to continue her speech. Thank you. Um, the anticipation for my closing remarks uh, is real. I have two sentences left. So um, what I will conclude that we are the first generation to truly feel the effects of climate breakdown and we are the very last to be able to do anything about it. And we can and must do better for there is a lot of work to be getting on with. So we need strong, ambitious climate legislation to de deliver a true, just transition for every person in Northern Ireland and not just a carbon bill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's been over 10 years uh, since the UK Climate Act was introduced, uh, yet the north of Ireland is the only jurisdiction in these islands not to have introduced its own climate change law. We can no longer afford not to act. We are in a climate and ecological emergency, yet the seriously deficient climate bill and the inaction from the Stormont Executive on many environmental fronts is just typical of how successive executives have treated our environment here. Stormont Executive have done too little too late, colluding with corporations and continuing the exploitation of workers on the planet. We have had decades of systemic failure to take environmental protection seriously. There are serious deficiencies both in how arrangements for uh, environmental governance have been designed and how environmental regulation has been delivered, with penalties for breaking regulations merely a slap on the wrist compared with similar offences elsewhere. We are without, as people have said, an independent uh, EPA, which would have enhanced the protections of our natural resources and biodiversity. We instead have had to rely on ordinary people and communities who have acted as independent environmental protection agents in their own right uh, in the battle to save our planet. The executive should be indebted to those environmental campaigners who, without our environment here, would be in a much poorer state. They have managed to stop the drill in the Woodburn Forest, stop incinerators being built outside Derry, and instead pushing for zero waste solutions, halted fracking in Fermanagh. They have campaigned to keep railway lines open, knowing this is the future for travel. They, have, they are fighting against a Goliath gold mining companies in the Spurrins with no help from the DFE in that endeavour. They are fighting to save our last remain in ancient woodland, of which we have only 0.04 per cent, and fighting for legal rights for nature in, in law, uh, to name some examples. Also, not to mention uh, the highlighting of the petroleum licence in and around Loch Ness, PLA 116 plan application, or the landfill at Mulliglass site, which forces residents in West Belfast and Lisburn to be faced with uh, terrible odours on a daily basis. We now also have a growing youth uh, climate movement, Mr Deputy Speaker which calls on the Stormont Executive uh, for urgent, radical climate action, because the decisions we make here today will affect the lives of these young people and the future generations. And I, alongside some other members across the, the House, stood with them on Friday as they restarted their campaign. And the science is clear. The latest IPCC report uh, is a code red for humanity. The effects of climate breakdown are already being felt. Just this year, around the world and locally, we have had, had floods droughts, wildfires and storms on a scale we have never seen before, and this will only get more frequent and more extreme. Scientists are hopeful that if we can cut global emissions in half by 2030 and reach net zero by the middle of the century, we can halt and possibly reverse the rise in temperatures. Right now, the North's per capita emissions are higher than the UK average, accounting for 4% of the UK's total emissions. In addition, the North's emissions are failing, falling significantly lower than the UK average, uh, achieving just 18% reduction compared to the UK's 44%. If we are to do our fair share in tackling climate change, there is simply no room in the carbon budget for new fossil fuel infrastructure or exploitation, and we must make a rapid transition to a zero-carbon society as soon as possible. This bill will not deliver the climate action we need to address this global emergency. The specific targets included in the bill are inadequate, and it does not include a science-based net zero target. A net zero target has significant political power. It would establish a clear, unambiguous intent to transition to a climate-resilient society. We cannot be the only part of these islands 
without a net zero target because, uh, because of the, an action. Net zero by 2045 is achievable, uh, despite the Minister's comments, and with more ambitious measures, net zero earlier than 2045 is possible. Research from the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change research demonstrates uh, we could have a net zero carbon energy system by 2042 if the will was there. Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland have not only had climate legislation in place for a number of years, but they have also have all recently amended that legislation to show more ambition in reflecting the, the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to do more. And that's zero by 2045. Target is rooted in the overwhelming scientific evidence that we are living in a climate and ecological uh, emergency, and that ambitious action is needed to limit global temperature increases. It is unlikely that a weak, caveated target of at least 82 per cent will encourage the adoption of the technologies, policies and behaviours that are necessary to ensure that there is a just transition to a climate-proofed society. This at least terminology sets the bar incredibly low, Mr Deputy Speaker. A more ambitious target is possible. For example, there is no technical reason why the North could not invest in the electrical and electric grid to facilitate a rapid wholesale shift to electric heat. There is no technical reason why a programme of public works to increase energy efficiency in homes and public buildings can't quickly be implemented. Clauses 4 and 5 give substantial power to the Department to change the emissions targets, years and baseline, and I share people's concerns about that. DERA should not be given the power to dilute what are already very weak targets. We see no uh, valid reason why the Department should be allowed to revise targets down in future. Provision should only be made to allow targets to be revised upwards, i.e. to become more ambitious. Carbon budgets are a key indicator of the extent to which we are meeting uh, targets. However, there are other indicators which should be included in similar budgeting mechanisms. For instance, nitrogen budgets should be included. Biodiversity decline is also a key indicator of climate change, and any resulting climate change legislation for the North should reflect the importance of biodiversity as a key performance indicator in the battle against climate change and reflect this in the legislation. Carbon budgets <coughs> Deputy Speaker, should specify the limits to carbon emissions within the period of the commitment and should align with the dates of the interim targets. Carbon budgets Budgets should be reviewed on a five-yearly basis to reflect the most up-to-date science and any changes in global agreements on climate mitigation. However, carbon budgets alone do not provide enough detail. We need climate action plans to provide the details necessary to set sectoral emissions targets. Without the guidance set by climate action plans, there is a real risk the North's response to the climate emergency will remain unfocused, contradictory and inadequate. A climate action plan should set out ministers' proposals and policies for meeting the emission, uh, emissions reduction targets during the, uh, the plan period, and should cover areas such as nature-based solutions, agriculture, food, energy, transport, waste, land use, land use change, forestry, residential and public buildings, to name a couple. Certain sectors should not be given a de, de facto immunity from greenhouse gas reduction requ requirements, while others are forced to carry an unreasonably disproportionate burden. Policies and plans may offer transitionary support to some sectors less able to make early cuts, but it would be wholly unjust to allow some sectors to continue to grow and produce increasing emissions, while others have to make dramatic and drastic cuts. Uh, rather than relying on advice from the CCC alone, it is necessary to incorporate a mechanism for independently scrutinising progress on delivering the provisions of the Act. A climate office should be established with a commissioner based here. The commissioner should review the adequacy and effectiveness of the Act and uh, prepare review progress uh, uh, reports on the working of the Act for the Assembly. The commissioner can propose recommendations for amendments to the Act, which are considered necessary and desirable in order to achieve the overriding climate objective. It would essentially keep us on track to do the most we can in the quickest time, and that is fair to all. Without the scrutiny of the commissioner, it is likely. Without the scrutiny of the commissioner, it is likely we will continue to lag behind. It is important, uh, Deputy Speaker, that the climate commissioner is independent of government and free uh, to be critical of departmental plans and policies. And the commission must be able to speak. The commissioner must be able to speak freely without fear of funding cuts, ministerial gags, or political interference. 
There is too much reliance, Deputy Speaker, on the Climate Change Committee as the sole advisory body. And if we are to ensure the best evidence-based information is drawn upon when devising policy, amending targets, and assessing overall compliance with the legislation, advice should be sought from multiple sources, such as the IPCC and the South Climate Advisory Council. This is particularly important, given the fact that we are on a partitioned island with this bill not addressing transboundary issues sufficiently. Climate change obviously knows no borders. However, the CCC has confirmed that it does not concern itself with the Republic of Ireland's efforts. The lack of mention, uh, Deputy Speaker, of nature, nature-based solutions or, or biodiversity, as people have said, then this bill is a major oversight. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services doesn't roll off the tongue are united in their view that uh, climate change and biodiversity are interconnected and neither domain can be addressed without effectively addressing the other. Given the growing awareness of the vital role of nature based solutions to climate change, specific provisions have been incorporated into the Republic of Ireland's Climate Action and Low Carbon Development uh, Amendment Act. And given the importance of harnessing the power of nature to help tackle the climate emergency. Uh, climate change legislation here should, uh, but does not, uh, include specific provisions on nature based solutions. There is no provision, uh, as others have said, Deputy Speaker, and this is very important, in the Bill for a Just Transition. It could be implied from this uh, that the Data Minister does not support sustainable jobs and job growth, net zero carbon investment and infrastructure, the creation of work which is high value, fair and sustainable, and reducing. Uh, with a view to eliminating inequality, poverty and social deprivation. The absence of a provision uh, for a just transition from the Minister's Bill makes the case for all sectors, including the agricultural sector, to support the, 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 the Minister's Bill as it safeguards workers as we transition to the net zero target. The CCC said in 2018 in its report, Net Zero the UK's Contribution to Stop Global Warming, that the concept of a just transition is now widely recognised as a crucial element of a low-carbon uh, transition, but it is not in this bill. On that re report, page uh, 257, uh, the CCC said, HM Treasury should undertake a review of how the transition will be funded and where the costs will fall. It should develop a strategy to ensure this is and is perceived to be fair. A broader strategy <coughs> will, will also be needed to ensure a just transition across society, with vulnerable workers and consumers protected. It also goes on, uh, the CCC, uh, on its report, Policies for the Sixth Carbon Budget and Net Zero uh, Report. Fairness is fundamental to public support and must be embedded throughout policy. Only transition that is perceived as fair and where people, places and communities are well supported will succeed. UK government policy, including on skills and jobs, must join up with local, regional and evolve policy on the just transition. Vulnerable people must be protected from the cost of the transition, and benefits should be shared broadly. Um, and to implement that, my view is that uh, this is in the report. Uh, you need to see a corporate wealth tax uh, to cover the costs. So I would ask how this bill can have no provisions for a just transition, despite the Deirdre Minister himself saying on 23rd of September that quote, the scientific evidence presented to me by the CCC has been absolutely front and centre in shaping my climate change bill. The Scottish Government established the Scottish Just Transition Commission in 2019 to advise on a net zero economy that is fair uh, for all. The Scottish prin principles for a just transition state that action to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions should support environmentally and socially sustainable jobs support low-carbon investment and infrastructure, create decent, fair and high-value work in a way that does not negatively affect the current workforce and overall economy and contribute uh, to resource-efficient and sustainable economic approaches which help to address inequality and poverty. This is an approach that is worth considering for here, Deputy Speaker. It is a historic duty in this executive and this House to introduce ambitious climate change legislation. Uh, a climate change act needs to be robust challenging and with a clear, undiluted net zero target which reflects the severity of the situation. However, having a net zero and effective climate bill is only one step in addressing the climate crisis. We also need to transform the economic system which is at war with life on earth itself. The IPCC report calls for transformative systemic change. The dominant capitalist system Deputy Speaker, is no longer sustainable. A healthy capitalist system prioritises the needs of the market for infinite growth above all else, creating greater wealth 
inequality, greater health inequalities, and extracting resources from the earth and from workers in ways that exploits and destructs. The change needed to our economic system and to fully transition to renewable and non-carbon ener energy are a threat to an elite minority who have a stranglehold over our economy, our political processes and major media outlets. However, we either let capitalism change everything we know and love about this planet or we change the system itself. We need to transform our economic system in a way that production is based on need and not profit, based on cooperative and democratic systems uh, of worker and community control. And the climate crisis, Deputy Speaker, is a social justice crisis issue as well, with those who have done least to cause the crisis the most uh, are the most vulnerable to its effects. It is the poorest and most vulnerable in our society who feel the greatest impacts of climate change. But whether it is the end of the world with a climate crisis or the end of the month with our wages, it is the same fight at the end of the day. So the change needed, Deputy Speaker, to avert a catastrophic climate change actually has the potential to improve the quality of life for the vast majority of people on this planet if that opportunity is grasped. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and it's, it's impossible to look at this bill without also looking at the state of us here in Northern Ireland. 18% carbon reductions since 1990, when every other region is reducing by an average of up to 40%. Why is this? We've been pursuing the going for growth strategy with no regard to the environmental, climate or human health consequences. Our habitats and communities are choking in ammonia. An ineffective environment agency upholding knowingly law unlawful policies. No independent environment protection agency. We have power sharing institutions constantly beset by crisis after crisis under a system that is not fit for any future governance purposes and siloed departmental working that cannot develop the sustainability that we need. The arguing about the costs needs to stop. We cannot continue to uphold an economic system that has done us wrong and claim it as a right. And ambitious targets, every time we set them, we're told we can't achieve them. And when we do set them, we overachieve on them and we surpass them. The renewable energy target of 40% of our electricity coming from renewable sources was reeled against by some. We were told that it was going to cost the consumer too much, and when in fact the very opposite was the reality. Recycling targets, again, challenged as unachievable and costly. And here we go again with the we can't do it mantra from those who really should just admit that we don't want to do it. DERA have been good at making promises, and we're looking at the new ones coming in the green growth paper. But it seems too afraid to put those into law. People have had enough of undelivered strategies. They will no longer suffice. So how long have we waited for an ammonia strategy, a waste strategy, an air pollution strategy, environment strategy, agriculture strategy? I could go on and on. And yet the health and well-being of people continues to suffer year on year. Now we've all heard about the inaction that has led us to this point, the empty promises and the unachieved commitments in the new decade and new approach. And we've heard about the IPCC report, and we've seen for ourselves, even just this summer, how we've had extreme weather events all over the world. Everybody, whether they admit it or not, knows what needs to be done. And while we continue with this, doing nothing is not an option, it's a nice catchy line and it's being widely used, I want to stress that not doing enough is also not an option. And turning to this bill itself, the bill includes a target for at least 82% reduction in GHG emissions by 2050. Now, before we get to the target itself, and Mr Carroll's already pointed out, members need to be aware that in the bill, DERA is given itself the power to amend the target. And rightly pointed out by Mr Carroll, no guarantee to prevent them from lowering up. 
And given that the CCC has termed the 82% a target we cannot say we cannot reach, I see absolutely no reason for a provision that can potentially lower the target to be included in the Bill. And neither can I see such a provision in climate legislation in any other jurisdiction. And on the 82% target, it's just simply inadequate. And we will be in another embarrassing situation and that reflection on Northern Ireland should it be passed. It is predicated on a business as usual model when business as usual is over. We need to stop, start being very open and honest with people on the drastic and the deep and rapid change that we all need to have happen in order to deal with the increasingly urgent threat to the existence of humanity that we are watching unfold due to our own inaction and the very systems that we have created across the globe. And it's also calculated solely on the basis that Northern Ireland will, contri will contribute to the UK net zero target without any acknowledgement of Northern Ireland's political, geographical context as a devolved jurisdiction with a unique relationship to the UK, the Republic of Ireland, the EU and the rest of the world. And many will cite and have done our agri-food sector as a reason for not aiming further for a net zero. But now we know that the Republic of Ireland have forged ahead with a net zero target, even though their emissions profile is even more heavily influenced by their agriculture sector than ours is. Certainly. To give us any idea of how the Republic actually plan to do that and implement that? Minister, you sit on the North South Ministerial Council and I think that that's a conversation you should have with your ministerial colleagues in the South and bring that learning back to us. So I recently also read about a project that has received funding in County Cork called Farm Zero C. They aim to make 5,000 dairy farms carbon neutral within the next five years. And that's the kind of innovation that's been driven by a strong commitment to a net zero target. And that's exactly the kind of ambition that we need to enable our sector and our farmers here at home to also achieve. And I would remind the Minister that if he's concerned that setting a net zero target would negatively impact the agri-food sector, that it is exactly his department that has the power to avoid this by introducing the necessary policies and the economic incentives to go along with that. These policies need to be underpinned by ambitious targets. It is exactly this type of legal underpinning, underpinning that will force us to embed what we know is happening in England, for example, with the public money for public goods principle and the establishment of a just transition fund for agriculture to help farmers pay for new technologies. These are just two examples of policies that the Minister may want to consider. And in relation to the just transition principles, these are noticeably, noticeably absent from the Bill. Others have already made mention of that. And they have the potential to significantly help many sectors to ensure fairness in this process. They are included in the Climate Change No. 1 Bill and also in the Scottish Act. So it's disappointing that they're missing from this bill. Because of the inherent failures of the bill to consider Northern Ireland's unique geographical and political position mentioned earlier, we need an oversight body that is physically located here in Northern Ireland and that can provide advice to us, such as the Climate Condition Commissioner contained in the Climate Change Bill No. 1. And I think it's fair to say that what Minister Putz has brought forward here is a low carbon bill as opposed to a climate change bill. No just transition, as others have mentioned. No Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner or other independent monitoring body that is physically located again here at home. No targets on soil, water quality or biodiversity, even though these are considered key climate change indicators. 
and the IPCC have recently con concluded that neither biodiversity loss nor climate change will be successfully resolved unless both are tackled together, yet biodiversity is absent. However, there are some very positive aspects to the Bill. It contains well-developed provisions on carbon budgeting, which appear to mirror those contained within the 2008 UK Act. However, it might be worth looking to our neighbours in Scotland and enhance these, as Scotland's carbon budgeting procedures are more up-to-date. And of course, it is deeply regrettable that despite the UK Act being in place since 2008, the Northern Ireland Executive is only now, in 2021, applying this to specific Northern Ireland legislation. Secondly, the public sector duty is very welcome and it would be worth expanding this duty beyond departments to all public bodies. Local councils in particular will have a huge role to play in adaptation measures. So it would be good to see them included in this duty. And I want to touch on a few more issues that have listened to a lot of arguments over the last few weeks and months about the cost of taking action and the affordability of meeting a net zero target. Well, the cost of meeting net zero in the UK is estimated to be between 1% to 2% of GDP. Inaction, on the other hand, could lead to a fall in global GDP by up to 10% by 2050. So yet again, this shines a spotlight of the absolute need to be open, honest and transparent with people on the real cost as opposed to any scaremongering, political point scoring that might be going on. We need to bring people on board. Uh, certainly. Mr. Chap, the Climate Change Committee made recommendations. Are you saying they were political point scoring? They made recommendations for the England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. They made recommendations that we could reach 82% by 2050. And they said in, the, in that report that in every scenario they looked at, Northern Ireland could not reach that zero by 2050. Do you accept their recommendations? Thank the member for that. Uh, and Mr Irwin, I have reams of stuff that I could come back to you with on on that, you know, um, the, the, in the statement by the CC, I never said, by the way, that the CCC were politically point scoring, but they have also said that uh, a net zero GHG target is not credible unless policy is ramped up significantly. And to say that a net zero target covering all GHGs cannot credibly be set for Northern Ireland would therefore appear to be a judgment of what is deemed politically feasible rather than what is scientifically or technically achievable. So there's reams of it. But I want to make the point that the time for talking and debating is over. We need action and we need to start moving on. And that's the important part. So we can sit here for another 10 years debating smaller points. What's really, really needed is the action in order to begin the mitigations. We've also heard claims that Northern Ireland is small and how little of a difference we in Northern Ireland can make on a global scale. But we are small, there's no doubt. And in other, op uh, in other opinions, that makes us actually better primed to play our full part in mitigation measures. We make up 0.02% of the global population, but yet we admit 0.04% of all global emissions. So that's double our fair share on the grand scale. Now, as a developed country, we emit more. So we also have a duty to try to decarbonise faster. The worst impacts of climate change will be felt in less developed countries. And we need to take that responsibility for that damage and for those local people and we need to start thinking globally while we are acting locally. Last week, I was in conversation with the ex-president of uh, the Marshall Islands, a set of islands set to be wiped out very, very soon unless radical mitigation measures are imposed. And she was telling me that despite they are not causing the problem, 
they are going above and beyond their capacity in mitigation because their population and their land is at risk. So what are we going to do in the future with climate, um, climate refugees? How are we going to mitigate against the mass migration of people whose land is disappearing? Those are the things, Mr Irwin, we should be getting really stuck into because we're at the tipping point. We are at the point of irre irreversible damage and it's happening under our watch. And this is the choice that we are making. We can afford to do it. And arguing that because we are little, we won't make a difference sends a message to every other small country in the world that there's no point in even trying. And that's not a message that the Green Party will ever support. If you add up the emissions of all the countries in the world who produce less than 1% of total global emissions, just like us, it adds up to more than the emissions of the USA put together. Every player, big and small, must play their part. They must do their fair share in bringing a secure and sustainable future where no one in this world is left behind. And it's worth noting that there are quite high levels of environmental and climate ambition in many current and upcoming DERA strategies. And the green growth, as was mentioned, is only one example. So why, therefore, can we not enshrine that ambition in law? There's one big main difference between law and policy, and that is the legal obligation must be met and is not negotiable. We can be held accountable. So why is accountability the fear factor? Why are we so afraid of being held accountable? If the ambition is there, enshrine it in law so we know it will be achieved and that every department works towards enabling people and planet not just to survive, but to thrive. And the Minister has been heavily critical of the Climate Change No. 1 Bill during debates in this chamber. And indeed in this chamber, he referred to it as a Disneyland Bill. So, Minister, we are all hoping that this second bill is not to be the Mickey Mouse bill. And as it stands, the Green Party cannot support such unambitious legislation because we know that Northern Ireland deserves better. And by acknowledging that as we begin the road to climate change mitigation and everything begins to change, that only then can we be ambitious really shows poor leadership. And the Green Party will be focused on stepping up and doing all we can to make this bill fit for purpose. Because are we not tired of constantly being the laggard, of being told we cannot achieve on ambition? It is not unreasonable to aspire to something better. The Climate Change Northern Ireland Act that will be delivered by the end of this mandate must reflect the fact that, yes, we can do better, we can be ambitious, and we will achieve, because our very future depends on it. Now, as this debate was happening, I received an email from one of our young climate activists who was on strike in, in Corn Market on Friday. And as I spoke about a 2045 net zero target, she wanted to let me know, and I'm going to quote, 2045 is not ambitious at all. It is far too late. I will be 43 years old in 2045. Please, please realise that 2045 is not ambitious when you know what we're headed for. 1.5 degrees of warming by 2025. Even this is catastrophic for humanity. When you realise this, you'll realise that aiming for 2045 is completely, in capitals, crazy. The private member's bill needs to be better. And I concur with that young person because it's her future that we hold the responsibility for achieving. 
Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Edmund Pitts, to respond and conclude the debate. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I again apologise for the interruption, and, uh, particularly to Ms Woods, and I appreciate um, your um, allowing for the adjournment. And, uh, <clears throat> can I thank all of those members who have participated um, in the debate? It has been uh, a reasonable debate um, and well argued, and I want to respond um, to a number of the issues that have been raised. First of all, I would say on climate. On our own, we can't and we won't deliver the decarbonisation of the world. But together with the rest of the world, we can. And together in this Assembly, in the executive that serves this Assembly and serves the people of Northern Ireland, we can do things which are really significant in terms of reducing our carbon input across all sectors and consequently make a real and a tangible difference. And I would hope that over the course um, of the completion of this bill, that that is something which will become a common thread, where we will recognise the need to work together to all put our shoulder to the wheel and to find agreement um, on a way forward, which is an agreement which is based on science, which is rational, which is sensible, which does not say we are going to take this here on, and it does not really matter how it affects um, that person, or that sector, or that community. Germany are in transition to net zero at all costs um, should not be on somebody else's um, livelihood. And that is something that we need to take account of. You know, I heard Mr McGuigan talk earlier, and North Antrim has a lot of sheep farmers. And income is generally based between 10 and 40,000, but far more commonly in the 10,000, 10 to 20,000 range. And the proposals that we brought forward um, on the net zero by 2045 would lead to a 30 per cent plus reduction over those years. And I'm not sure how he's convinced that farmers um, in North Antrim could be living on um, a cut of 3,000 on those in 10,000 pounds, or a cut um, of 6,000 on those who are earning 20,000 pounds, which probably takes in most of the sheep farmers in North Antrim. Would he like to live on, a, on an income of 7 to 14,000 pounds? I know that I wouldn't. Minister, for giving way. I mean, like all uh, the colleagues in the chamber, I, my engagement with farmers over this last while have raised a lot of conversations. Some, indeed, have raised the issue of the climate bill. But I have to say, Minister, the majority of them, particularly in North Antrim, are more concerned about trade deals with Australia and the likely loss of livelihood as a result of trade deals that uh, the British government are doing as a result of Brexit. I am grateful to the member for raising the issue of the trade deal with Australia, because remarkably, while we could be importing that lamb and indeed that beef from Australia, they have not set a net zero carbon for that huge country. So exactly what I am saying, that we could have carbon leakage and importing materials which we can produce at a lower carbon footprint than them, importing those materials while driving our people out of work is not the way forward. And that is why I have been so resistant, and will continue to be, to aspirations not based on science. Whenever we can deliver net zero across these islands with targets which are meaningful, achievable and scientifically based. Mr Durkin and <coughs> Ms Woods raised the issue about um, uh, paragraphs 4 and 5 and the ability to actually increase uh, in our targets based on science is what paragraphs 4 and 5 is about. So you are correct, uh, Ms Woods, to make the assumption that that is only there to increase targets, not to decrease them. And I would to assuage uh, Mr. Durkin's concern on that particular issue. Others mentioned what Scotland could achieve, and I'd have to say, 
Scotland has achieved a considerable amount um, in the past, and some of that has been taking bold decisions. For example, you know, our people looked at it in the 70s and, that, and the 80s, and that was about um, using hydropower, taking water from reservoirs, um, using that to ge generate electricity where there's high consumption during the day, pumping the water back into the reservoirs at night uh, whenever the consumption was lower. We didn't do it. The opportunity was there to do it, and we didn't do it. And we're behind. We need to recognise that we're behind. But that doesn't mean that we can't play catch-up. We are playing catch-up, but we can't play catch-up on the time frame, perhaps, that some people um, would be suggesting. Mr McGuigan um, also referred to missing the target. And I'd have to mention to him the issue about consumption versus production. Because whenever you have a consistent consumption, then you need a consistent production. And if you don't reduce the consumption, then the production has to happen somewhere. And moving that production to importation is what would happen in, in, in the reality of, of the climate change bill that he has initially supported, is only exporting the climate change problem. And, you know, if Brazil goes ahead and increases its cattle herd by 24 million, do you think that that will actually decrease um, climate change, or will that increase climate change? And do you think that us, UK, importing beef from South America will actually reduce the carbon footprint, or will it increase the carbon footprint? And the answer very clearly is that it will increase the carbon footprint whilst it will do away with jobs here in Northern Ireland. Some 13,000 in the primary, primary food sector in agriculture and tens of thousands then in the processing sector. That is not a route that we want to go. And both Mr McGuigan and Mr Carl um, made reference to Ireland and, and how we should be working closer with Ireland. Ireland has moved up by almost 10% since 1990, its carbon footprint, while we have reduced our carbon footprint by 18%. Now, we haven't reduced our carbon footprint by enough, but the suggestion that we should tie ourselves to those who have actually been increasing their carbon footprint at the same time doesn't strike me as being particularly rational. And we had Ms Bailey telling us the wonderful work that has been done in the, in the Irish Republic. But we don't have any evidence of any actual work. We've got an aspiration that they will deliver net zero, but we have no evidence whatsoever of how they're going to do it. Where is the science? Where, is the, where have they demonstrated how they're going to deliver this? So we need to get back to going to evidence-based policy. You know, evidence of saying something is achievable doesn't make it achievable. So, for example, I could uh, aspire to be the heavyweight champion of the world in boxing by 2030. Now, I can tell you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, the heavyweight bit would be achievable. Being the boxing champion of the world would not be achievable. That would be an unrealistic aspiration. Mr McGuigan, I know, is a very keen cyclist, a very proficient cyclist, and he may want to be the Olympic champion uh, of the world in 2024. Flying the flag there for the United Kingdom, receiving his knighthood um, after Sir Chris Hoyle and following in, in, in his footsteps. But it's not realistic. And, uh, you know, we need to get back to doing things uh, which are realistic. And the Climate Change, change Bill should not be delayed any further. Unfortunately, because of this Assembly not operational for three years, it has been delayed. But now we are working, and I am pleased that, that we have got to this point. We were working on it this time last year. It took uh, that period of time to, to properly go through the evidence base uh, to achieve that. But for Ms Armstrong um, to suggest that we should be adding in, in other things to the Climate Change Bill, this is a climate change bill. We will deal with biodiversity, we will deal with other aspects of the environment, including independent protection uh, and other pieces of legislation. And we have done a course of work last week in the Office of Environmental Protection, which will be an independent oversight 
of environmental policy. So we are doing other courses of work on other uh, pieces um, of the environment. Mr O'Dowd um, suggests that I am not for real on the environment. Meanwhile, Ms Bailey um, she actually was suggesting that the waste recycling that we had achieved was a demonstration of how people could set realistic targets and indeed our, our achievement on renewables. When I was the very minister who actually set those targets and brought those things forward uh, to enable it to happen, I uh, also have been involved in tackling the plastic waste in, in, in government, um, the environmental uh, uh, farming scheme, uh, the pollinator scheme, the environmental challenge fund. Uh, my speech to the Ballamore breakfast last week was a speech all about what we could achieve in environmental terms, how we could actually encapsulate um, and, and capture methane, um, how we could uh, utilise that uh, going into our gas pipe networks, um, where we are working with uh, companies like Fermis and Phoenix in doing that, how we can actually introduce the hydrogen, how hydrogen vehicles can be driving and powering our farms, powering the lorries that are transporting the food, the buses that are transporting people. It is a very, very exciting area to be in, and I can assure Mr O'Dowd that I have a real vision uh, for the environment, uh, not an aspiration uh, unlike others. In terms then, of uh, Ms Woods, who, who says, what is wrong with the additional 18 per cent? And then Ms Bailey goes on to, to um, talk of the figures, the, the 1 to 2 per cent of GDP to reach net zero for the UK. She is right. That is what we are working on. We are working on achieving net zero for the UK. And in order to achieve that, the Climate Change Committee's advice is to follow the 82 per cent currently, and I believe that that will rise closer to the 100, but, but not quite the 100. But I, I will in a moment, but let me, let, let me, let me conclude this. It is the Climate Change Committee who have said that it will take 1 to, one to 2 per cent of GDP. And that includes Northern Ireland's contribution, and we will achieve that net zero for the UK. However, Ms Bailey wants to deviate from that and apportion a bill of £1 billion per year, which is about 10 per cent of our block grant, to achieve 100 per cent net zero in Northern Ireland, which will only have a very, very marginal impact um, on the UK net zero aspiration and target and delivery. Thank you, Minister. Minister, there has been much mention of the CCC's independent expert advice um, in setting these targets um, and giving advice to yourself and the executive. Can you let this House know what other expert advice you have availed of in drafting this bill? Well, you see, before I became Environment Minister, on behalf of the executive, the former First and Deputy First Minister appointed the CCC to provide us this advice back in 2016. So that is who you know, we, we pay that body um, and make our contribution uh, to ensure that the independent advice is provided to us from them. Aside from that, there I have sought advice from our own Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, and it very much corresponds with what uh, the Climate Change Committee has said. So, you know, these people don't have any particular agenda that Northern Ireland should not really make a significant contribution to climate change. They are looking at what the issues are. And the fact of life is, and I had to be, be fair to, to Ms Bailey, because she is fairly clear about it, that you know, we can export um, some of our food production to other places, such as New Zealand. Poland and other places. Most of the rest of you haven't come out publicly and said that. I wonder how uh, those who represent rural com communities would be received if they did. But while you're agreeing with Ms. Bailey's bill, she's actually come out and said it. So perhaps you'd like to join her in saying that you would be happy to see uh, Northern Ireland food production exported to New Zealand, to Europe, to other places. Because I don't agree with it, I fundamentally disagree with it. Yes, I will, and I honestly believe that we can produce our food in a way which has 
a really small environmental footprint that we can actually use our farms not just to produce the food but the renewable energy to drive our economy. And I will add that maybe when Mr. McAleer is, is making his intervention, he might reflect on the 16 per cent of greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, which comes from homes. And the fact that we have more rural homes means that it's more challenging. I have a vision how we can resolve it, but I, don't have ha I haven't heard anybody else indicating how they would resolve it, and we'll come to that in a moment. Um, thank the Minister for giving way. Um, I don't believe, I don't think, I, I know, there's no parties in this chamber that wants to export our food production, and we've seen during the course of the pandemic how important our local source, our local secure uh, food supply is so important. I will say that, um, that, is the, and that if we look towards the, the south of Ireland and we see some of the work that Chagas has been doing, for example, with their marginal abat abatement cost curve, where they've been working with farmers to help them reduce their emissions on site. Uh, on by, by making solutions on farm around the use of urea fertilizer, low emission uh, techniques, even incorporating seaweed into cattle's diets, reducing the crude protein in, in cattle's diets. Those can, those can happen on farm. Indeed, that's still on the DARA website that uh, rather than reducing cattle numbers, changes can be made on farm. So, the other thing that, that I, will, I will say as well is that. During the course of our evidence gathering, and even listening for, to, regional, to regional presidents of the Irish Farmers Association, you know, at the case has been made that there are many farms already in uh, marginal areas that are, that are already carbon neutral. So the minister is very quick to point out to North Antrim and Fermanagh and West Rhone and all that there, and, and, and say that the only solution to reducing uh, emissions is to, to cut livestock. But what he needs to do is actually provide a proper carbon calculator for farmers to see where they currently are, rather than just scaremongering that the only solution to address the emissions uh, case is to reduce livestock. Well. Again, I, I need to be extremely grateful to the member for his intervention, um, because maybe he, he, he has um, made the comments out of ignorance, and I'm sorry if that's the case. Because we have already been working with Chugas and AFPE uh, to do this, and I am absolutely clear that I want Chugas and AFPE to develop um, a scheme uh, of, 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 of um, how we measure, measure carbon, what carbon sequestration takes place. There is so much commonality. So I have already cleared that, that that can happen. So the, the working together um, already exists. I, I, I do not need any, any, any uh, bells and whistles to do these things. I just need to see that practically that will work for us and practically it will work for others and get on with the job, um, like I had done whenever uh, I was Health Minister. Uh, with Alton Galvin um, Cancer Unit. Um, I can very easily do those things, and uh, I am very comfortable about doing that in conjunction with Chuggis. Uh, so I am pleased to inform the member that that is already underway and that course of work is being done. I am not sure how he knows how certain farms um, are net zero already. Um, again, I would like to see that evidence base uh, because it is not um, uh, really in the KPMG report. And uh, I'm not sure what he thinks of the KPMG report. If he wants to criticise it, uh, I will look forward to, to that criticism um, going forward in due course. Mrs. Barton and uh, Ms. Armstrong um, both raised the issue about household usage. I want to get to the household usage because whilst farming accounts for 27 per cent, household, householders account for 16 per cent, which is a very significant figure because. I can see how we can challenge the, the, the transport one and the use of hydrogen vehicles, the use of electric vehicles. And I would hope it will be more hydrogen than electric, to be perfectly honest, uh, because I do see that there's a lot of minerals and used in the production of batteries, end of life um, disposal, and all of that there. And I think hydrogen will be ultimately a cleaner uh, renewable energy to use and is better suited uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, but how do we deal with the household one? And given our rural dispersion and our inability um, to tap a lot of people onto the, the natural gas network. But I do see that if we increase the amount of anaerobic digestion, for example, we capture the methane that is produced by uh, the cattle, which are housed in the wintertime. And uh, 
we engage in a, in a separation process um, after the anaerobic digestion. We strip the phosphates and nitrogen out of it. We compress that nitrogen and apply it to the land um, through sprayers. Um, those sprayers um, will be linked to GPS and be associated with the lighter uh, uh, and, and soil sampling that we have carried out. And therefore, we will have intelligent use um, of natural fertilisation as opposed to chemical fertilisers. Those are all means of actually reducing our carbon footprint and also improving uh, the, the, the water quality, um, biodiversity, um, soil management, soil nutrition and other aspects of the environment. I have a vision that that methane that we have captured is cleaned on farms and goes into the, 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 either the pipe, the pipe network, uh, mixed with hydrogen, um, or indeed that is collected by lorries which are run on hydrogen and delivered to those dispersed households around the country. So we can have a truly renewable energy revolution here in Northern Ireland, where we ultimately can export that renewable energy, uh, but we're doing it in conjunction with feeding uh, the 10 million people that we currently are feeding, not in a reduction. So the members that have to participated in the debate thus far, some of them may suggest that in agriculture we should go for regression to meet our climate change targets. And I'm challenging them. And I'm saying that the science doesn't say that we should go for regression in agriculture. The science is saying that we should go for a better environmental-based uh, agriculture. And therefore, we can achieve what is important, and that is feeding this world, because the population is growing, and we can't do anything to stop that. And we can also ensure that we don't import gas from Russia, and oil from the Middle East, and fossil fuels, um, which are contributing to the damage to our environment. That's what I call proper vision for Northern Ireland. That's what the young person who is in climate strike needs to be hearing about, Ms Bailey, not about something which is going to destroy jobs. Because with Mr Carl, people before profit, he wants to export our jobs. And his illogical position, his illogical position will increase carbon leakage, and it's actually a shameful position. Yes, I will. Thank you, Minister. I would invite you to read our party policy. We're actually for creating green jobs, so we want to create jobs, or you want to dither while the planet burns. But how are you going to create those green jobs? Because I've just given you the vision. So instead of closing down agriculture, we actually build upon what we have, and we create those green jobs by creating green energy and exporting green energy, as well as exporting meat and lamb and eggs and chicken and milk and dairy products and all that goes with that. We're serious about keeping jobs for working people in Northern Ireland, not creating a circumstance where tens of thousands of people are put out of their jobs and families who have been working on the land for years are no longer able to do it because of a misplaced aspiration. I just wind up with uh, Ms Bailey's comments because she talks about a just transition. I would have to say that Climate Change Bill No. 1 pays lip service to a just transition, while Climate Change Bill No. 2 delivers on a just transition. And it is important who's that? <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Wood. Thank the Minister for giving way. Could he point to me in the bill, uh, Climate Change No. 2 bill, exactly where the just transition is delivered? Where the just transition is delivered, Ms. Woods, is that we actually deliver on the carbon reduction. Uh, we meet uh, UK's commitment to net zero, and at the same time we retain the jobs and the livelihoods of people in Northern Ireland. That strikes me as being just. It strikes me as being pretty unjust to do tens of thousands of people out of work with an aspiration as opposed to something which is scientifically based. So I commend uh, this bill to the House. It is a bill that is based upon 
um, the, the, the qualitative science that we have received. And the one thing that has been so clear today, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, during this debate, from all of those who say they want to go further, is that none of them, not a single person who spoke in the debate, demonstrated how it could be done. They did not demonstrate where the science was coming from or what the science was saying and how it could be delivered. And therefore, until they get to the point, until they get to the point where they have the science, then they should be backing this bill with the aspiration to go much beyond 82 per cent, but recognising that that is an aspiration until the science allows us to achieve more. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Members, the question is that the second stage of the climate change number two bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The, uh, <coughs> the bill therefore stands referred. Um, just find my, my point. That concludes the second stage of the climate change number two bill. The bill stands referred to the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Next item of business, the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound.